This is Surrey County Cricket Club, born in a tavern in 1845. The symbol of Kennington, we've seen London grow around us. Cricket's original champions, as Charles Alcock brought his vision to life and we cemented a reputation as a place of firsts. International football, FA Cup finals, international rugby, test matches, as well as where English pride came to die before a great rivalry was born from its ashes. We share our feathers with royalty and pass on the honor of the brown cap through generations. We've seen England's best spend their careers with us. Well, that's Jack Hobbs. Head and shoulders, yes, over all other living batsmen. And the game's best finish under our gasometer. We've won seven in a row, thanks to Surridge, May, Barrington, Locke, Laker, and the Bedser twins. In fact, we're well known for our famous siblings, but there's always been one family who have stood out. We saw the West Indies grip a nation on our doorstep, and a pioneer set records galore in the women's game. The end of the century, brought a fresh take on Ick Dien, as Holyoke and his England teammates transformed us on the pitch. The changing of the oval skyline brought the greatest of finales. There it is. England have regained the ashes. And an era of final test triumphs. Alistair Cook has done it. A century in his last. Well played. On our way to our own red ball century. We're one half of the game's oldest rivalry, and it's only London Derby. Oh my! Oh, can you clear the pavilion? Local players are always the lifeblood of our side. But the world's best are attracted to us too. We've come through tragedies. Now we're home to world champions and cricketers of the year. 175 years have passed. There's much more to come. This is Surrey County Cricket Club. Heart of London, pride of the county. The grandest stage in world cricket. Good morning, one and all, and welcome to the Keir Oval for the first time in season 2024 with the defending champs uh, hosting Somerset. It's a gentle spring morning here in South London, an awful lot better than the rain that scuppered results across the country last week. Uh, I'm Adam Collins, and with me to begin our broadcast, as always, is uh, a man who craves Surrey the way that most people crave oxygen. It's, of course, <laughs> Daniel Norcross, and I welcome you with the news that the home side have won the toss, and as has been their want over the last two seasons, they will be fielding first. Good morning to you. Good morning. Isn't this exciting? We had a bit of a sort of tantric week last week. Couldn't get out onto the field. First day was rained off. Then in Surrey, spinners of mm. all people came to the party, but there was just not enough time to make any kind of impression, unfortunately. But today, you get, well, we're going to get a full day today. You can feel it. We've got a good forecast for the first three days. There's a little bit of showery rain forecast for Monday, but there's every chance. Uh, that we're going to get a full four days here and uh, a result a positive result for either side and uh, you know after the first week i think a lot of surrey fans a lot of fans across the country would have been really so disappointed they mm. geared up after seven months you know what it's like you know what we're like here we're crazy we go from october to, to march just willing the days away and then finally it came and it was all taken away from us think of you know teams like durham for example, in Hampshire, who just didn't get on the park at all. Well, today it is all going to kick off and kick off properly. And I'm really excited because um, I think Surrey have done the right thing. They've done the, the, the good, aggressive thing. They've won the toss, get bowling, want to get some wickets under their belt and uh, hopefully, hopefully get on track. 
Yeah, a very day one at the oval kind of pitch, a tinge of green but dark as well. So we'll keep an eye on that throughout the course of the first session. In terms of team changes, same configuration for Surrey but one change. Gus Atkinson, who was uh, rested last week, is into the 11 uh, and Tom Laws makes way. As for Somerset, they have the chance to bring back Craig Oberton, who didn't play last week. He's had back surgery over the winter. Shao Bashir, who played with England with distinction over the winter, plays his first game of the season. And Pretorius as well, the South African international... Well, I say international, he's not played for the national country, but uh, their overseas player signed in the absence of Will Sutherland. Out of the team, Ball, Davy, and Leonard, who played in that draw down at Canterbury, where Surrey, uh, where Somerset, my apologies, did make 400 plus, um, but uh, didn't uh, quite get the job done with the ball in a rain reduced game. So the players that are lined up here before the start of play uh, to remember Keith Booth. Keith was the first team scorer for 23 seasons between 1995 to 2017 and along with his late wife Jennifer was a key part of the Surrey match day team here at the Keir Oval. Keith began his role in the 90s when the profession of scoring was still largely recorded using pen and ink on leather bound score books rather than laptops. Boothie, as he was often known, was a well respected and much loved part of the Surrey dressing room and upon his retirement in 2017 both he and Jenny were awarded honorary life membership of the club. Between him and Jenny they scored around 1,000 Surrey matches in addition to 150 internationals. As well as scoring, Keith was a keen student of the game and wrote numerous books on cricket including Surrey's including on some of Surrey's most famous players in their 179 year history. You'll be able to find these books in our pavilion and the David Stewart libraries. Keith passed away in January of this year, aged 81, and is now memorialised uh, along with Jennifer at the ground with a plaque in the scorer's room. And in a moment from now, that there'll be uh, a, a round of applause from those in attendance to recognise a, a life well, so well spent uh, in cricket, Keith Booth. Uh, who passed away in January this year, Daniel. And it's just one of the wonderful things about this club, isn't it, that um, uh, a man who's been such an important part of the club gets quite rightly the respect that he deserves with all the players lining up, the, the members standing up in the pavilion. Um, he's a man who gave so much of his time to Surrey and, and actually it's, it's sort of appropriate as the applause rings out for Keith. It's appropriate that it should be a Somerset game because of course he wrote a great book about Jack Crawford who featured prominently against Somerset. We'll come on to a little bit of that. Okay, looking forward to match. that through the conversation. So, yes, both uh, uh, players and, and officials lined up there in, in front of the in front of the dressing room, the home dressing room in the beds to stand and the pavilion, which is nicely populated today for opening day. I know opening day was technically last week, but opening day as far as the Keir Oval is concerned. The 124th season of County Championship Fair at this mm. ground as well, Daniel. We were we was crunching some numbers next door to work out what season this would be when you uh, apply certain restrictions and so on. But season 124 of the County Championship here in South London. Yes, Andrew Sampson has confirmed it for us. The County Championship, of course, began in 1890. Surrey, the victors, kicked off with three wins, didn't they? Well, they're looking to they're looking to do <laughs> a repeat of that this season. Can they get the three peat like they started the County Championship with three? consecutive wins can they win in 2022 2023 2024 10 years were lost to the first and second world wars and of course one year was lost to covid so yep. while county cricket was played that wasn't a county championship year so it had without the pandemic this would have been the 125th year of county championship cricket a chance to celebrate next year yeah a chance, exactly a chance to celebrate time. next year is sorry hopefully go for the what do we call it? A four peat? If they if well, they win this year, well, three peat. They've won two on the trot. Well, Don't get ahead of yourself here. No, uh, no, no, absolutely not. The last team that won three on the trot for what's but worth is Yorkshire between 1966 and 1968. Brian Close's side, mm. and uh, that is, I mean, that's that's even before I was born. That's mm. 56 years ago since a, a side has managed to win three on the bounce. But you know, there's a real palpable sense that that is a, re a very important goal for Surrey this season, and you can feel the excitement in the fans and and indeed the players because this is Alex Stewart's last season as the head honcho mm. and you know look they need to they want to win this they want to win games of cricket they're not going to get ahead of themselves they want to see where they can get in the county championship but there's a lot going on this season you fancy and a lot of eyes are going to be on the county championship all the matches live here on the Surrey live stream from now until late September so sorry fielding first let out behind Rory Burns 
the side today. Burns and Dom Sibley, Ollie Pope, Jamie Smith, Ben Folks, the wicketkeeper. Then Dan Lawrence, Cam Steele, who took a five for last week up at Old Trafford. Jordan Clark, the all-rounder. Jamie Overton, Gus Atkinson in for his first game of the year. And last but certainly not least, Kemar Roach will take the new ball from the pavilion end. He's taken 76 wickets for the club at 25, his fourth stint here at the Oval. As for the visitors, Somerset, Matt Renshaw, their Australian overseas, looks like he's taking the first ball. Sean Dixon, Tom Lamanby, who made 90 last week, Lewis Goldsworthy, uh, Tom Banton, James Rue, the wicketkeeper who played so well last year. Lewis Gregory, the new captain, Casey Aldridge, Craig Overton back in the side today, having missed last week. Miguel Pretorius, I mentioned before, on debut, having arrived just this week down at Taunton, and Shao Bashir, England's off-spinner. Uh, he'll be getting an opportunity to bowl here at the Oval early in the season. It's not often been a place where spinners have thrived in the last two years, Daniel, when Surrey have been so prolific, but um, he played so well, gets his chance. So first ball of the season here at the Oval. Nice little bit of shape there for Roach. And uh, we saw that last week at Old Trafford, actually, on, on a pitch that didn't really help the seamers. I and mean, you could tell that Lancashire opened the bowling with Nathan Lyon, didn't they, in Surrey's innings, albeit a very short one. But um, Kimar Roach was getting nice movement, nice swing away from the left-hander up at Old Trafford. Only one wicket fell to seam last week for Surrey. That was mm. Tom Laws. The other nine to the spinners. Four in the cordon for Roach round the wicket. So Roach, you can see on the bottom of your screen here, 78 mile an hour. A little improvement from last year. We have the speed for every ball. At least that's the plan. So He's got a feel for that coming through the stream. Oh, we've got six cameras this year. Yeah. We don't. A commentary seven, team. Seven, I beg your pardon. Seven cameras. <laughs> <laughs> and six commentators as well, so we're expanding in lots of different ways. And Andrew Sampson is with us. I'm delighted to say. Yes, we can uh, we can probe him across four days. <laughs> <laughs> so squared up again, but first runs for Renshaw. Down towards the rope, it will be a boundary, so skewed out between fourth slip and backward point. Somerset away. Well, there are four slips in place. That's exactly where Roach is looking to, to get Renshaw, isn't he? And as we'll see here on the replay, just turns him round. That ball, the prevailing movement is going to be away from the left-hander from Roach to start with. The other thing to look out for is that the outfield's pretty quick. There's been a lot of rain across the country throughout spring, but the oval soaked it up pretty well. Well done to the ground staff. So down to second slip on the bounce. That's Jamie Overton. So the cordon Sibley Overton, the captain Burns and, and Smith at fourth slip. <coughs> and my apologies, it's uh that's Ollie Pope at third. Captain Burns is at a a whitish mid off. Looking forward to seeing Gus Atkinson bowl oh, yeah. as well. His first competitive game since last year's World Cup. Feels an eternity ago. Yes, I was... I mean, I dare say I was not as frustrated as Gus was, but um, I saw him in the World Cup um, out in India, and it felt to me like he was probably the pick of England's pace bowlers. Mm. And then he didn't get an opportunity in the Test Series that England lost 4-1 even though he was out there with England he just spent the best part of 16, 17 weeks in India this mm. winter well Gus over complete just the boundary coming from it Somerset having been sent in for without loss coming from the bat of Matt Renshaw so that's a little bit about Matt Renshaw he's a Yorkshire born Yes, strong, strong Yorkshire, strong, uh, strong Australia, as they always say. Uh, <laughs> big burly left-hander. He's been in and out of Australia's Test side. Yeah, he's been in the Test team as recently as last March when he played a, a couple of Test matches in India. In the middle order, actually, they they formed the view that Renshaw could be effective with his sweep shot. Didn't quite play out that way, but uh, yes, they've they've. Kind of designated Renshaw as this the spare bat in the Australian lineup following the, the retirement of David Warner. Didn't get the start. That went to Steve Smith, and they recalibrated the batting lineup, getting Cam Green in. But that means that Renshaw is in and around the squad. So you, you still think he's sort of sniffing around a 
a spot in that test team. Well, Usman Khawaja won't go around forever, mm -hmm. so that, that's likely the spot that Renshaw's eyeing off, another left-handed opener. So it's going to be Clark getting the first over. Three slips. And Dixon lets his first ball go. So instead of going for Atkinson right away, they're going for the ever-reliable Clark, one of a host of Surrey bowlers that had great years last year. Clark, 48 wickets at 21. Worrell missing today. We'll come to that in a moment. 48 at 24. Then it was Laws omitted today. 38, 39, sorry, at 20. I say omitted with so many games in quick succession. You can call that rested. Abbott, who'll be back with Surrey in May, 33 at 25, Roach 26 at 26, Atkinson 20 at 20. Beautiful sets of numbers. And I think this is the right call again from Surrey. The, the two opening bowlers are the ones that they think are going to just get it to nibble around a bit. A little early moisture. We're still in spring. I mean, it's the first class cricket didn't used to be played even this mm. early. We've already had one round of county championship matches when I was... A youngster, it was late April, I think. Andrew Sampson is alongside us. He'll be able to confirm <laughs> my suspicions. But that's why a 1,000 runs before the end of May was such a thing. Mm. I'll tell you, there's a man we're going to be looking out for on that score. We are indeed. S Northeast. S Northeast, who's currently has scored 347 runs this season. And were he to get 26 consecutive ducks for the remainder of the season... There are 13 matches. He mm -hmm. batted twice and 30 consecutive ducks. He would still average over 13 this <laughs> season, which is better than I do. <laughs> yeah, what a start last week at Lords from North East. One of the headlines of round one. Not that there were many, given how much rain there was about. A bit of... Didn't quite go through, did it? And you see Clark looking at the surface saying, what happened there? Why did it not reach the gloves of folks? Yeah, that did keep low, didn't it? Yes, that the triple ton of North East was the, the main talking point. Cashew Valley, I suppose, as well, over at Worcestershire. Twin centuries there, both brought up with a six. I doubt anyone's brought up twin centuries, both with a six. Sampson will know that too. <laughs> the fact that it was his first 200s in first-class cricket, adding to that yeah. yet further. A bit fuller. Driven hard, driven well. So Dixon begins his campaign well at least away from home uh, with a boundary I say away from home they played away from home last week as well Somerset on the road a couple of weeks in a row had a modest 2024 in red ball cricket after making the move to Somerset it was really important in their win in the vitality blast so making a half century in the final a stunning catch at point as well to get them going so a player of some experience Sean Dixon when he's, he's damaged Surrey before when playing for a different county Goes again in that general direction. This time it flays out behind point. Wasn't in control of the shot, but there have been three boundaries in two overs to start the day for Somerset. 12 for none after two. Well, two of those have gone distinctly behind square on the offside, haven't they? And that was, that was quite a shot of ambition. Last ball of the over, no foot movement. Flying way through backward point. Could easily have sent that in the direction of the slips, but I like his... as as they say these days intent mm. we do hear this word a lot <laughs> intent yeah so Dixon last year just the 410 runs across 11 games at 23 so keen to consolidate his spot second year at the club Renshaw's turn again oh beaten it's that shape isn't it from Roach he's been doing it for years one, first one that has, that has authentically beaten the bat there's a couple of that have taken edges but that one is an absolute beauty it's exactly where he'd want to pitch it we said earlier he's going to be looking to take that ball away from the left hand a four slips in place just narrowly misses the outside edge they will be on high alert there in that slip Gordon 270 test wickets, Roach. What an asset here. Same general shape, but played with nice soft hands by Renshaw, just as he did in the first over. And the result's the same as well. So a couple of boundaries apiece for the Somerset openers. I wonder, you know, if gonna, we're going to end up with four slips in a gully before long. As we take a look at where that one went, the four slips are relatively close together. And that has gone almost... Almost catchable height through that area. Played it right under his eye, Renshaw. Good batting. Yep. 
yeah now actually there is a little change here so Jamie Smith has just gone a little bit wider to a sort of gully Renshaw had such a promising start to the 2018 season with Somerset making 300s in a hurry. Wasn't enough to get back in the Australian test team at the time. Everyone thought that was going to be uh, the foundation for having a lengthy then. crack. It was opening then for Australia. Uh, they went to the UAE and they opened with Aaron Finch and Usman Khawaja. So one of those worked with Khawaja. One didn't quite play out with Finch. So four catches behind the wicket. Around that time, England were also experimenting with sort of biffing openers, weren't they? Alex Hales, yep. around that sort of time. He's a little bit earlier. Jason Roy, you're Jason after. Roy, yeah. Yep. Throughout the 2019 Ashes. Yep. A nice aggressive opener in Test cricket. So, you know, people think that that Baz Ball's new. People have been... Vari variations of Baz Ball have been <laughs> around for quite a while. So Renshaw is here for seven games in this stretch. They tell a story down at Somerset where he made a, a century and before even taking his pads off, went straight over to the kids and signed an hour of autographs. So he, he's really immersed himself in the culture down there at, at Taunton and why they've been keen to get him back whenever he's available. He, he was meant to be at the club with Will Sutherland, the Victorian captain, so two Australians, but Sutherland got pulled out by Cricket Australia owing to a, a back complaint that he picked up in the final shield round. Over complete, just the boundary from it, 16 for none. So that, that's opened the door to Miguel Pretorius getting his opportunity. Arrived on Tuesday, was down the club Wednesday. Up to South London on Thursday, playing on Friday. So it's been a very quick week for the mm. for the South African, who we'll hear more about throughout the course of the of the four days, I'm sure. Well, that is the lot of the modern cricketer, isn't mm. it? I mean, did, who was it? Was it Dwayne Bravo who flew in for finals day once? <laughs> T20 finals day, in and out. So these things do happen. Wahab Riaz here in the T20 blast. We've seen players jump from the, it's the SAT20 to the ILT20, haven't we? Sort yeah. of day in, day out, which... Seems vaguely preposterous. Soft hands again. It's working for Somerset so far. A bit of pace taken off the ball in the gully. They'll add two. First runs that haven't gone to the rope. If you take a look at the wagon wheel though so far, apart from that one extra cover drive, everything's going in that little arc through the sort of gully fourth slip area at the moment. Which tells you something, tells you the ball's moving. A little bit in there, perhaps a little bit more than a little bit for the bowlers. Shot for none. Just had Phil Walker trip into the back of the box. He's joining us on lead commentary today. Big team, as I said, expanded yeah, who, team who, who, in, in 2024. Talk us it. Who have we got today? Yaz Rana, who did oh. a great job, I thought, last year. Uh, Star of the Wisdom podcast. Star of the Wisdom podcast. Cam Ponsonby, who will be uh, providing colour. Um, a star of many podcasts. Jack of Cam. all trades, Cam. Yep. Baron Bonson be to you. Oh, edged and hasn't been, has been, has been collected on the juggle. Well, Overton down and Sibley was there and Dixon is gone and Clark's in the book. But boy, that could have gone anywhere. A deflection off the chest. Reflexes. Tabaraya Miller stuff. Oh, wow. 18 for one. <laughs> Melbourne Test of 1982. Uh, well, that must have gone very quickly because Jamie Overton's got fantastic hands. And I think that might have burst through the hands. And just, he's, he's in a bit of pain there. It's hit him. Sort of, what would you say, not far from the left armpit. Let's take a look at this in the replay. It's at just the right spot. We said it's been nibbling away. It takes a good thick edge and flies to Jamie Overton. And what oh. superb reactions that is. That's off the right boot. Well, he's, he's volleyed it up to himself and taken it in the right hand. That is, that is great fielding. That's, That's why they spend so much time before play every day going through drills just like this on deflecting balls through the cordon and having the presence of mind to get the boot down up to himself. Sibley 
An early influence at first slip, Surrey in the game straight away. And those are two pretty big men, you know. J.B. Overton, we know, we think of as big. Anyway, we see him bowling. This will be a better angle, I reckon. See, look to the right boot of Sibley as it comes down. Oi, there it is. Oh, grab with the plucks right it out. Hand. And he's got he's got about six foot two and a half, six foot three inches to get down for that. Nimble and brilliant reactions from Dom Sibley. I mean, you're going to feel a little bit unlucky if you're Sean Dixon. But at the same time, it's a big thick edge. Yep. Could have been taken first time, but it, that has flown to Overton. He's got next to nothing on it. You can tell as he's rubbing his, his bone around just near his left armpit there. And fantastic reactions from Sibley. Well, what spectacular first we get at the Oval. If it continues like that this season. Hmm. We may lose a few voices. That'll make the highlights package. I think it might. <laughs> Tom Lamanby. Good start to the season last week at Canterbury making 90. His first ball here and driving it out to mid-off where there won't be a single. So Lamanby, he's been Somerset's informed player through the pre-season. Did well in their pre-season camp at Abu Dhabi. Got 97 in the university game against the University of Exeter and then 90 against Kent last week. Very organised innings. I mean, that is, that, that, I do love a sort of relay slip catch. Mm. That, that is one of the more spectacular. I can have a little think about a few of them. Not far away from off stump. Um, you mentioned Miller Tavare, of course, in that thrilling test at Melbourne in 1982, which England won by three runs after a 10 wicket partnership in excess of 70, wasn't it, between Thompson and Border? Yeah, they, they, needed, they needed 42 when they 70 rocked. was exactly yeah, they, they needed 42 on the final day, and, and, and it's one of those, I'm from Melbourne, as you know, it's one of those things where about 70,000 people say they were at the G that day. It was yeah. about 30,000, but still, it reflects the, 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 the passion for Test cricket that you can get 30,000 in to watch you know, 42 runs or one wicket. Clark completes the successful over for the home side. Somerset, 18 for one. Dixon... Caught in the cordon. If you haven't seen it yet, scroll back in the feed and watch it. Watch the replay as well. well. I think we'll be replaying that a few times today. I was thinking of one, there was one the other day involving Bangladesh, which didn't result in a catch. It resulted in three drops. So oh, it was, yes, yes. It was, it, was dropped at, it was dropped at sort of third slip, second slip, and, and first slip, pretty much. It was, Here uh, we are. We're going to get to see it again. I'm not going to tire of watching this. That goes through so quickly. And then... Oh, it's, or it's, is it the left boot? It's almost the ankle. Yeah, yeah, it was a bit deceptive on that on that first angle, wasn't it? Yeah. Either way, it's definitely come off something and stayed up. Reminded me a little bit of... Um, do you remember uh, talking about using your feet to take a catch in the court? Mark Taylor kicking a ball up off the turf from Michael Bevan many years ago. Similar to that, where he, where he ended up on his back and was able to kick it up in the air and, uh, and, and ended up with the ball in his hands. So you don't see it too often, but when you do, it does stand out. Well, yeah, the, the use of feet to catch a ball is, is relatively rare. There's a very controversial one, of course, in the 1985 Ashes involving David Gower and Alan Lamb. Samson nodding next to you. As Wayne Phillips was the poor uh, victim on that occasion, he went to cut a ball from was it Embry or Edmonds? It was one of the, it was one, one of the two Middlesex spinners. As Australia looked like they were comfortably going to secure a draw, high-scoring draw, mm -hmm. and he went to cut it, smashed it into the boot of Gower and caught by Lamb, was it that way around? And um, Gower was sort of taking evasive action and jumped up, hit the boot, and was uh, comfortably taken. Of course, the Australians weren't very happy about it, you could understand why, because we had no replays in those days. Mm. So the umpires were were opining that it definitely didn't hit the ground but there was I don't know how they could tell the other part of this was that until caught Gower so, so right. it was off Lamb's boot and caught by Gower it's the other part of this was that until 1989 in England all coverage was from behind the batter that's also, right yeah. as we learnt when making the calling the shots documentary yeah. a few years ago that there just was no well, there was the, the action replay, I suppose. But yeah, they had the other camera. They just didn't want didn't us to use watch it. it because they, they, BBC decided that it would be uh, better if, if you imagined yourself sitting in one <laughs> spot the whole time. We won't do that to you on the live stream. No. Shot. Yeah, beautifully played by Ren Short. Third boundary. A couple of them were used the pace of the ball and deflected behind point. This was a, a classical on drive from... The Queenslander who advances to 12. Again, 
Surrey's bowlers are at quite rightly looking to go full trying to find whatever movement there is off the pitch and through the air with the new ball on that occasion just a little over pitched and Renshaw played the perfect on drive perfect morning to get stuck in oh he gets beaten here is there an edge all eyes on the umpire finger stays down Roach looks more enthusiastic than the cordon was my instinct watching it from behind the action here in the in the JM Finn stand well Ben Folks gave it a bit didn't he but Ben Folks is a, is a very fine appealer you can take a look at this from behind maybe back trouser leg there wasn't much in the way of deflection was there mm. it could have been a slight noise of trouser leg Roach a little late actually to put his arm in the air Folks liked it but Renshaw survives. But either way, it's an absolutely brilliant delivery. Umpires Saggers and Kettleborough officiating this week here. Off the hip to finish. He'll keep the strike, Renshaw. Busy over, 23 for one. So we've got, just trying to work out who's where. We've got uh, Kettleborough is umpiring at the, at the Vauxhall or JM Finn stand end and Martin Saggers up beneath the Mickey Stewart Pavilion. Yes, I saw something on Twitter the other day. I think it was, might have been Patrick Kidd bemoaning how ends that describe geographic locations are going out of fashion. <laughs> so at, um, at Trent Bridge, no, it's not Trent Bridge, it was at Chelmsford. That was the reason. At, Trent, at Chelmsford, they have now introduced the Graham Gooch and Sir Alistair Cook ends yep. instead of the Hayes Close end and the River end. And uh, he was thinking about great locations here Kirkstall Lane end the Radcliffe Road end of course and here so we have the Vauxhall end from which I remember Michael Holding steaming in in 1976 <laughs> from an incredibly long run pretty much all the way back to the boundary and it was a big boundary in those days so was the was the contention of the piece that as we name ends after players, that it becomes a fraction more confusing to identify where you are. Well, it's a little bit of that. And then you sort of lose a little bit of that timeless majesty. But right. then, you know, what you gain something as well. Now, Essex have provided England with, at different points, their two highest run scorers, mm -hmm. Graham Gooch and Alistair Cook. I don't know how much longer Alistair Cook's record's going to last, as Joe Root is about 740 runs away from it. England which probably not this summer but you could imagine by the end of the year because England play three tests in Pakistan and New Zealand they've got 12 test matches before the end of this year Root could overtake them all I don't think Sachin's number's safe no I think you're right well isn't it staggering you know that Alistair Cook retired from test cricket at this ground in 2018 continued to play county cricket for five years but he kept playing for England for five years he'd have sailed past Ten Dorkin mm. I wonder whether there was ever a serious kind of question asked to Cook in his retirement years do you, do you mind would you consider it coming back oh well I can tell you the answer to that okay um, I interviewed him in the TMS box the last test match of last summer and he revealed and much to my amazement <laughs> we, we got a scoop out of him he said that um, it was at some point actually in 2019 when he kept having these dreams about coming back and I think he said he rang Ben Stokes and Joe Root and said what do you think <laughs> good carry there from Clark at 87 mile an hour that's uh, that's not slow that is not is it not do you, you don't necessarily think of Jordan Clark as being the pace man in Surrey's attack and, and when you consider he had a ball in the first day but not reached the gloves of folks and then the, the thick edge that smacked yeah. Overton in the shoulder before deflecting down so he's, he's really bending his back early here that one's gone shoulder high so just to be clear here Alistair Cook had a dream that he might make a comeback and decided yeah. to call the captain and say what do you reckon well, don't, yeah yeah <laughs> interesting 
Maiden complete, 23 for one. Continue, please, Daniel Norcross. Um, and that he, that he saw sense. He reminded himself of why it was that he'd, he'd give, given up. He'd retired because, essentially, the way he described it was that um, the way he played cricket involved so much concentration. He admitted that he didn't have the, the range of shots of someone like, you know, Joe Root or Ollie Pope or, you know, even Zach Crawley. So his game was all about concentration and about denial and about sticking to a method and he admitted that he just found it harder to to concentrate and stay on it so but he, he contemplated a comeback and there was a at that time of course England's opening pairing was in a bit of turmoil mm. this wasn't yet clear was it new over begins with Roach fourth of his spell and just he, some sorry continue. He, he gave a magnificent interview all, all about how he came to the conclusion he was going to retire as well and he's it, it was a rather lovely thing he said that um, he uh, he couldn't pluck up the courage to tell his wife Alice on the night that he'd worked it out because they'd just watched the Inbetweeners movie and they'd enjoyed it so much he didn't want to ruin the vibe <laughs> I thought was lovely. Anyway, he then he, he then went into work, if you like, went went to go do the day job, and rang Alice. And before he'd even got to the the crucial bit, she'd said, "Look, I know <laughs> it's time." So she'd known all along. He'd been sitting there watching the Inbetweeners movie, and she'd been aware that he was going to retire before he was. <laughs> Got a bit of admin to run through. Bit of housekeeping, Daniel, before we go much further. One of the, uh, one of the uh, improvements on the stream compared to last year. We're going to try and be able uh, to include uh, viewer, listener feedback. Surreybroadcast at gmail.com. So we have an email account. It is being monitored. Surrey broadcast. Surrey broadcast at gmail.com. It's being taken care of next door. You can find us on all the usual social media places. Surrey Cricket. Got a message in here from Matt Huxley. Uh, West Country boy in exile in Peckham. Tuned into the stream right now. Is it free to come after tea at the Oval still he asks oh that's, that's done plenty from Roach around the wicket keen to see the pace on that as well no, only 73 and a half mile an hour but it's, it's what he does with it uh, that's right yeah after tea the gates are thrown open so you can come down and uh, and get your fill mat later on you can, you can stay in touch and we'll have plenty of uh, interaction with our listenership across the course of the next five months Surrey Broadcast at gmail.com while, while you're, you're at it um, we've had that extraordinary juggling relay catch what are, you, what are your faves let us, what are your faves yep. let us know nice one again shot for none there from Lamanby yet to get off the mark from eight deliveries and I'll quickly skip around the grounds to simply say at Chelmsford Essex and Kent Essex have won the toss and batting uh, at the uh, at the Rose Bowl Hampshire Lancashire that's a big game Hampshire have also won the toss and batted at Trent Bridge uh, Knotts have won the toss and they'll bat against Worcestershire uh, at Edgbaston, Warwickshire, uh, hosting Durham. And Durham have won the toss in their bowling with Scott Boland in the team, I believe. They're, they're new overseas. That's Division 1. Lamanby leaves alone to finish. Another maiden from Roach, 23 for 1. In Division 2 at Cardiff, uh, the start's delayed between Glamorgan and Derbyshire. Yet more rain. Poor Derbyshire. Uh, yeah. He's still yet to get on the park <laughs> at all. <laughs> uh, Gloucestershire, Yorkshire over in Bristol. Uh, the home side have won the toss. Fielding first. Uh, at Grace Road, Leicestershire hosting Sussex. And the visitors have won the toss and elected to field. And at Wantage Road, Northampton are hosting Middlesex. And the visitors have won the toss and will field as well. So a bat first bias in Division 1, a field first preference in Division 2, with the exception of what we've got going on here at the Keir Oval, where Surrey have decided to pop Somerset in, getting the early wicket. There's Sean Dixon, if you're just joining our coverage, caught uh, at first slip eventually from the boot and body of Overton. It ended up in Sibley's mitts from the bowling of Clark Dixon was out for 10 it was 18 for 1 it's now 23 for 1 and there's been a bit in there for the opening bowlers at the moment Jordan Clark's been getting up to paces of around eight, 87 miles an hour we saw Kimar Roach a more sedate pace but perhaps a little bit more extravagant movement and it's a pretty warm day today we've got a little breeze 
but we're due to get up to 20, 21 degrees today. And you know, if we do, it might be the hottest day of the year, which isn't a great accolade on the 12th of April, but mm. you know, it could be hottest day of the year. Okay. 21 degrees. I remember a stonking day here to start the season in 2017. Oh, the 8th of April. It was when you it were driving. My, my you were driving. My wife's birthday. Uh, is this the one where you drove and hit seven county grounds ah, in one day? Yes. Uh, sorry, we're hosting Warwickshire. With and Ebony Rainford Brent. And batted the, all day. The great Alex Stewart gave me a memorable moment when we arrived. Skewed away again from Renshaw, but they've all been along the ground so far. Towards the Tennyson School, I'll get three. In association with ESPN Crick Info, Emily Rainford Brent and I were filmed and encouraged to try to commentate a ball from every county championship match on the first day of the season. Beautifully hot day. We began at Headingley. We popped into, in order, <laughs> Leicester. Wantage Road, Chelmsford. Too full, but doesn't make the most of it. Lamanby can't get off the mark. Ten dot balls to begin for him. Canterbury, and the Oval. There are only six games, I think, on that day. Didn't want it enough. Well, I'll tell you what happened. It was Mark Stoneman's debut for Surrey. Surrey were playing That's against right. Warwickshire. Yep. And because Surrey played so well, we were talking about. April wickets, they were 350 <laughs> odd for three or something at the end of the first day. Because they didn't lose any wickets, the over rate at the oval was brilliant, <laughs> whereas everywhere else it went over time. Right. So we got within a mile and a half and got stuck sort of in Peckham and eventually got into the ground about five minutes after the last ball had been bowled here. So we managed to commentate on, in all the other grounds, one ball, so we're running up the stairs at Leicester at Grace Road, mm -hmm. the rickety steps, panting, he's in, bowls, through to the keeper, no run, run down, get to Northampton, where we were delayed by 10 minutes, because even though we'd called in advance, they wouldn't let us in until various phone calls were made. That's what probably did it for us. Oh. I know, so frustrating. They couldn't quite believe that people had just turned up in this car to charge there, there is a way. There, there is a way of doing this. There is a route. There was a game being played last year. Day one of a championship game was day one of the Australia Test match at Manchester, the England-Australia Rashes Test. So there was, there was. I think I'm right in saying nine games of professional cricket starting at the same time. I don't think every county team were playing. Nevertheless, there was a route that you could navigate. We looked at doing a fundraiser with the Lord's Taverners, but it didn't, didn't quite work out, where you get to one ball of every game. It was, a, it was a great idea. Yeah. But we arrived. Oh, I say, that's... Just hold that thought, because that's a, that's a ball that's really taken off. 83 mile an hour from Clark to finish. There'll be a change in commentary uh, after a few further words from Daniel Norcross. Phil Walker jumping in for me for the first time today. 26 for one. Let's take a look at this. This has flown off a pretty good length. And that is, I mean, that's Jordan Clark and his pace today. Again, taken above head height. By Ben folks, there was not a great deal that Lamanby could do about that. What a, what a jaffer from Clark. Um, yeah, so we arrived at the Alex Stewart gates as Phil Walker sits down next to me, having got so, so close. And we wanted a bit of sympathy. Sure. Because, you know, it's been a long day. Yeah. You start at 11 o'clock with the first ball of the county championship season in Headingley. We're, I'm not a fit man, but I've been running up and down stairs, charging around. And we got stuck in a traffic jam in London, and we're five minutes late. All because Surrey had batted so well that the game ended on time where it didn't anywhere else. Walked in, saw Alex Stewart at his own gates. Said, Stewie, Stewie, <laughs> we were so close. He looked us both in the eye and said, yep, you failed. <laughs> Winners and losers. <laughs> yes, he's, he's quite binary when it comes to these things. <laughs> yeah. There, there's no, you know, honourable failure. There's well, just failure. Well, that reminds me there is... <laughs> A fascinating interview with, with the gaffer, dare I call him that, at uh, lunchtime. Uh, so just after our coverage wraps up here at the luncheon break, there'll be um, a fascinating interview with 
with Alex Stewart, who explains his thinking behind this being his final year, his valedictory year in the job. This place will not be the same without him. It certainly won't. And I might uh, get a bit more sympathy for my failures. But well, <laughs> perhaps. I'd hate to think that he would soften with age. No. Uh, but it does put me in mind of his legendary interview at the end of the of last year and we were we were there daniel at the champions dinner and it's understandably quite an exuberant evening and 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 alex stood up and he said if you don't take joy in this you can get out now you can head off right now oh. inside edge false-ish shot he's just nagging away and just outside that line that fifth stump line he loves bowling round the wicket from that end, from the Mickey Stewart members' end, does Kumar Roach. And he's settled into a nice rhythm here. should point out that he began with a, a more offside field. You know, he's looking, obviously, for the outside edge. He still is. He's got three slips in and a backward point. But he's just added a square leg, just behind square, to allow him to bowl a little bit straighter, perhaps. again and outside off stump I think that's that's where he gets so much joy because of that natural angle around the wicket coming into the left hand as pads and then it just straightens just holds its line you've seen him do this well for a number of years now really he's part of the furniture now Kumar Roach here at the Oval and he likes bowling from that end in particular to left handers he's got two in his sights at the minute in Matt Renshaw and Tom Lamanby. I want to come to Lamanby in a moment he's a player I've been interested in for a number of years now Shorter this time, and Renshaw's look pretty solid so far in the first 40 odd minutes. A little bit quicker that time from Roach, over 80 miles an hour. Just before you get to Lambie, just to, to go back to that Champions Dinner, because it was a stirring speech. Actually. That it was. He, he, he basically brought the Surrey family to its feet, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, it was. And you, as an Essex boy, I oh, know. come on, Daniel, <laughs> with six minutes in. <laughs> We're at the top of the table. Studiously <laughs> dispassionate. Foolish tempter and didn't quite get enough of it. End of the over. 26 for one. Yeah, Sean Dixon, the man to go. As he's top of the table. Mm. Pro tem. Well, indeed. Because, I mean, one thing we have yet to discuss, and uh, you're the journo here, so I'm hoping that you're going to be able to provide us with the definitive take. But <laughs> on two previous occasions mm. that someone has been found to be using an oversized bat and it should be pointed out that I believe the first time an oversized bat was used in a game of county cricket was at Laylam against Surrey yonks ago Laylam Heath I believe it is back in the 1770s back in the here and now foolish and tapped up to mid off yeah you've seen the ladybird book of cricket I hope in which uh, a man with a top hat has a very mm. very wide bat mm. uh, Laylam this fellow came out to bat and his, his bat was the width of the wicket and that resulted like all these things did you know laws were then created because people seemed to be breaking the spirit of the law so then we got um, we got a definitive you know maximum width for a bat mm -hmm. and it appears that last week come back to it beats in this time in Essex's very impressive victory at Trent Bridge, bowling out Nottinghamshire for 80 on that last day and getting the win points, 16 points for a win this year, 8 for a draw. Earlier in the game, Ferris Gushi has been found to have a bat that's ever so slightly too wide. Now, on two previous occasions, this has been established in county cricket, and on both occasions, the team has been docked 10 points. Indeed. Is that correct? Yeah. Durham were the last. They got docked 10. Pushed nicely down, but doesn't beat mid on. So Lamanby remains on naught. 17 balls now. So given that we've got a sort of double precedent for this happening, does that just mean that we must expect Essex to be docked 10 points? Is there any appeals process or anything that can be gone through? People have been assuming that the press releases would drop any time in the last three days. The fact that we've got now to the second round of games and there's still not been any word mm. throws a degree of shade on it, I suppose. Oh, indeterminate shot by Tom Lamanby, who will be feeling a little bit twitchy coming off the back of runs last week, but 
That's 18 deliveries now, and he's still stuck on naught. And that was a, a nervy prod, Daniel. Well, it really was, and, it, and very late. Mm. I mean, as John Arlott once said about a shot, not so much late as posthumous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so going back briefly to the Cushy situation, you assume that Essex will get hit at some point. You, you have to assume that. The precedent's already been set. Got to feel for the kid. Yeah. He wouldn't have known. No. And he's away. And that will run away. Just back with a square for four. That's a beautiful shot because it's not a long half volley by any means. And he's found that gap all along the ground. That'll make him feel a bit better after his previous delivery. Off the mark of his 18th ball. Yeah, but that's okay. You give the first session to the fielding side, especially when they win the toss. It's been Surrey's style, hasn't it, over the last couple of years, that when they do win the toss here at the Keir, then they, they tend to throw whoever they've got in front of them in. Want to get those 20 wickets quickly. That's they? it. They back themselves to chase anything down. And that'll be four more beautifully timed this time, and it was there to hit. Just too straight by Jordan Clark, who's cranky with himself. He's just let up a little bit of pressure there. End of the over, 21. Uh, he's now conceded for that one wicket. And Surrey, Sir Somerset going OK. Daniel Norcross has had a lovely 45 with us. I am. I'm just about, just about to depart. Mm. But with but with uh, uh, one fact and one thought. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew Sampson's here and he's just passed me the toss stats. Surrey have now bowled first the last six times that they've won the toss at the Oval. And seven of the last eight, which is very much to your point. There you and go. I just want to leave you with the, I suppose, thought. It must surely be the case that it's not Faris Kushi's fault. Who's, who's making these bats too wide? Well, indeed. And also, you, you explain, and then Yazrana can come in. Exactly. And also, a word to the umpires as well, eagle-eyed umpires as well, in the murk up at Trent Bridge. And they've had a look at that bat and thought, there's something amiss here. There's something not quite right. And they have implements and measuring tools for all sorts these days. And poor old Faris Kushi's bat did not come inside uh, the maximum. And so... Essex are waiting on tens of hooks for the probably inevitable deduction in points. Anyway, change of bowling. And it's Gus Atkinson from the Mickey Stewart end. And Yazrana slips in to Daniel Norcross's chair. Morning, Yaz. Morning, Phil. Good to be back. What is it for it? Isn't it just, though? I was thinking on the walk round from our office to the commentary box the, in truth the first week of the season felt slightly underwhelming with the weather very little cricket around the, the country only one result from the nine games I'll take it and from our position now you've got a particularly good view of just how um, well attended the Keir Oval is today the pavilion is, is completely packed um, a really good feel around the ground today obviously Easter holidays as well um, sorry, not playing at home last week. The weather's good. I think we're looking at 21 degrees today, late this afternoon, Phil. And set fair as well for the next few days as well. It's worth pointing out. And first play and a miss against Gus Atkinson, who looked to be slightly timid in his run up there. Maybe he just lost his stride somewhat, but he's such a natural quick, Yaz, that he can compensate for that. I was watching him yesterday warming up here and he glides through that crease without any effort whatsoever, certainly externally. And I know that he said you wouldn't believe what's going on under, under the surface, but there's, there's such a smoothness to his approach and style. He's got a quick arm. Runs this time. Pick up a couple into the onside. Renshaw's look good so far. It's a comparatively short run-up for a bowler of his speed. It reminds me of what Mark Wood's run-up was a little bit before he lengthened it, uh, was it the 2019 tour of the Caribbean. Um, I've got a question for you actually on Atkinson. Atkinson didn't play the first round of game, it didn't, didn't make a huge lot of difference to the end given how little cricket there was, but he's one of a few um, England players who've been rested. More runs this time, back down the ground, easing into that off drive punch Rory Burns does the rest at mid off but another couple to Matt Renshaw is nicely into his work here moving 
into the twenties. But yeah, Ag- Agerson uh, was rested for the last round of fixtures. If you look around the country this week, Ollie Robinson, who played once last week for, for, for Sussex, he's not playing this round for the same reason. Um, Atkinson ha- hadn't actually played a cricket a game of cricket this year. Um, Zach Crawley at Kent, he's not playing the first two round of games. And I understand you want to manage the workloads of players who are going to be important to England later in the summer. But I wonder how much, especially for the batters actually, how much of a difference it makes not playing those first two games of the season come July. Because we are, believe it or not, more than three months away from that first test match of the summer. And someone like Atkinson just literally hadn't bowled a, an over in a competitive game since that tour of the Caribbean, the White Ball tour of the Caribbean in late 2023. He's certainly not bowled many overs in competitive cricket in a long time, it's Gus Atkins, and he's carried a lot of drinks and worn a lot of fluorescent bibs in the last few months. He'll be itching to get going here in, in this one, the pipe opener at the Kia this season. And there's another bowling change, Craig, uh, Jamie Overton, first mistake, first Overton mistake of plenty. So it's going to be... Jamie Overton from the end as we look down at it the old Vauxhall end and it just goes to show what an attack they have here keep on coming at you and bang on cue a nasty delivery that squares up Tom Lamonby I mean a silly point at this stage would be a slightly punchy move but if there had been one, that would have just lobbed nicely. It's a good start. Straight at you hard. He was bowling fast, I thought, this morning. I don't know if you caught too much uh, of the net practice this morning. But Jamie Overton, who looks fit and hungry this year. He's had his injury problems, of course, the last couple of years here and there. But he's got through some good work for Surrey. He's become a real outstanding, inspired signing, really. And up against his hometown club, of course. A fascinating uh, few months for Jamie Overton. A lot of people tipping him for a spot in the England T20 World Cup squad. Um, he's really sort of forged uh, an interesting role for himself in T20 cricket. More with the bat than the ball, really. He had an excellent BBL. Um, he sort of comes in at five, six, seven, gives it a whack. He's got one of the best batting strike rates in the world over the last couple of years. And obviously, he's still someone who's capable of getting up there to. 87, 88 mile per hour, so he's a, he's a handy middle overs threat with the ball as well. And with Ben Stokes um, making himself unavailable for that T20 World Cup, there is a spot available for um, a seam bowling all rounder, and it's not particularly obvious who the next cab off the rank behind Sam Curran is. So I think it's, I think it's very possible that, that Overton features in that in that T20 World Cup. Um, he, he did an interview with the, with the Times recently, actually, where he um, highlighted the 2028 Olympics as, as something he really wants to be involved with. Not many cricketers, um, I think, are as, are as aware of that opportunity as he is. Well, his strike rate is right up there, isn't it? It's, it's comparable to any of the greats as a hitter in short-form cricket. Andre Russell is looking ahead of him when it comes to Jamie Overton as a hitter. So that, combined with bucket hands and an ability to hit the splice and he bowls one side of the wicket and he looks fit here there are far worse cases to be made than him to break into that squad of course that tournament begins at the start of June out in the West Indies leg side-ish this time might have come off the pad although it has run away yeah off the bat nicely done by Tom Lamanby who started perhaps a tiny bit twitchily but into double figures now. I think he's 18 balls to get off the mark, but now he's moved on to 12. When we think of um, the, the squad composition here at Surrey that has made them a force across formats over the last few years in particular, Jamie Overton talked about wanting to have more opportunities with the bat. He wasn't really getting a go with the bat when he was at Taunton. Short and cut away, but there's a third man in place already, which makes sense. It's a lightning-fast outfield here, as you've come to expect. 
And if Overton end of the over, 43 for just that one wicket. If Overton is going to look to explore the middle of the pitch here and bowl some nasty throat balls and to try and really force the issue, then it makes sense perhaps just to have a little bit of cover behind square on the offside. But it's going to be an interesting battle. Somerset's top order, very watchable Renshaw and Lamanby. And Surrey's battery of quicks. I mean, it's a test class lineup, let's be fair. Missing as well, one or two. Dan Worrell struggling a bit with injury, as we, as we understand. He'll be coming back into the setup soon enough. Tom Laws, outstanding young player, still on the bench. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see how Surrey go in this phase of the innings, in particular, actually, with the absence of, of Tom Laws. Laws so often would come on second change for Surrey last season, and even when the ball wasn't doing an awful lot, he would create chances from nowhere. The, the word we used a lot last season to describe Laws' bowling is that he's a speculative bowler. He's someone who tries different things regularly. He, he slips in uh, Yorkers. Even though he's not express pace, he does... Um, he tries out the short ball probably more more often than not compared to other bowlers of his pace on the circuit he's a very interesting bowler gives them something different yeah, just going back to Dan Worrell we've had a message come through from Cricket Lover 12 asking what the problem is with Dan it's a neck injury as we understand it foolish again by Gus Atkinson he's bowling right up there against these left-handers which I guess on a pitch with a tinge of green in mid mid April makes a lot of sense he's got three slips and a backward point he's just trying to basically entice the lefty outside off stump he's saying everything in front of square with the exception of one man is yours not interested this time though Tom Lamanby Something to keep an eye out on this act of the spell is the carry through to Ben Folks behind the stumps and that first over from Axon. There are a couple that died on Folks. That one coming through much more nicely. Folks taking it around waist height. Full again, pattern emerging here. Lamanby climbs into that shot very nicely. Rory Burns tidies up though, no run. Intriguing mini passage here. And you look at Somerset's lineup, and if they can just get through the first hour or two, then they have an explosive middle order that you would think would enjoy themselves on this pitch. It's a punchy move by Rory Burns, albeit it's paid off handsomely the last couple of years. Pushed again, but timed perfectly this time, and that will run away for four. Easy as you like. So 47 for one from 13. Renshaw and Lamanby going tidily enough here in the early stages after the early loss of Sean Dixon to an extraordinary slip catch. I don't know if you yeah, called it at the time. Catch, amazing catch, and a, and a great view actually, pretty much from side on. So you, we could see that it's been cleanly held by Sibley. But not too much to worry about since that point for these two left-handers. The odd ball has flown past the outside edge as you'd come to expect, but they've looked relatively unflustered up until now. It looks like a good track, good carry. I know the legendary Lee Fortis will probably be listening to us down there in his hut as we see that extraordinary catch again. What an effort by Dom Sibley to get down. Good pace in, in this pitch though, as I was saying, and, and I know that Lee Fortis, head groundsman here, has been very mindful of getting as much pace into the track as he can. And last year you saw it, it was there were fantastic cricket pitches here throughout the year really, in all forms of the game. And considering this is early, or early on in the season, it's been, even for April in England, pretty chilly and rather wet, this looks like a good track. It'd be fascinating to see, by the way, how two English off-spinners go 
later on in this game. Come back to that. And on the toss decision, Somerset fans watching this, I guess, will be, will be less aware that this is very much what Surrey do at home. And sometimes the, the green on the pitch can be a bit deceiving. You know, Phil just mentioned um, the, the speed of the, the pitch here at the Kier Oval. And often, especially in the early season, when it's hard to get that hardness into the surface, that extra layer of grass helps with the, with the carry, helps with the pace. And Settled in nicely here, hasn't he, Yaz? As, as Jamie Overton, he's bowled very, very few hit-me balls. And everything with him has that extra element of oomph. He hits the splice with that height. He's bowling decent pace as well, mid-80s. Just another note that we do have now, the speed gun, the pace radar. Uh, and so you can clock with your own eyes just how quick this Surrey attack is. Jordan Clark in particular really raced through a couple in the, the late 80s, 86, 87 early on. We've got an interview with Alex Stewart coming up um, at the interval, the lunch interval. There's a very, very interesting interview with Stewart um, on the Sky Cricket podcast a couple of weeks ago where he talked about his role as director of cricket really identifying how do you win a championship and you know, this ground has long been associated with great run scoring. It's been one of the better batting decks in the country and Surrey just weren't forcing enough results. So a big part of what Surrey have done here is leave that extra bit of grass in the pitch and their seamers quite often last season fielding five seamers. were given a pitch that would give them the tools for success sort of throughout the four days. And I think generally, I don't know what you thought from, from last summer at least, the days two and three often are the best for batting. So that, that bowling first, generally, you, if, you, if you get the job done on, on day one, you are left with the best batting conditions to get ahead in the game? Well, yeah, it's a test match pitch here. By definition, it's a test match pitch, but it's designed with long-form cricket in mind. Short again and tidily enough in behind it by Matt Renshaw. No cross-bat shots yet by, by the Aussie opener. He's been very studious in defence and very compact in attack. 49 for one, 14 overs gone. Coming up to just a tick before 12, so almost got through the first hour just with that one early dismissal of Sean Dixon. Somerset going OK. Now listen, we have uh, another email in. We have a new email address, folks, surreybroadcast at gmail.com. So if you want to get in contact with us, we have somebody running the show from the the adjoining box to where we are now, and they'll be sifting through all of your messages. Uh, we have a message coming in from Victoria, who says, My son, Matthew, who's 11 years old, has become a cricket obsessive. That's a good start right there. Foolish again, and tipped into the onside for a couple. Lamanby beginning to enjoy himself after that slightly twitchy start. So Victoria's son, Matthew 11, has become a cricket obsessive since enjoying last summer's Ashes, the World Cup, and this season's IPL. That's the stuff in India, isn't it? And he's been eagerly awaiting the start of the county championship over the last few weeks. What a guy Matthew is. We're currently watching the live stream, good on you folks, but hoping we might get to the Kier Oval this weekend to watch in person. Well, the doors will be flung open to you folks, by all means. Bouncer, first one that we've seen from Atkinson, too short this time, and Lamanby gets underneath it easily enough. So hoping to get down to the Kier this weekend to watch in person. And Victoria says, I remain hopeful that Matthew will become a Yorkshire fan like his mum, but as South London nunhead residents, I may have lost that battle already. I rather fear that the pull of, of the South is too strong. But great to hear. Good stuff, that, by Gus Atkinson. And well played, actually, by Tom Lamanby. It's a kind of length and line where a lefty 
He's beginning to feel battle ball. May have just gone searching for it, but he's played nicely within himself. Let that one go by. On uh, Matthew's email, what I love about that is he's consuming everything. He's consuming the test stuff, 50 over World Cup, T20 stuff in the IPL, and, and now the county championship. And now the real stuff. Yeah, great to see. We'll come along by all means, folks, this weekend. Full again and rock solid by Tom Lamanby. He's looked good in this mini passenger plate. Yeah, word out for Nunhead as well, just up the road from where I live. The Ivy House pub, yeah, is it Nunhead? Have you ever been to the Ivy House? I've not. I think it would be your kind of vibe. Quite a cerebral place. They play folk music, live folk music on a Friday night in the Ivy House in Nunhead. It's, it's a fabulous boozer. Not, not quite for Matthew yet, he's 11 years old. Full again. Punched hard, back to the bowler. This is good stuff, a good mini battle here between England's new find in Gus Atkinson and Tom Lamanby, who's had a, a rough couple of years, but he's a very fine player. You know, yeah, as I'm always going on about him. I remember him from that truncated, peculiar mini summer post-COVID in 2020 and made 306 games. Fifty-one for one from fifteen. A word on Lamanby from your good self, and I will pass over to Adam Collins. I think both Lamanby and Renshaw have looked very secure over the last half an hour or so. Sorry, not really either creating opportunities nor even um, looking like that is just around the corner. Very rarely beating the bat. Lamanby took a while to get going, but has looked increasingly solid over the last 20 or so minutes as Phil Walker is replaced by Adam Collins. Great to be here. Yep, the Lemon Bee love. I was indulging in that back in 2020. I was doing the game where he made the 100 at Lords, the Bob Willis Trophy final against Essex. He batted gorgeously that day. Freezing cold. Remember that as well. Yeah, a couple of lean seasons, but... As we mentioned before, he started this season, the pre-season, and round one in, in pretty good nick, Lamanby. So, all eyes on him. Yeah, I feel it, it is not an uncommon career trajectory mm. to, to have a breakout season very early on, take a while to really rede rediscover that form. It's easy to forget. He's only 23. He had that breakout summer, uh, I think he turned 20 that June. So really was very young when he had that success. As ever, back of a length over than trying to get up in the ribs or thereabouts, but worked away for an easy single. And another thing for just a young English players who break into county sides at that age, he's played a lot of professional cricket for mm. a guy his age. This is his 49th first class appearance, 70 T20 appearances under, under his belt as well. Someone I'd compare him too in terms of having an excellent summer very early on and taking a while to reproduce that. Someone like Sam Hain, Sam Hain at 18, created a few headlines for, for his runs at Edgebaston. Took a few years to really replicate that, but now in his late 20s is, is one of the most accomplished mm. batters in the country. Yeah, that sort of second album blues thing, right? And in Lamanby's case, after you know, averaging 51 and those aforementioned three centuries had and three years where he hasn't really been able to reach those heights. Average 20, then 29, and then 30 in the last three seasons. On strike here. Also quite a useful left arm medium pacer, mm. which is not for nothing when you sort of think about the career trajectory of a, a top order player. If they have that extra string to their bow, it can be the sort of thing that gets them noticed by selectors. Encouraging carry there for, for Overton. You're just seeing him build into his spell at the moment, finding his rhythm early season, first proper bowl of the 2024 summer. He's pulling out here. Yes, Overton last year, just half a dozen games. He was playing in the Vitality Blast as a, a batter only, but played throughout. 
July than September in those two blocks of games. Lots of twofers and threefers. Never really broke a side open though, having played for England the year before, of course. Things breaking his way quite nicely in short form cricket as well. Playing a miss. Trying to force from the crease. Not a lot of footwork there from Lamanby. False stroke. I spoke to Jay Moverton just before the start of the season. And I think he made a really interesting point about how people perceive speed. So in that season where he broke into the England side, there was a line from Ben Compton who, if you remember at the time, Ben Compton mm. was the guy who scored the most runs in the country and, and certainly was <laughs> facing the most balls. And he said that Jamie Overton, when he bowled at him at Beckenham that year, felt 10 miles per hour quicker than anyone else that he'd faced in the country up until that point. Catches the call, it's upish, but ends up out through cover point for one. So on top here, Overton, 86 and mile an hour. And Overton told me that when he made his test debut at Headingley, and he obviously scored that 97, which means he's just behind Bradman in the all-time <laughs> test averages list, he said he, he, he wasn't at his best rhythm-wise when he made his debut. So on the speed gun, he was, he was lower than he probably was hitting for Surrey a couple of weeks before that. And rhythm is such a big part of a bowler's speed. You know, so often a bowler might be four or five mile per hour down on their um, top, top speed, top average speed. And sometimes people attribute that to fitness. Well, actually, I think more often than not it's just a rhythm thing it's in the same way that a batter can be out of nick mm. I think for a bowl it quite often manifests as their speed is down right end of that over two singles from it 53 for one well had a great winter didn't he Overton playing in the big bash for the strikers it does feel like with Stokes omitting himself from the T20 World Cup gee we're only what are we seven weeks away from that that's creeping up on us that Overton might be it's not quite well placed for that. Shot. Well placed. And sneaks it through for four. That's the shorter side of the ground out to the Galadari stand. And Lamanby through the line. Reaches 25 with a boundary. Well played. It's a great shot. It's one of those where you don't really realise he's timed it so well until it's beaten the infield. Never really loses momentum. Great shot from Lamanby. Really still at the crease. We can see from our vantage point here up in the JM Finstand, very little room to work with between cover and wider Schmidt off, but bisected them. And already a change in tact for Rory Burns. A couple of overs ago, just the one man in front of the square on the offside. Now we've got two conventional mid off joining the man at extra cover, just two slips in play at the moment a man at deep third as well protecting that short offside boundary Somerset did bat well last week in that rain affected game down at Kent not as affected as some others more runs here two back on the leg side after Kent made 284 Somerset Clean the clock on the batting points. Well, not all of them. They got to 403 in their 110 overs before pulling. Well, they didn't. They got bowled out one ball after that. With uh, Lamanby's 90, 66 for Renshaw up top, 57 for James Rue. Looking forward to watching him bat in the flesh for the first time. And Casey Eldridge bowling all rounder made 57 as well. But some opportunities here as well for this these Somerset batters who presumably will, will have competition from Tom Collar-Cadmore when he returns. Of course, Tom Abel, who's out of the side at the moment with a poorly timed hamstring twinge. He picked it up in the university game, having relinquished the captaincy after seven seasons and having, as a side, not enjoyed anywhere near the success the last three seasons as they had before, where they were in the top two pretty consistently in the five years before that. But um, Abel making the decision to take a step back and ready to play just as a batter, and it was all lining up really nicely for him. Had a good winter in the T20 comps and so on, and then only on the cusp of the season to, to do a hammy against the University at Exeter. Again, does it so easily on the front foot, Lamanby. That is class. The same gap located. Two boundaries in the over off Atkinson. 
63 for one, up to 30. It's a great shot again from Lambie, just slightly full from Atkinson, and he really, to be honest, look at the replay, it's not that full. It's a decent length, maybe just full of a length. Bit of a way movement as well from Atkinson, and Lambie leans into it, picks up four more. He's looking really, really good. Took a while to get going, but now he's got his eye in. Very proactive at the crease. Goes that way again, but picks out cover. Where Pope is fielding. 63 for one, 10 runs from the over. So losing one wicket this morning, the visitors. That was Dixon caught in the cordon from a deflection for 10. They were 18 for one, now 63 for one. Going nicely. How much do you think the Kookaburra ball has influenced mm. Surrey's selection here? Last season, Tom Laws was pretty much never present. They would always, pretty much always pick five seamers when using the Dukes balls last year. Is that Overson making his way from the field? So we'll just stay on that and try and get some news as soon as possible. He did pull up after one delivery, well, between deliveries yeah. his previous over, didn't he? So just leaving the field for the moment. change of bowler as a consequence of that's going to be Dan Lawrence who bowled 10 of the first 30 overs up at Old Trafford last week the most amount of overs he's ever bowled in a first class fixture 28 of them part of the motivation for him moving from Essex was that he wanted to bowl more overs and getting the chance here and it sort of feeds into the point you were making before about the the setup for Surrey in the first two rounds with the Kookaburra ball So four wickets last week starts with the slip and the leg slip. But yeah, so I think both sides must have been affected by that to an extent. You look at the, the players that Somerset have left out, Ball, Davy and Leonard. Certainly in the case of Davy and Leonard, more traditional English seamers, if you like, and preferring this week to bring back Craig Overton, who's fit to go, and Pretorius, the overseas, a bit quicker as well, we're told. You'd have watched more Kookaburra ball cricket yeah. than, than me. Aside from the, the relative merits of using it in the competition, yep. what difference does it actually make to the cricket that is played? How, yeah. how, how different can two manufacturers make a cricket ball? Not as much as it used to, I think, is the, is the short answer because they have sort of reinforced the scene. Um, they, they changed the Kookaburras, or the production of them, before the 21-22 Ashes series in Australia. And that was done intentionally. Gangly approach. Gets it right straight away. Nicely bowled. Flight. Gives it a rip. Just 50 mile an hour. It's nothing too quick either. But yes, I think the idea was that um, the, the Kookaburras reputationally uh, were being seen as an inferior ball to the Dukes. Now, you can have your debate around that. I don't propose getting into that, but that the two balls were, were doing two very different things. So the Kookaburra is meant to now be more like the Dukes on that basis. That they've They've tweaked the same. Bit short, and it will be put away. Lamanby got a good look at that. Didn't need to overhit it. One man to beat. Did so easily. He's 34, three boundaries in the last two overs for him. 68 for one. Seeing here one from uh, Samo in relation to our conversation here. Surrey uh, took a total of 17 wickets with spin last season. Just 17 in the whole campaign. Nine of them came in the last innings of the season at Southampton. And then they took nine in one innings last week. To leg slip on the bounce. So if my maths is right, they've taken more wickets with spin this season already than they did in the first 13 rounds of last season. Yeah, well, equal to it, yeah. You got it. Personally, just watching as it, Lawrence finishes over 68 for one after 18, just watching the, the Kookaburra in action last season, mm -hmm. for me, I, I think the difference is that Kookaburra just swings less at, around about this point in the innings. The Dukes yep. genuinely gives you an extra 10, 15 overs where there's pretty decent swing movement to the air, sort of regardless of what the overheads are. 
uh, Surrey last year was so rarely bring on spin as, as that stat suggests this mm. early in innings and now two games in a row I'm fascinated to see how Lawrence goes with the ball as well as the bat this season you know when he played for England briefly I thought his bowling looked alright he yeah. bowled a bit in the Caribbean in early 2022 and obviously at Essex the issue for him bowling wasn't just Simon Armour it was that Matt Critchley mm. is one of the, the better spin bowling all rounders in the country so he just wasn't required that much I think Critchley averaged 20 odd with the ball last season so And similarly, Surrey had the chance to, to use a spinner inside their top six in Will Jacks over the last two years. That's worked pretty well as an option when they required it. But yeah, so often on day one here, they were, they were taking all 10 wickets with their seamers, noting that they don't have Dan Worrell at the moment with that neck injury missing so far. You add Worrell to this. Hasn't quite found it as yet, Atkinson. Down at 77 mile an hour. His uh, reputation is that he's one of the quickest in England, but the speed gun not, not on his side so far in this spell. Just a note on how Lambie has paced this innings. A reminder that he took 17 balls to get off the mark. 18 mm. rather. Nought of 17, now 34 or 50. Basically going a run a ball since getting off the mark. Quick single called through by Renshaw. Good batting. It's a really good call from Renshaw. Alert to the possibility of a quick single there. Lambie had his head down. I think he was content with the dot ball, but Renshaw saw that that fielder at cover was still had a lot of work to do. And that's been a, a trait of this partnership. They've, they've been very proactive at the crease. The scoring rate has moved along nicely. That run rate for the innings just under four runs and over. Short, well negotiated by Renshaw there. Now, uh, your broader point though is is sound that uh, the the Kookaburra historically just doesn't swing for as long. So the point I was making about the seam that that might have changed a wee bit, but the. The movement through the air, you can see with a Duke's ball. I mean, I, I was doing the test match here last year where a ball that was 110 overs old was, was still going around corners, right? The final test here. There's a really good interview on ESPN, ESPN Quick Info with Sam Cook, who obviously had a mm -hmm. lot of success last week. First innings hat trick, six for 14 in the second innings. Obviously a lot of runs in the country when they managed to get onto the field. And he said that with the Kookaburra ball, you have to be just that little bit more selective with what you do with the seam. He said with the Dukes, you can have a, a, a wobble seam ball that wobbles more, yep. as it were. Whereas the Kookaburra, you need to be that bit more precise. So a couple of short ones there from Atkinson, second half of the over. 71 for one after 19. Partnership it's up to 53 between Renshaw, the overseas, and Lamanby, the number three. I mean, it's, it's an experiment. These things go in waves, right? Uh, they go in and out of fashion. So after the 2015 Ashes, where Australia were defeated by the, the seeming and swinging ball at Birmingham and at Nottingham, the next season they played half the Sheffield Shield using a Dukes ball. The idea being that, well, we have to get better in England, we'll use the ball that they use over there. I, I, I'm, I'm certain that it's not unrelated to that England not doing as well in Australia that mm. the Andrew Strauss review recommended using Kookaburras more often in the championship and I'm sure that'll, you know, over time, it's a bit like having a very aggressive coach and having a very hands-off coach. They, they tend to go in cycles. got the long on back so three men back inside the, the first hour and a half of play long on deep square leg and a, and a deep point about 15 yards off the rope towards the Tennyson school for Lawrence yeah there are also so many other variables between cricket in England and mm. Australia aside from the ball again a bit short but the protection out there 
on the offside. Yeah, I read with uh, some interest that Rob Key interview with Will McPherson in the Telegraph a couple of weeks ago saying that this summer is all about investing in that group of bowlers who can hit 85 plus and getting as, as much high quality cricket into them as they can and it's, it's clearly about Australia. It, we're Another Ashes series in 25, 26 it'll be. So still some time away but that group of quicks who haven't had as many opportunities for England because there have been two blokes called Anderson and Broad who have been two of the first names on the team sheet for, for such a long time. Well, now there's, there's one vacancy with Broad retiring and no one knows how long Anderson has left. That's a, an open question, I suppose, this summer. And that should mean that in addition to uh, Atkinson who prompted this conversation, but uh, Josh Tong, who was impressive in his brief opportunity for England last year, whisper it but will Jofra Archer be fit enough to play Red Bull cricket next year there's some chat about that not this year as he makes his return from injury when you go through it there are so many options yeah because when you go back to the final test of last summer England's attack was broad sure he's retired but Anderson 41 Wokes and Wood who had excellent series yep. they're 34-35 now you've still got Ollie Robinson who only a year or so ago was ranked in the top five in the world Sam Cook averages less than 20 for Essex Josh Tung that you mentioned Atkinson obviously went to India and others who've had a chance like Fisher who played in the Windies a couple of years ago so end of the over at 75 for 1 after 20 losing the only wicket this morning on 18 that was Dixon caught by Sibley spectacularly from the bowling of Clark this pair putting on a subsequent 57 Lamanby dominating this partnership and we're seeing on the screen here that Surrey have appointed a new women's captain yesterday, Amy Gordon. Her picture was put up on the pavilion during the week, replacing former captain Eilish Cranston. 22-year-old has uh, come through the, the Surrey pathway, played for the club since under nines, did a lot of captaincy last year as well. But taking on the role formally, Amy Gordon, so has her picture up out on the back of the pavilion, which is a nice thing. So congratulations to Amy and... Good luck for the, the season to come for the Surrey women as Yaz jumped out between overs and we're going to have Cam Ponsonby in for the first time in season 2024 with me. Just back from Australia as well. Hello, Cam. Hello, Adam. How are you doing? Just back from Australia, your hometown, Melbourne. One of the best cities in the world. Especially this time of year. So. Overton, who, who went off the ground for an over, has been swung around to the pavilion end. So whatever it was wasn't clearly serious, because straight back into the attack, replacing Atkinson. But yeah, Melbourne this time of year, a lot made of the Boxing Day test, and I don't want to diminish that for a, for a heartbeat, but the combination of the footy being back and, uh, and the comedy festival, you, you must have enjoyed yourself down there. No, it's wonderful. I think the AFL is, is it's a social phenomenon, yeah. Aussie rules football over in Australia. Well, more to the point, in Victoria, <laughs> And I've been lucky enough to spend some time in Australia, but never during footy season before. Mm. And you wander around the streets and there's just scarves and colours everywhere. It's about mm. eight matches with 40,000 people are ongoing at the same time. I've got big on him there. Around the corner safely, though. Yeah, that's right. I went to the first uh, Saturday afternoon game of the season. Had the great fortune of dropping back into Melbourne after the, the New Zealand Test matches last month. And got to watch my team play in front of 80,000 people. It's pretty special. Um, even if the business end of the season's five months away, you know, just being there and being part of it at a ground like that. So, For my sins, I also um, took in a Melbourne grade fixture. Did you? Went down to watch uh, the first grade finals. Saw Carlton play. Ah, the uh, Carlton South Melbourne final. There's a bit going on there. Extraordinary win for Carlton. Lovely steer. That is just perfect from Lamanby. I mean, he, he picked it early, got into position, but they've got a third man back. Almost no room to work with. But Lamanby, batting delightfully, skips to 42. He's got a textbook technique, Lamanby. As you said hmm. there, the ball just angling into the stumps. He's used that angle to guide it past second slip. There is space there, but I guess it's a tactical position field from sorry to have that kind of deep backward point slash third to kind of deny that as a run scoring avenue but Lavin B has risen to the occasion on this on this occasion. 
What we didn't see last year, Cam, when Surrey bowled first, as they do routinely here. Shots of the morning. So using the width of the crease to steer a boundary then, getting forward on the front foot and crunching it on drive. Perfect timing. Seeing it back here. There's a reason why a lot of people got very excited about this young man when he was a 20-year-old back in 2020. Well, a few years on, he's the man in form for Somerset at the moment. You see that that was a difference in length, not a difference in line of delivery from Overton. Lamanby's hit the ball in two completely different directions. He really kind of forced Overton's hand here, so much so that he's now coming over the wicket. Mm. A change of angle. It's not too much, too dramatic shift in field, unless I've, unless I've missed something. Still two back on the leg side, if and when the short ball comes. As it does here, and it gets him on the front arm and spits away to backward point. Oh, do you know the game, Adam? <laughs> you know the game. You snuck that in just just in time. So I, I saw it. It's, it's one of the, I saw Overton look towards deep backward square before he <laughs> ran in. I um I interviewed. Ouch. I interviewed Jeremy Snape last year of Moonball fame. Oh, yes. And he said one of the quirks and one of the tactics he employed whilst bowling in T20 cricket, especially is when walking back to his mark, he'd always walk backwards. So he was watching the batter at all times. And you'd see where the batter was glancing away to. And if he saw the batter look over to the kind of leg side boundary, just for the sake of the show more than anything, you'd shift it, you'd wicket five, <laughs> five yards to the left. Chance to drive again, makes the most of it. Down the ground, four more, and that completes a very classy half century. Lamanby took half an hour to get off the mark. But from there, he's been untouchable. 50 from 61, chock full of boundaries, putting Somerset into a strong position after being inserted at the toss. 89 for one, beautifully played. And a second consecutive half century of the season for Lamb and Bees. Two from two after 90 against Kent in the first innings. And they're both times that Overton has strayed full in this over. He punished it. And the only time he went short, well, outside of his off stump, he actually, I guess Overson could claim a moral victory of sorts. And yes, I've... Don't use that word. I'm sorry. Actually, Don't I'm, use that I'm, word. I'm a big believer in moral victories, Adam. <laughs> I think England claimed a famous victory last year, actually. But, um, yeah, I think 13 runs off the over from Lamb and Bees, Matt, mm. but struck in the rib cage once. Whether that's one or like, I think Lamb and Bees will say it isn't. I think if I was capable of bowling 80 miles an hour, I would I would say it was. 10 falls out of the 50. So 61 balls to get there. And after a couple of 90s in the last two weeks, one on the university game and, and one down at Canterbury, he's in terrific nick. I was going to ask Samo, uh, who's alongside us this year in, in the in the third chair, about teams being sent in last year and how they went by lunch. Typically it was four or five down, is my sense of it, here at the Oval. As Lawrence starts his fresh over and he's placed by Renshaw out to the deep, moves to the 30s himself. But there was never a side who really made the most of the chance to bat first here after being sent in. Yes, Duke's ball, Kookaburra ball, we've been having that conversation through the morning, but just the energy of the day so far. Somerset made 400 plus last week. The problem they had last year, Cam, Somerset, they only had one player average above 40. Now, yes, James Root, what a performance as an 18, 19-year-old to, to strum half a dozen centuries, but still, point stands that they weren't racking up the types of totals that were putting on scoreboard pressure. I think you can speak to a young batting lineup, which probably has a, that kind of fabled blend of youth and experience mm. at the moment. Aerially, nearly, into the turf whether that tide will turn you've obviously got kind of Tom Banton at five who's kind of always been this prodigious talent who hasn't quite translated it into mm. Red Bull cricket but we are talking about this downstairs where in terms of a county fixture where you want kind of big names playing you're not going to get too many with more test cricketers and players of great potential than this fixture today it's trailing towards that leg stump line at the moment to the two left-handers around the wicket. Lawrence hasn't quite gotten it right other than the first couple of balls. I mean, you're right, this is a this is a high-quality Division One fixture. Tom Batten, you know, we'll see him. He's carded at five. He only played two games last year in, in the four-day stuff, but hasn't 
been getting quite the same opportunities away from home in T20 leagues of late. There was Goldsworthy, he batted four last week. Wonder where he'll fit when Abel comes back in the next fortnight or so. Kyla Cadmore will be back after the IPL. So positive signs after a, a lesser year with the bat in 2023 down at Taunton. And of course the captain, the new skipper, Lewis Gregory. Handy at seven. Single to complete the over. Retaining the strike as well, Lamanby, 52, 93, 4, 1. And uh, I'm going to leave it with you, Cam, a few parting thoughts uh, from you on the over that was, and then it'll be Phil Walker taking up commentary through to the lunch break. Another over from Dan Lawrence there. Four singles taken off with relative ease. He's had a very interesting move to Surrey. Now he's playing a much kind of higher profile role, potentially with the ball, than not was be expected, but... He's playing, he's playing a kind of very serious all-rounder role. And I did greatly enjoy last week when Lancashire, who have kind of outwardly spoken, or have outwardly stated their plan at home to produce kind of more spinning wickets, combine Nathan Hartley, Tom Hartley, Nathan Lyon. Check the scorecard and see nine wickets between Cameron Steele and Dan Lawrence. But most excitingly, Phil Walker has uh, joined me to lead the conversation for the next half an hour. Yeah, L Lawrence bowled 20-something overs on day one uh, last week. It felt a little bit like when Stokes bowled Jack Leach for 20-odd overs at Headingley a couple of years ago against New Zealand. Shot. More runs. It won't go for four. Jordan Clark will pull it in, but an easy three. He's moving very, very nicely, very economically now at the crease. Yeah, and Stokes was making a statement back, way back when, um, on day one, at Leeds, where you don't tend to take too many wickets with, with finger spin, and he was saying to Jack Leach, you're my main man, yep. and you're going to be my man for the next year. And Leach, in the end, took 10 for in the match, and it felt like Rory Burns and the, perhaps the management as well, they were making a statement to Dan Lawrence, saying this is one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why we've signed you. purely anecdotal but I do wonder whether a symptom of kind of Ben Stokes captaincy and man management over the last three years or last two years or where it's potentially changed the way other captains go about their game is it used to be that proactive captaincy meant lots of changes short spells today boys be ready to go at any point whereas now is the kind of the show is how much you back and support someone that translates itself into very long spells of bowling so you'd see Shah Bashir wouldn't bowl for a session in, over in India and then he'd bowl 30 in a row and kind of the, the new way or new kind of symptom of how you prove your allegiance to a player is to go right we're going to be proactive with how we change our plans and how we change our fields but you are going to be the person who enacts all of those short ball well directed but Matt Renshaw sways inside and makes sure he gets the, the hands outside the line 96 for one here with just a tick under half an hour until lunch so Somerset have done well up until now Surrey have been forthright but not been much movement laterally might be the ball might be that the pitch is relatively docile at this stage well play just rising that slightly short of a length delivery outside of Stump and he just picks up another single. And so Overton is really giving it his all here, but they are getting in behind it. The odd ball is climbing uncomfortably, especially towards Tom Lamanby, who's been delightful off the front foot, but slightly less secure off the back. But you feel like Surrey will be pushing hard in the last half hour here up until lunch because they do need one here. 97 for one, having inserted Somerset. Tidily played again, just letting the ball come to him this time. And he's been very fruitful through third man. As indeed he has down the ground as well. This has been an impressive technical classy knock 
so far by Tom Lamanby, who we've discussed already this morning, but it does bear repeating. He exploded from nowhere, didn't he, in that that shortened summer and really struggled thereafter. But they like him here. They've taken him out of the firing line as an opener where he, he played unevenly, if you like, for a couple of years. He's now looking like he's going to be ensconced at number three. And he has the game for a number three as well. He's quite expansive. He has all the shots. And I don't know about you, Cam, but he looks a bit stiller at the crease. I was watching him, not so much last year, but the year before when he was going through a real horror trot binary scores really and there was a lot going on there was a number of trigger movements and like many a batter before and after trying to find his way back into form and with that comes a sometimes the body betrays the mind a little bit he looks very still here and this I think is the, the latest trend in batsmanship you see Dan Lawrence who you'll see probably tomorrow at this rate but again there were many trigger movements to him two years ago and now he stands very still at the crease and this is the way that the modern player they've reverted back to a slightly more orthodox and old-fashioned way of doing things it's working for Lamanby at the moment Lawrence it will be shortish but cuffed away behind square for no run if anything for Lamanby here without much spin yet on offer for the off spinner it will be a case of controlling the the urge to get a little bit too overconfident. Short boundary on the leg side, of course. And there is a point, in fact, it wasn't quite there for the drive. Thrown his hands at it. Big open space between backward point and straightish extra cover. Of course, there's a man covering boundary riding out there on the offside. But that's what Lawrence is looking for bit of turn as well and good this by Daniel Lawrence who you feel will be a repeat of what happened last week he's going to get through a lot of work this afternoon and crucially he doesn't bowl too many bad balls doesn't drag too many down he's much more than an occasional part-timer game plan for Surrey against Lamanby is fairly clear here in that he's been so strong against anything over pitched as it were and they do have that fielder out on the offside boundary no one else on the leg side so Dan Lawrence is effectively kind of tossing it up without the risk of going for four trying to get Lamanby to play that drive two leg side this time and Lamanby jumps all over that rolls the wrist nicely on a sweep shot behind square easy pickings really for a player in form and he moves into the 60s and Somerset bring up the 100 102 for one in good time here this has been a statement hour and a half really by the visitors setting a platform that's certainly planning to from where they can attack later on in the game bubbling up nicely this one Excellent crowd in as well. Shortish and more runs. Couple behind square. And so half a dozen more to Tom Lamanby across the over. And Lawrence rather disconsolately heads off to, to the outer. But it's going to be... Uh, Fancy, it might be a change of bowling from the far end as we look at it. The Mickey Stewart members pavilion end indeed. Yet yeah, Jordan Clark is going to replace Jamie Overton who gave it his all from both ends. And he just couldn't quite get that breakthrough. And so Jordan Clark, who opened things up this morning, back into the attack. Picked up the only wicket to fall so far. And he bowled some, some rapid stuff as well. I don't know if you were on at the time Cameron but he was pushing 85, 86, 87 strong muscular kind of bowler gets through the crease hard hits the bat hard 
he's become a real stalwart for this club since making the move down from the north and player of the year as well of course they need one here to Surrey 20 minutes away from Somerset having a very very kind of enjoyable session for the visitors at the rate they're going they'll finish close to 130 for one I think Surrey will be quite disappointed in just the lengths that they've bowled if you look at Lamb and B's strike rate going along at 86 11 boundaries out of 62 A, there's a difference between if someone's striking at 70 or 80 when the boundary count is quite low that shows a, a batter who is feeling com comfortable rotating the strike and maybe that's their route to have been scoring runs in that respect but Lam and B when Sari have hit their lines or lengths even have been has been very disciplined and hasn't felt the need to kind of force anything he's just been punishing any stray deliveries and he's been doing it so much so that they his team are wrestling along at kind of four and a half and over this round the wicket angle he really was enjoying against Overton. I'll see if be interested to see if Clark has any more joy against Lamanby in this respect. More runs this time. Again behind square down to deep third. Lamanby staying, as I say, very economical and still in the shot, just letting the ball come to him, playing with a full face. A kind of mirror image of a Kane Williamson kind of shot where he just runs it off the full face, doesn't play with half a bat but with a full bat. It is something, something you said which I, I really agree with. Is I, I think one of the most Blimey. overused <laughs> the most overused phrases in sport is when they say, oh, they, they make the game look easy. And most of the time when I watch professionals, I think, oh, I can't do that. <laughs> oh, it's impossible. <laughs> but Lamanby is kind of using such an economy of movement. He's playing such a simple game this morning that he is kind of making the game look easy in that, in that cliche. Going over the wicket now to Renshaw. Who's played a quiet hand, really, with Lamb and B, the more expansive at the other end. But this partnership is developing very nicely. 88 now it's worth. Yeah, it's been good hard stuff this morning. Absorbing cricket. Good numbers in. Set fair as well for the rest of the afternoon. Come along by all means, folks. Free after tea. foolish this time and going back to what you were saying Cam it's it's a risk and reward isn't it it's early season you've got a new ball in the hand you've won the toss as is Rory Burns's want he put them in and you're going to bowl a full length you yep. wouldn't want to see a safe length you wouldn't want to see the likes of Gus Atkinson who's a naturally attacking seamer who bowls a full length you wouldn't want to see him hiding behind a naturally short of a length length you wouldn't want to see that just aborts mission for a moment there, Jordan Clark. He's lost his footing. But sometimes you hit the bar and other times the bar hits you. And Tom Lamanby has been more than up to it. After that early, early period, he's been superb, especially against the full one. one of the benefits that Surrey have of having such a, a luxury of riches in the kind of seam bowling department they can they, they, they keep going <laughs> every time it's a change of bowl you're going from Kemar Roach kind of potential player who will potentially be considered a kind of West Indian great in years to come and then they go first change it's Gus Atkinson who's been touring the world of England Jamie Overton who can't be too far from an international call up again Ooh. effort ball this time Renshaw doesn't want anything to do with it. He's not played one cross-bat shot that I can recall all morning. Matt Renshaw has played very much inside his own bubble. 106 for one. With just 20 minutes now. 17 minutes even until the lunch break. Where, stay with us because we have a fascinating in-depth interview with the boss here, Alex Stewart, who explains the thinking behind his decision to make this his valedictory year it's just not going to feel the same there's going to be a vast chasm where the great man has always been I don't think he'll be a stranger to this place but the club will move on 
Lawrence again, not afraid to chuck it up there, Cameron. I think they're continuing with this plan to Lamanby from the spin department. They do feel you can take that risk. Lamanby hasn't shown, and why would he have shown any kind of desire to take Lawrence over the top? You can, you can dare him nevertheless. speaking to one of the members of staff here at Surrey earlier and he was saying the news that Stuart was leaving was was the one piece of news that genuinely made him gasp over mm. how many years he's been working here you can't quite imagine what the Oval and what Surrey County Cricket Club will be without him yeah well do stick around if you can at lunchtime because it's a genuinely fascinating interview short sure. but he's content is Tom Lamanby not to do anything too funky here just pick off the run scoring options I'm chatting to Alex Stewart's brother after lunch Having the great man Neil the great man Neil oh now there there goes a the cricket man it'll be a, an interview about batting yeah that'll I can imagine found, it will be that we found in a, a, a publication you may be familiar with called Woodston Cricket Monthly in the, in the upcoming edition I should have known that, shouldn't I? I like Dan Lawrence to continue. Again, air behind the delivery, but it's floated outside the eye line, and Matt Renshaw has climbed into that. Four more. Somerset looking relatively untroubled here. Yeah, Neil Stewart, one of the great cricket men. Rory Burns swears blind. There's no better observer of, of a bat batsman's technique, a batter's technique, than Neil Stewart, who's been Burns' his long term, long time mentor, really. He's trusted by so many of player, the players who come through the ranks at Surrey. Holly Pope and Dom Sibley have both worked with him extensively. And uh, believe it or not, I, I used to coach with with Neil Stewart. That was one of my first jobs. I wasn't allowed to coach any of the kids who were any good. <laughs> in case I ruined them. <laughs> so if you do remember being coached by me, sorry about Perhaps that. It should have been the other way around. Neil works with the poor ones and you work with the good ones. No. Another easy single to finish the 26th over so 1-1-2 one, one, for 1 Somerset going well Renshaw 38 Lamb and Beat 64 I remember the week before the first Ashes Test match when Burns was opening the batting for England and he he'd struggled a little bit in the build up for a bit of rhythm and we were working over there in the Alec Bedser stand and I looked out on the practice strips here at the, at the Kia Oval and I saw the big man Neil with Rory Burns. It's like that scene in, Reserv in, in uh, Pulp Fiction where they call up Harvey Keitel, Mr. Harvey. Wolf, and they call up Mr. Wolf, and as soon as they call up Mr. Wolf, you know that everything's going to be okay. <laughs> A week later, we've had 133 against Pat Cummins and co. Here he comes, Jordan Clark. That would be fascinating to get some insights from Neil kind of ways to prepare for the season it's, I think it's one of the coaching at an elite level versus for a non-elite level a club level how it differs because you're dealing with people who kind of know their games in such different respects and the basically most of us need to be told what to do <laughs> and then the elite players kind of maybe just need a nod here or there More runs beautifully played by Matthew Renshaw. Gordon Clark over pitching, couldn't get down quick enough by the bootlaces and that runs away for four more. There's been a lot of runs down towards the pavilion end this morning. Surrey searching for that late movement in the air perhaps. Not so much off the pitch. But if they don't get much going then it becomes quite a longish half volley and when they do have a chat at lunchtime, perhaps they can acknowledge that, that their lengths have been slightly awry up until now. Shorter this time and can't beat Kimar Roach at straightish mid-wicket. I imagine they'll be 
probably being close to what you said initially about you'd rather miss full than miss short. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me, I think in, um, I'd say this as, as someone who's played tennis about twice in my life, apparently in tennis the, the, the positive mistake is you always want to miss your serve long. You don't want to serve into the net because that shows you're kind of forcing the effort and you're trying to kind of hit deep into the court. It's the same here where if you are trying to bowl that full length, if you are trying to challenge the stumps, the better place to miss is full. Mm. However, at 116 for one, you don't, you don't want to miss that much, Phil. No, indeed. Another effort ball short. And again, Matt Renshaw's got no interest at all in exhibiting the hook shot, the pull shot, the cut shot. Been a proper good opener's knock this up until now. So you've only played a couple of games of tennis. You're more of a real tennis kind of man, aren't you, Cameron? Don't do that to me, Phil. Don't, don't, don't say such libelous accusations. <laughs> I'm surprised you haven't got a free game at Lords. <laughs> Up and coming young buck as you are. Jordan Clark in again. And he again, just as Overton before him, he's putting everything into this spell. Even at this early stage of the game, you sense that this is a key mini passage, really. Just the one down, 10 minutes to go to lunch. It's been a fabulously entertaining morning session of play. Both Lamanby and Renshaw batted so well in, the, in their own kind of particular styles. Lamanby has been so good at kind of selecting length and picking length and how he wishes to kind of combat both deliveries. Renshaw has been far more compact. I Inconveniences in this time, well-directed bumper by Jordan Clark to finish the over. 27 gone now, 1-1-6 one, one, for one. Another effort ball. Just the boundary conceded from that previous over. It's so hard to contain two batters who are going well though at this ground. You saw it early on just in the first 10 minutes, a couple of, as we see that delivery just fly past the left ear of Matt Renshaw. I saw it in the first 10 minutes, a couple of soft handed dabs and they run away immediately for four and suddenly you're away. Renshaw's into double figures very, very quickly without having played a shot. That's what you get here at the Kia. Wonderful image there. It's one of the great spectacles in cricket when you see the batter leaping out of the way of a bouncer, kind of jerking their head. Who, who does it evoke for you? Is there a player that it epitomises that? I'm worried my answer is kind of the 101 boring answer, the kind of the images of Atherton. Yeah, that's where, that's where the, the mind way. goes, isn't it? Atherton. And I also had a DVD, I had Tough as Duffers on DVD as a child. One of the finest publications of, of, of modern, <laughs> in recent memory. Every little help, Duffers. And, <laughs> and it was, they did a huge section on the Bri on Brian Close. Yeah. And when he was got, got worn, when he just took all those blows to the body. I mean, that really kind of, I remember thinking as a child, I went, I don't think that's worth it. <laughs> Get out of the way. Yeah, we've got Andrew Sampson with us. He'll nod or shake. Uh, Old Trafford, 76, was it? Old Trafford, 76. Batting with John Edrich, of course. Towards the fag end of day three or four, England in a horrible place. Forty-five years young, Brian Close called back into the team, of course, because they were falling like nine pins. But as he used to say, Closey, well, it only hits you for a second. That is a lie. <laughs> that, is, that is a lie. <laughs> I do, but the presentation, I, I, it took me until I was kind of quite old, or potentially even an adult, to realise that Brian Close was actually a very serious cricketer. Very, very smart man as well. Brilliant cricketer. Because the, pre the presentation in, in, in this fine DVD was, in effect, that he'd basically been, it was someone's next door neighbour and they'd asked him just... <laughs> have a go as like a sacrificial yeah. lamb. <laughs> yeah, he had a peculiar international career, did, did Brian Close. He didn't really make too many runs, but captain for six games, I think, and won five of them, something like that. Well, I've, <coughs> I've got a quiz question for you. I interviewed Brian Close once, just briefly. Yeah? Uh, Kate went over to me, he was in his dosage by this point, sitting on a pub table. And I said, do you mind if we just have a few minutes, Brian? And he said, go and get me a whiskey and then we can talk. So I did, Very nice and an hour passed blissfully with the great man.
and there is another single bringing up the 100 partnership 118 for one they came together in the first 20 minutes of the day and they've been relatively untroubled chanceless really up until now one or two iffy moments against the short short ball but basically serene progress 146 balls for their three-figure partnership Somerset going well here a few minutes up till lunch Sorry, desperate for one more and as for Lawrence who completes another over he's just going to have to sit in a little bit here do a containing job Will Jacks of course did it so well year before last in particular yeah. in the side as a batter who bowled and became Surrey's if you like their anchor man in, in their in their bowling attack and did a lot of the the water carrying work uh, enabling Burns of course to rotate the quicks from the other end and Lawrence is going to have to fulfill a similar kind of role here Will Jacks of course is currently over in India with I think RCB he's indeed made his debut yesterday the season yesterday bowled okay I thought in a rather tricky situation <laughs> Squares him up this time. Legitimate edge, but went down. No second slip already. Still in that morning session, but Rory Burns on the defensive at this point. Yes, I'd like to ask you a quiz question, Phil. About cricket? About about Brian Close. Oh, well, right. Actually not, but he, he's the start. He's the kind of the hook of the question. So Brian Close has the second longest test career in terms of time. Yes. His debut in his last... Appearance, 26 years, 356 days. All bold, well directed, and well played by Tom Lamamy. There is only one person where there's been more time between their first match and their last match. This will be a question for the listeners, the viewers as well. If you don't know, that's only if you don't know the answer. Then we can throw it out. If you do know the answer, I reckon Andrew Sampson will know to my left. I I, I could make a barely educated guess, well, but I, I don't I don't want to ruin it in case by some mad fluke I'm actually correct so let, let's let's open that up we've got four minutes plus a couple of minutes to wrap up the morning session to co so if anyone thinks that they know the answer to Cameron's poser whack it on on Twitter or whatever it's called these days or email us sorrybroadcast at gmail.com Brian Close of course was as well, England's youngest test debutant until Ray and Ahmed in 2022. What, what was his record, Samo, as a skipper? It was outstanding, right? Six from seven, six wins from seven. That was enough for the TCCB on your way. Shortish for, again, Tom Labenby has been lethal to anything wide. He stood tall on that one. Not too much foot movement it's a true pitch of course and he's just again let it come to him played it under his eyes and chopped it away behind square class Cameron absolutely and at risk of being reactionary I'd be really interested to see in general sorry I've gone round the wicket to Lamanby and over the wicket to Renshaw I'd be interested to see if they swap that over let's the ball go outside off stump the reason complete being, control the reason being Lamanby has been so the word kind of content and kind of decisive in his game plan around the wicket the angle coming the ball coming into him he's been happy to kind of lean back and cut the ball away when it's ever been a good length and kind of just short of a good length and as soon as it's full he's driven beautifully down the ground whether just a change of angle will force him to change his game plan he might hit the ball even further you never know giving it everything he's got here Jordan Clark, but nothing doing as yet and you feel probably that'll be his work done for the morning just a couple of minutes now up until lunch you imagine it will be Dan Lawrence to see us through to the break so are we going to reveal the, the answer at a couple of minutes past one should we do that Sounds like a, a, a mighty fine plan. I just looked back up on my uh, computer screen and saw a, a, a profile. I thought I was still on Brian Close's profile, and then I saw he played 128 T20s, and I thought, probably not him. 
It was Tom Banton. It's going to be an interesting afternoon, isn't it? With Somerset's stroke makers ready to roll. Fabulous. Fabulous position they're in here. just received on my monitor the answer to our question and it wasn't the person I thought it was. Well, it's not the person he says it is either. Oh sorry, no this was <laughs> this was Graham White. Okay, fine. Graham sorry, White from Exeter CC. We'll come back to Graham. He's gone long. Effortlessly done and into the bleachers. And that brings up his 50 from 83 deliveries. It's been a real masterclass here by Matthew Renshaw in complete control. Chance is right from the start. Just gone about his business unflustered, undemonstrative. Lamanby's played more attacking, expansive shots from one end. As Renshaw's gone about his business, 129 for one. First maximum of the morning and a statement going into the afternoon session. Just as Tom Lamanby had made his second innings in as many, second innings in as many, second half century in as many innings of the season. Matt Renshaw joins him with that accolade after 66 against Kent in the first game. Do people, I, am I the only person with access to the answer at the moment? I feel very powerful at well, the moment. Well, Simon Bennett from Truro in Cornwall has just popped up and he and I are on the same page. Well, this, it may well Whether we're on the right page or not is another thing. Anyway, let's see this out. Three deliveries up until lunch here. Dan Lawrence. What can he conjure? Shortish and easily punched into the on offside. And so Matt Renshaw moves on to 51. Just a couple of deliveries left. And you imagine that Renshaw will happily sit on his bat now and get his mind ready for a spot of lunch and more fun in the afternoon. Shortish to the final delivery of the morning session and punched happily, serenely enough up to long on. Lamanby will resume in the afternoon session, 70 not out. It's been a sparkling knock, 86 deliveries. Matt Renshaw as well, just ticked past the half century mark with a fabulous effortless six down the ground, just showing the form that he's in. And indeed, there aren't too many gremlins in this clear oval pitch just yet. It's been hard yakka really for Surrey's bowlers who have stuck at it, bowled a full length, searching for as yet pretty elusive swing and seam. And Somerset, having been inserted, will be very pleased with their work 1 3 1 for 1. We'll run through it a little bit more in a moment, but we have to clear up this, this poser. So we've had a, an avalanche, I would say. Graham White from Exeter CC, home of Tom Lamanby, of course. He'll be feeling pretty good about life this morning, will Graham? He says, was it John Traikos, who of course played for South Africa just before they were isolated and then returned to play for Zimbabwe, I think in 92, playing in Zimbabwe's debut test match, I believe. Close, but no cigar? No cigar, I'm afraid. He's, uh, according to Quick Info, he, he, he is sixth in the list, but there's been a number of... Uh, answers were saying uh, John Traker, so I'm, which I'm intrigued about in case uh, I start to doubt the uh, information being given to me but the answer is Phil Walker and you can you can reveal it I'll give you that honour well the first name that popped into my head was Wilfred Rhodes who played for 30 odd years or something something mad like that of course began as a number 11 ended up opening the batting what were his figures what were his figures 
Well, the answer, Wilfred Rose, is indeed is that correct. correct. It is correct. There was 30 years and 315 days between his first <laughs> and last appearance for England. 58 test matches, 2,325 runs, an average of 30. Get about the team. There we go. But there we go. The great, we... the great Wilfred Rhodes, Yorkshire's finest, of course. Thank you for your, your efforts here, folks. A lot of people saying John Triacos, including Stuart. Begins his email, afternoon, gentlemen. You've got to, you've got to admire that touch of class. Makes the point. Also, the only test cricketer to be born in Egypt. There you go. That might be a prompt for the afternoon. Test cricketers that have been born in, if you like, non-traditional cricketing outposts. John Traikos, Egypt's finest. Um, let's have a quick run through of other scores as well, folks, just before we move on to the Alex Stewart interview, uh, which is coming up in just a moment. Looking at Div 1 first up, Essex recovered well from a rocky start. They lost Feroz Kushi to the first ball that he faced. He shouldered arms for a first ball blob. And then they lost Tom Wesley for five, but they've recovered well to 123 for two against Kent with runs for Elgar and Jordan Cox. They've both just passed 50. Hampshire and Lanks down at Southampton. James Vince is going well, Cameron. 48 not out to the great stroke making maestro. Nick Gummins as well, 21 not out, two down for 98 uh, against Lanks. Uh, a run out, uh, Fletcher Middleton was run out early on for six and Ali Orr nicked off to Toby Bailey for just 10. Still, good recovery again, similar to the Essex story, good recovery. Knots 83 for two, so this has been the theme, two down around the grounds. Ben Slater is 40 not out, Joe Clark 16 not out, Knots 83 for two against Worcestershire. Uh, this is taking place, of course, at Nottingham as well. And I guess there'll be an element of edge to that particular fixture Absolutely. with Knots having uh, siphoned off one or two Worcestershire players last, last summer, including Dylan Pennington, including Jack Haynes, including Josh sure. Tung. Yeah. Uh, OK, elsewhere we have Warwickshire as well. They're going great guns against Durham. Interesting this from Birmingham. 146 for naught at lunch. So that is a statement by Warwickshire's openers against Durham. The great unknowns, of course, in this summer. Many people tipping them to, bo to bother the upper echelons of the league. I understand why, but Alex Davis, new skipper at Warwickshire, is 88 from 86, 14 fours and a six. Rob Yates anchoring the innings, 55 from 83, but 146 for, for no loss after Durham won the toss and chucked them in. So that's your Div 1, folks. We'll come back to Div Division 2 perhaps at the start of the afternoon session. We'll be back here around 1.35, 1.40 for what promises to be a fascinating afternoon's uh, play here at the Kier Oval. It's set fair and just a message as well before we go to the Alex Stewart interview. Free after tea. Come in, free after tea. If you're in the area and you fancy ambling over to start your weekend in style, then come and join what's been an excellent crowd up until now. It's been a fascinating morning session. And without further ado, here we go with that Alex Stewart piece. Alec, you have um, made a, a big decision. Um, tell us what that decision is. Probably the toughest decision I've had to make in my working life, um, and that is I will be stepping down from the role as director of cricket as of the end of this calendar year. Um, a role that obviously I've thoroughly enjoyed doing, um, but people may know, you know, my wife has suffered with cancer for the last 11, 12 years or whatever it may be. Um, and I've always said I owe her time, one from when my playing days were, um, and this job is 24 seven, 365 days a year near enough. And therefore, to be fair to the family, and I always have this family first motto, um, and to be fair to the club, uh, I've let the chief exec and the chairman know um, that I'm stepping down, I say, from a role that I've thoroughly enjoyed and love. It's a decision that you've been thinking about for a, a little period of time. Um, why is now the right time for you to make that call? Oh, there's a notice period in the contract, but I sort of put that to one side just because of the, the understanding and um, relationships I have here with the, the people who, who, who I report to. Um, one, I wanted to do it before the start of the season. Um, I didn't want that to be a distraction during the season. 
Um, but just as importantly, if not more importantly, it now gives the club a good length of time to plan for the person to come into this role. Um, what does that role look like? Will it be the same? Do they want to do it differently? That's totally up to them. Um, and I just felt it was right once I knew 100%. And yes, I've thought about it for a, a good period of time because of how much I've enjoyed the role. Um, so yeah, tough decision, really tough decision, but I know it's the right decision. Um, and hopefully the club will, um, will understand that, but they can now plan uh, to make sure they have a good replacement. Expand for us a little bit on that point about the club and what it means to you and, and to your family, really. It's, it's pretty well known. Look, Dad came here as, when did he start? 50-something, 50 54, 55, somewhere around there. Um, he's been here ever since. I obviously came here to watch him. I was brought up here by Mum uh, to watch him as a little kid. Um, I played age group cricket with Surrey. Um, signed here as an 18 year old um, and have been here ever since. I'm a contract to start in 1981 and are still here in 2024, having not really gone too far in between. So it is home from home. Um, it is my second family, um, but yeah, my first family is obviously at my first home. So that's how much it means to me. You know, I love this place. You know, it, um, you've got the Mickey Stewart Pavilion, you know, fortunate enough to have currently the Alex Stewart Gates. Um, but it's not just those things, it's, it's the memories, you know, up there, they're never going to go. Uh, and that's why each day I drive through or walk through the gates, I actually say to myself, how lucky am I that I've been able to have a, a working life where every single day I've looked forward to coming here, uh, whether it's as a player, as a say, or as a DOC. And that's sort of the biggest honour I can thank the club for. Um, because not everyone is lucky enough to have had a job that if it wasn't a job it might have been their hobby and I've had that. So every single day I've walked in here I've looked forward to the day ahead. A few times I've walked out of the gates at the end of the day I might not have enjoyed it if we've lost or whatever um, but that's part and parcel of the role but I just love this place. It is, it's home from home. And that must have made the decision that, that bit more difficult? 100% you know so I I've loved the job, you know, and that, and that is the thing, and that's why I said at the start, it is, I think it is, well, not I think, I know it is, it's the toughest decision I've had to make in my working life, um, because it's impacted on me, and it may have impacted on the club, because I don't think they were, well, they weren't expecting me to have made this announcement then, and uh, listen, it, it's still new, um, but the phone calls I've had from players, or messages, and it's, it, they're the things that I'm going to miss, is the one, the, sort of the adrenaline you, you rush you get when you're involved within a team or a squad set up, even though I'm sat back from there, um, walking through the dressing room at times, listening to the idiots in there, uh, and then seeing an idiot in me walking through. They're all the things that you know, I've had from being a player, as I said, as an 18-year-old right through to now as an old person, um, that you're going to miss, but you've got to move on. You know, that, that is the thing. So I've always been pretty good at that. Once something is done, it's done. But one thing it, that isn't done is my love of Surrey um, and the passion I have for this place. During your time as director of cricket, you've had a real philosophy that you've wanted to impart upon the club. Can you just expand on that and what it's been? Oh, listen, when I was asked to come, come into the role by the two Richards, Richard Gould and Richard Thompson, um, Listen, they know I have a love for the club and, and always have done. It's been my sort of second home for, for most of my life. I wanted to come back, one, to try and make Surrey the best county in the country. Um, I always wanted to make sure we've always had a very strong talent pathway um, so that we can bring our own players through onto, uh, onto the professional staff. I want to win trophies. Um, and I also want our players to go on to play for England. That's sort of been my philosophy um, and sort of pillars, if you want to call it that, that I've tried to build on um, over this period of time. And that development side, the, the player pathway, we've seen some, some real quality players come through. Um, just talk us through some of their journeys and the pride that you get in seeing them perform for Surrey and then go on to England honours. Well, the pathway has been, you know, has been very, very good for a, for a long period of time now. Um, and we are very fortunate, we've got a lot of good schools in the area, we've got a lot of good clubs in the area, with a lot of good coaches, um, and therefore our players get a, 
get a nice grounding, a nice sort of head start, and then they come into our pathway uh, along with our setup there. That hopefully allows their talents to flourish and mature so that when they come onto the professional staff, they are good to go as such. And we've got some nice stories, you know, we can name so many players. Um, but if you say, look at Ollie Pope, um, he, I gave him his Player of the Year Under Nine, t under nine Award um, way back when. And then I was able to give him his Surrey debut. Um, and England asked me to give him his debut cap when he made his test debut at Lord. So that's a nice little story. Sam Curran obviously came in around the age of 13, 14 and now you know, look where he is. Uh, Will Jacks, I can name, you know, so many, but I'm very big on when they, if they come through the pathway with the ambition to play for Surrey, say from the age of eight, nine, ten, even if it's not till 15, then there's a real strength and a real good Surrey core within the dressing room. And then when we need to bring in from outside to use a term to supplement what we already have, We've got enough Surrey people in that room to understand what Surrey is about to then be able to pass that on to those who perhaps haven't come through our pathway and very quickly they fall into the Surrey way. Um, and if they don't, they may not still be here. Um, but the good ones are certainly here or have been here and are still here. 11 years in the role um, as Director of Cricket. Um, what is the most rewarding thing for you, for you in that time? That's a tough question. Um, I guess, first of all, being given the opportunity to try and shape Surrey cricket, um, that, that was the, the big challenge. Um, I've always used the word progress. Are we progressing each year, and both collectively and from an individual point of view? Um, I've always enjoyed seeing, as I've just mentioned there, the young players come in, flourish, and mature, go from being a, an age group player to a second team player to a first team player, and then those lucky enough go on to play for England. I've enjoyed that. And I love winning. So, you know, winning, winning the championship three times um, so far has been massive because it had been a long time since we'd won the championship uh, previously. And to do that first up in 2018 was right up there. Um, but then to be able to win it back to back uh, over the last two years has made it even more special and more rewarding. Um, but I'm not done yet. Um, in that period of, of success, how do you work with the players, work with the management staff to keep driving to get better? Listen, if you think you've cracked it, go and find something else to do. You know, that's always been my philosophy. Um, each day, can you do something better than you did the day before? Um, have you got that work ethic? Have you got that desire? Have you got that passion um, to go again? Um, and just talking about the championships, you know, in 18, we were excellent, 19, various reasons, injuries and other things, we weren't as good as we should have been. That's why winning it back to back, in a way, underlines what that question is. That underlines that everyone, not just me, but everyone has that desire to go again, and they will again uh, when we, we start up at Lancashire at Old Trafford um, at the start of April. So you've got to have that desire. Uh, and that's what's really pushed me in, in anything I've done. What is the best version of you? Can you produce that every single day? Um, and I've tried to instill that within the group, um, but I haven't really had to instill it because they've done it, you know, and, and that, that is a good thing. You know, Gareth Batty now is head coach. He is Surrey through and through, despite, you know, being born in Bradford. Um, he gets this club and got this club as soon as he first came here. Um, and you can see that in the passion and the work ethic that he has, and that rubs off on everyone else. So yeah, nine months away, you know, I won't be here, but I know I'm leaving it in very, very good, safe, very capable hands with people who are still just as ambitious um, as me and want to make sure that Surrey remain very much at the top. You've mentioned some of the highs um, that you've had during your period. Are there any regrets you look back on and, and you, you think about how things could have been done differently or moments um, that you would want to change or, or go over again? There's a few. I don't like losing Lords finals. I don't like losing 2020 finals. Um, so, yeah, we lost 350 over finals um, on the trot. Um, I'm yet to win a T20 blast in this role. Um, and then you look at, you know, signings you make, um, players you bring onto the staff. Have you always made good decisions? They proved to be good decisions. Some have, others haven't. 
Um, have I learned from those? You should always keep learning. That is, that is a big thing. And also having a, the toughest part of the job is saying to a young player or senior player, sorry, we're not renewing your contract. You know, it's great handing out a contract, um, but the real tough, hard part of the job is to say, look, sorry, you're going to have to find something else to do. Um, but overall, have I enjoyed the role? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, um, I was very lucky, as I say, to be asked to do it. I've been very lucky in the support that the club have shown me and given me. Um, I mentioned the two Richards first, uh, Richard Gould, Richard Thompson, that they said, come in and do it your way. I said, Listen, do it my way, thank you, but challenge me along the way, try not to interfere too much. And they were true to their word. And then moving on, um, Steve Elworthy, our chief exec, has been exactly the same, very supportive, um, as have the chairman as, as well in that period of time, Martin Eden, who was the interim, and now Ollie Slipper um, is now the chairman. So. I've been very lucky with those people who I report to in how they have allowed me to get on with the role while still making sure that they're asking questions, challenging and quite rightly so. As well as the, the staff at the top of the club, you've also had some fantastic staff around you, um, coaches, the cricket management team. Um, how important are they to the running of the club and, and obviously how, how confident are you in them to take the club forward once you have left? Listen, the, let's talk about the cricket management head coaches. If they were no good, they wouldn't be here. Um, so at times like, people might think I'm a good bloke, I can be ruthless as well. Um, but just thinking of the coaches I've worked with, either brought in and worked with, um, they might have moved on. So, so we'll start with Graham Ford. You know, what, a, what a person. You know, to work with him, I learned a lot from him. You know, I brought him in, but then learned from him as well. And he then went off to Sri Lanka. It was at the time I think, geez, that's a massive blow. Just starting to move things forward. And, but to be asked to go and coach an international side, we should take some credit for that if we put him a little bit in the shop window. Um, so he was outstanding. Then moved on to Diva, Michael Divinuto, uh, Divinuto, who was brilliant. You know, I didn't know him that well. Um, again, I've done my homework due diligence on him, spoke to him. When I first spoke to him, I thought, we can get on here. He came over um, and then we won it in 2018 under his leadership. Then Covid kicked in and sort of the rest of his history stayed in Australia. Uh, then Vikram uh, Solanke, who had come from Worcester as a player, then put him in the role as second team coach, player coach, as a contingency plan. I always like to sort of prepare for the future. Um, had him lined up to be the head coach and then he got that, was doing a great job until he got an offer he just couldn't turn down to go to the IPL and he's, he's won it um, in his first year there uh, with Gujarat Titans. So, you know, there aren't many better people in the world than Vikram Solanke. And then the current man, Pep himself, Gareth Batty. Um, again, I'd, you know, what a man he is. I, won't, I had earmarked him to be a coach. I'll be honest, I wasn't expecting Vikram to go as quickly as he did. And it was probably a year earlier. Um, or two years earlier, but to push Gareth up, right, he had the title interim coach, forget interim, he was coach because I said, though you've got the interim title in front, run it as though you are the main man, and he's never looked back. So I've been really lucky with the head coaches um, I've worked with, I've been able to appoint. Uh, there's a real trust, um, mutual respect, work ethic, all those things that I'm big on. Uh, and then uh, the staff, the assistant coaches, Alex Tyso, you know, who's head of sports and science and medicine. Pe people like that are so, so important. Um, Steve Howes, who's my cricket ops man. You know, without him, I'd be useless. You know, you'll hate me name checking him. But Steve Howes has been brilliant. He's been here, I think, a year longer than I have. Um, and he'll be the type of person until he retires, or sorry, once he retires, people will, uh, will think, geez, we've missed him, you know. How important was he? How much stuff did he actually do behind the scenes? So I've been so, so lucky with the, with the staff. I've name-checked a few there, but everyone I've worked with, um, all I can do is thank them. And then you move on to the players, the playing group. Yeah. You only have to look to see how good they are. They enjoy each other's company. Um, you know, we talk about a second family, a Surrey family. Um, and with that, you get honesty, you get trust. Um, but you're also allowed to challenge each other. And that's why this group is so good. You mentioned at the start about how this job is full on and 24-7.
can you give us a little bit of insight into into that, into the kind of day to day, and, and into um, into what it takes to be a director of cricket? It, when I say twenty four seven, three six five um, days a year, it, it really is because you're either thinking, you're always planning ahead, planning ahead, planning ahead. You know, what is your staff looking like? What squad have we got? What fixtures have we got? How's a budget looking? Where are we going to stay? How are we going to travel? Um, and then you get players, you know, both as a group, you're speaking with them, and then individuals will have their own conversations that they will need, whether that's personal conversations, whether that's cricket or private, um, their private lives, their cricket lives, they'll ring, whether it's seven in the morning, nine at night, um, that's part of the job, you know, so you are, well, I'm old, I'll say father figure, they'll say grandfather figure, but you're there to, you're there for them, they're obviously there for me, but I'm there for them, um, to make sure that when you put it all together, um, that is helping Surrey. You're stepping down from your role here at Surrey. Um, what are your plans for the future? Well, I'm not going to retire. You know, that, that's, that's the thing which may sound strange to some people who are watching or listening to this. So I'm stepping down because of what I've just said. It's, it's all encompassing. It's 365 days a year. Um, and I owe it to my wife to give her more of my time, she might get fed up with me inside two weeks, first two weeks of January or whatever, she might say go back to work. Um, so that is the main reason, um, but I also need to keep myself active, so I still want to stay in and around cricket, um, one, because as I say, my wife will kick me out otherwise, um, and I still believe I've got something to offer, you know, the game that has given me a, you know, a wonderful work in life. You mentioned at the start that you wanted to make this decision in good time ahead of the start of the season. Um, how will it affect your focus from now until the end of your time here at Surrey? It won't affect it at all. I'm done, as in, we've announced it, right? It was tough telling the players, really tough. A um, bit of motion showed as well by me, I'm not afraid to say. Um, but now I'm absolutely fully focused. You know, I you know, guarantee everyone, members, supporters, players, staff, whoever you may be, nothing now changes. I am fully on board, fully committed until the day I drive out of those gates. Whilst you're stepping away from your, your full-time role at Surrey, is it fair to say that if anybody needs to come to you for a bit of advice or, or some support that you'd be more than happy to pick up the phone? 100%. You know, that is, Surrey is everything to me. Yeah, um, the Oval is everything to me. So if someone wants to pick up the phone, let's say the person who comes into, into my role um, and they feel that they want to speak to me, 100% I will um, have a conversation. Um, but it has to be that way round. It won't be me ringing them, telling them how to do the job. It very much has to come from the new DOC. Um, and if they don't ring me, again, that's absolutely fine. I'll always be a Surrey fan, Surrey supporter, Surrey member. Um, whether I've, say, sat in my office up here, have been in the dress room, or sat, say, with the Peter May boys over there um, supporting the boys. When you step away from this role, there's no doubt that you, you won't be a, a stranger here at the Oval, I'm sure. As you say, there'll be plenty of times that we look out and see you in the stands, um, supporting the team, getting behind the team. How do you think it'll feel different sitting there as a, as a punter? Good question. In a way, I've got no idea um, because I haven't experienced that. You know, if I sort of go back to when I packed in as a player, then coming back here and you're an observer, supporter, etc. It's, it's different because you know six months ago, 12 months ago, whatever it may be, you were in the dressing room now, you're sort of looking in from afar. Um, so yeah, it will be different, 100%, but you know, say whether I'm here watching or following, as I say, on Surrey TV or whatever it may be, um, I will want Surrey to win because they are my team.
Good afternoon, folks. Welcome back. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, it's been an interesting morning's play, to say the least. Somerset, inserted by Rory Burns, uh, have been really on the front foot, 131 for one, with Matt Renshaw and Tom Lamaby both registering very, very classy half centuries. Renshaw went into to lunch on 51, and Lamaby, the more expansive of the two, on 70 from just 86 deliveries, coming on the back of his sparkling 90 last week as well it's been a strong start to this campaign for Tom Lamanby the only wicket to fall was Sean Dixon nicking to initially Jamie Overton and it cannoned off the midriff and was taken at bootstrap level spectacularly by Dominic Sibley on the ricochet the only wicket to fall Jordan Clark picking that one up aside from that it's been pretty hard yakka we're just seeing that replay again. It's worth watching again. Katia Whitney is with me. It cannons off the right boot of Dom Sibley as the ball heads to the floor. And he manages to kind of cushion it up. What a touch that is. And then nabs it with his right hand. But that was the only moment of joy, really, for Surrey. Quite a chastening morning up until now. It looks like a good track. Even covering of grass on it. The odd ball has shot through. Uh, head height, chest height, effort balls here from Surrey Seamers, but aside from that, it's been pretty good to bat on. Kemar Roach is going to kick us off from the Mickey Stewart members pavilion end, and he'll be, as he likes to be, round the wicket to the left-handers. It's going to be Lamb and Beat to take strike initially. 30 overs bowled in that first session, so decent run, decent over eight. A bit of a loosener by the great West Indian and Lamby away again moves on to 71 as I say Katia Whitney joining us for the first time this summer uh, impressions of the first couple of hours out there Katia it's obviously been pretty dominant for the Somerset I don't think we were really expecting that when we came in today but um, yeah it'll be interesting to see how Surrey's attack cope in the next kind of session if it continues this way um, Yeah, it's interesting looking at how Jamie Overton and um, Gus Atkinson went in the first first session and how they're going to be used going forward because pace looks like it's going to go on this wicket. It does. That's been the story so far. The ball coming on to the bat very tidily indeed, especially when Gus Atkinson in particular looking for a little bit of late swing, pushing it right up under the batsman's nose. But Lamanby in particular, equal to it in that afternoon uh, morning session. Got to go again though here. Bullish by Roach and pushed tidily enough up to mid-off. And again, that will be the policy. I think they were going to be prepared to give up a few boundaries to try and induce that edge. Just the one slip now, though, which is a sign of where Surrey are at in the early stages of this one. But as ever, as we saw throughout last year and the year before, Surrey are never more dangerous than when they're slightly up against it. Slight leading edge there, trying to work it into the onside, but with soft enough hands so it doesn't doesn't balloon up. Just sitting next door before I came on stint, it was so nice to see so many people out on the pitch this morning. It was notable, wasn't it? Very notable. You know, we talk about uh, County Championship getting underway in April rightly and all the problems with that, but last weekend of the Easter holidays, loads of kids in. It's been really nice to see them on the, on the playing field. Yeah, it really is, and the numbers are outstanding, really. You know, pockmarks all over the pitch, all over the ground. Short one effort ball. Easily enough for Matt Renshaw just to duck underneath it. He's been utterly untroubled by the short one throughout the innings so far. Yeah, it really does feel, I know that we had last week and one fixture managed to eke a result out. But this feels like the season's beginning here, doesn't it? Yeah. And perhaps we sound incredibly <laughs> London-centric and arrogant saying that, but you know, with the sun out, good crowd in, everywhere's playing as well across the country. Better by Kemar Roach, second part of the over. Still, easily negotiated by Somerset, just a single from it. Feels like this could be a, a big year for Matt Renshaw, doesn't it? Well, he's averaging 50-plus for Somerset. Whenever he's he's played for them, piecemeal over the last few years but he's always performed for them he made a hundred on his debut and 
I think perhaps this, that his next next game, I think it was, early in the season, three or, four, three or four years back, made an outrageous 100 against Yorkshire and a run of ball out of 200 all out and he made 115 or so. So he's already, always performed for them. He's here for much of it, for most of the duration. He's at a peculiar, well, a hinge point in his career, I suppose. You know, he's not, he's, he's not pulled up many trees internationally, but he's certainly not disgraced himself either. And you feel like as Australia's test team starts to evolve, he may yet come back into that conversation. Mm. We'll come back to that because it's going to be Gus Atkinson for the first time from the JM Finn stand end. Didn't get much joy from the pavilion end in the morning session. Long conversation with Rory Burns before. We're starting this over. Yeah, I guess the question is, how much do you gamble? Because he's, he bowls full of length. He's a naturally attacking bowler, but the score, scoreboard says 132 for one. And Lamaby easily enough into the onside. So we have, catcher, we have a wideish first slip and I would say a fourth slip stroke gully. Jamie Overton in there. Backward point, conventional cover. The man on the on the on the hook, I suppose, four fifths back. In fact, moving to the boundary now at deep square and a third, a deep third as well. So, relatively defensive field in outfield. That's better. Half-hearted appeal though. But that's his length, that's where he needs to be more often than not. He was a bit, both lengths it felt for me in the first session, a bit too short, a bit too full. That's where he needs to be. Mm, I was looking at the games Atkinson played for Surrey last season before I came on air and he, um, he was, the, the five games he played, I think three or four of them were nine or ten wicket wins for Surrey, apart from the one he actually took six for in. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how he goes with established batters in. Easy paced, nice carry through to Ben Folks, but as a batter, you like that kind of kind of coverage. It means that you can lean into your shots, saving the knowledge that the ball is going to come onto the bat nicely. It's another cracking cricket pitch. This murmur of turn to the odd delivery in the first session by Dan Lawrence, who bowled tidily enough in a defensive containing role. Again, good length, opening the face this time by Matt Renshaw. We'll pick up another couple down to deep third. That's where he needs to be, though. Gus Atkinson needs to just probe outside that line. Nothing too full. Get these batters feeling for it slightly outside off stump. Skewed outside edge of the bat, running away, though, comfortably enough along the floor. And another couple of runs. It's a good call, I think, by Burns to go to Atkinson straight after lunch. Walked past Rory Burns yesterday on Clapham Junction platform. You say hello? No, I made very awkward eye contact with him and quickly scurried off. Do you reckon he went, ah, oh, that's Katya Whitney, the, <laughs> the young journalist of the year? He was in the front row, actually. <laughs> yeah, he's done a remarkable job here as Rory Burns. He's probably by his standards will say himself that he underperformed with the bat a little bit last year. Steered the team, of course, to a second championship and a third under his tutelage over the years. Good comeback over by Gus Atkins. He looks perhaps a little bit more comfortable from this end. Four runs from it, though. Somerset going about their merry way. One, three, six for one. And just, just looking at a collection of Lamaby's offside strokes from the morning session. He's very easy on the eye, catcher. Mm. Real economy of movement. Leans in to the drive very nicely. And a sign of a player in form is when they can just let the ball come to them, play it under the eye, angles it behind square very, very nicely. Yeah, he scored a, a century in the penultimate round of the season last year as well against Kent, and then 90 last week, so he is in a decent run of form in the championship. He is, and it's good to see, because he's a fine, fine cricketer who's had a very tough three years in Red Bull cricket. Four more. Beautifully played by Matthew Renshaw. 
who's lent into a longish half volley. It's been the story of Surrey's pace attack up until now. And these two classy southpaws are beginning to enjoy themselves. It's a short boundary out there, but that would have run away at any point in this on this ground. They keep on rolling. Mm. Renshaw missed out on that, that contract list that was announced by Cricket Australia last week. The, the amount of Australians over here at the minute. You feel like the Australia selectors' eyes will be very much on the county championship. You've got Marcus Harris and Marnus Labuschagne over here. Australia not playing another test in November. A lot can change from now in November. Uh, and Steve Smith's not made that opening position his own yet. So with five tests against India coming up this winter, you could feel a good run in the championship, good start to the Sheffield Shield season. He could be right back in amongst it. Yes, good point. And there is that sense of the changing of the guard, really, with Australia's test team in the top order. Usman Khawaja having a marvellous Indian summer, but can't go on forever. And Davey Warner, we think he's retired. He says he has. Very full of length and Renshaw's mindful of it. Jabs it out into the offside. Yeah, he's a fine player, Matt Renshaw. He's made test match hundreds as well, so he's comfortable at that level, but yet to really establish himself as Australia's go-to opening bat. I think he's very comfortable in county cricket, though. Enjoys it at Somerset. Oh, inside edge just past leg stump. First sign of a little bit of indecision from the Australian, but such is the way of it at the moment for Surrey. They have to turn around and accept another four bits added to the score. One, four, four for one. But Dicey there just squeezing past the leg stump. He's in no kind of position, trying to angle it down to deep third, I think. It's just come back on the angle from Kemar Roach, so... Just a mere suggestion of hope here for, us, for Surrey Seamers. Short and wide though and punished. Three falls in the over, two of them convincingly and that's the second crash through the offside. It was there to hit. Kemar Roach doesn't normally drag it down but just striving again for that magic ball and it's just a rank drag down in truth. And to a 50-yard boundary, that's meat and drink for Matt Renshaw. Suddenly moves into the 60, 66 now from 99. Lamaby 72 from 89. Good lick. A tightened offside field this time, and he can't bisect the two men there on the drive. And so another over ticks by. Saying that's it feels like the start of the current championship today. Nothing says start of the current championship than... Second session of the day, nothing in the pitch for the Seamers. Long old four days. Yeah, well, it's, it's a funny thing because the, the perception is in April it goes round corners and mm. it's impossible to bat, but the numbers don't necessarily bear that out. It's actually harder to bat in the second month, statistically, certainly in recent years, than it is in the first. Uh, I wonder if our maestro, Mr. Samson, in the corner can dig out a few stats to, to back that point up. Leg sideish again, and first sign of frustration for Gus Atkinson. Turns on his heels, slightly disconsolate, a little bit down on his luck at the moment. Mm, well, we saw last week in the Lancashire game the amount of wickets that failed to spin. That's a misconception in the county championship that spinners can't bowl in early April. Of course, they absolutely can. It just takes a bit of imagination and a bit of skill. Yeah, exactly, and we'll come back to that point because it's a good one. You see it in the test side in particular. Bullish, and that will probably beat the man, indeed it will. It was there to hit, he's driven it through the onside with a straightish bat, it's a sign of a player in really good nick now. Knew the man at deep square was, was ready for the flick and so he's driven it hard with strong hands through straightish mid-wicket. That's four boundaries since lunch, just to Matt Renshaw. And these two are doing it well, like all the, all the really good partnerships there's an ebb and flow to it and when one player is a little bit more becalmed the other one steps up this is good stuff 153 for one suddenly better by Gus Atkinson but again comfortably played both men into the 70s now yes 
Yeah, you've seen you've seen Stokes with his spinners foreground his spinners even on pitches which you wouldn't think would take too much spin. Jack Leach had a very good year or two under Stokes doing a certain role in the side, not necessarily being expected to blow teams away. But nonetheless, using spinners in a creative and imaginative way, and I think we saw an echo of that last week mm. with Dan Lawrence bowling 26 overs, I think it was, on day one. Uh, he's bowled already a few here. Show Bashir will come into the, the, the conversation, to, likely to be tomorrow now, of course. Good to see him picked. Well, we can see from the criticism that came to Somerset last week for not picking Shah Bashir in the side and, and with Jack Leach out injured um, that there's absolutely a role for, for spinners in, in, a, in April. Uh, even without, I mean, last week it was obviously raining, but still. Nonetheless, last week spinners took 42 wickets at 35s and Seamers 110 wickets at 41. Wow. Says the maestro. So that speaks for itself. There's a role to play for the tweakers here. Short effort ball, and nothing doing. Matt Renshaw has been extremely well composed throughout this knock. He's not gone after anything that he hasn't fancied. He's not tried to go air airborne or play anything too extravagant through that onside. Anything short in at the body, he's just ducked or weaved and played inside his box. It's been good stuff by these two. So, yeah, the stats from last week bear that out. Spinners have been a bit more than useful. Good to see, as we say, Bashir into this, this team. Lewis Gregory acknowledged that he could have perhaps done with him last week. Good to hear, I think, from an English perspective that he's back in the mix. Tom Hartley, of course, not playing for Lancashire this week. You can't have them both, Katja, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, it's a tricky situation for Lanks, I suppose. You get the chance to sign Nathan Lyon, albeit for now a truncated campaign. I think seven games rather than the full campaign. Mm. You don't turn that kind of chance down. But you desperately hope that Hartley isn't sidelined as the, the season, the business end of the season comes around. You need your young spinners doing a job for England. Too short by Kemar Roach and easily ducked under by Tom Lamanby, who's not faced too many deliveries since lunch. They're just going to going to roll along these two they're in complete control as it stands but as we've seen many many times with this Surrey side they can get at you at any point they're dangerous when they're slightly up against it and they've shown in the last couple of years a kind of innate ability to winkle teams out on flat tracks beautifully played though sign of how good and true this track is and how prime Tom Lamanby's form is. That's beautifully played on the rise. Again, economy of movement. It's been a feature of his game throughout the day. Yeah, that's the second boundary that's gone down. That's the second four that's gone down to that boundary in the last five minutes or so. Yeah, it's just so hard to contain players when they're in form with such a short boundary out that way. Effort ball, you could hear it. You could hear the, the, the Rochian grunt from here through our microphones. Jamie Overton warming up at first slip. So you, you wonder if perhaps he'll be coming in from that far end. There's been no joy for Kemar Roach so far. He's been taken for five boundary four, four boundary fours, correction, since lunch. First cross bat shot that we've seen really and it sat up and begged and Tom Lamanby steered it. Shows how much time he has to, to get in position. Just talk about Jamie Overton there. He's had an interesting first couple of rounds. Uh, only bowled four overs last week but went for 28 runs. It was quite expensive this morning. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how he comes back from that. Yeah, indeed. He's definitely imminent, is Jamie O. You can see him on the top of your screen there. Oh, another over ticks by 
easy pickings at the moment for the visitors. 35 gone, 61 still to bowl in the day. It's going to be long, hard yakka, you feel, for the home side. Somerset 158 for one. So going back to our point regarding perhaps the misnomer, the myth that maybe needs to be debunked regarding how impossible it's meant to be to bat in the early part of the, of the English season. Average championship runs per wicket per month across the last 10 years. So the maestro, Mr. Sampson, has pulled out the average runs per wicket each month across April, May, June, July, August, September across the last 10 years. We'll come back to that in a moment. Atkinson again. And that's flown off a length. That is his length. That's where he needs to be now. There is a bit in this pitch as ever at the Kier Oval if you bend your back. And he's just suggesting he's coming into some kind of rhythm here. His body language betrays a man who's a little bit down in the dumps, it's probably fair to say. But he's starting to find his range here. Sorry, need one. Good again, good length, good line, decent pace, early 80s, 82, 83, so not express, but I think there's some value in just returning to those kinds of old-fashioned tenets at the minute, adding a bit of pressure to two players who are now looking to push on. This is the first time I've seen Atkinson bowl at the Oval since that magic spell he bowled in the 100 uh, last year. That was rapid. Kind of what it got him put on the fast tracks into the World Cup squad for England last winter. He was really quick that day. Yeah. Yeah, he's clearly a, he's a rhythm bowler. He's, Gus Atkinson. he's got a very uncomplicated approach. It's just looked to me on occasion that struggling a tiny bit with the rhythm in his run-up. bit of pace though and again just mixing things up tidily certainly attack the crease with a bit more conviction in this over so two deliveries to go it's been a good over so far four dots Lambi momentarily becalmed Can he get out of this over with a maiden or even something better? This is good stuff. This is exactly what Rory Burns needs because they've leaked a few since lunch. Kimar Roach has not quite hit his straps from the far end as we look at it, from the pavilion end. It's a key spell here for Gus Atkinson. Excellent over, Maiden. He said he looked down in the dumps. He's never struck me as a, a bowler who gives much away with his body language, to be honest. Yeah, it's a fair point. He's quite lugubrious, isn't he, the way that he goes about his business. He's not particularly showy. He's a cracking lad as well. He's an interesting boy to interview. He's got quite the, quite the story, really. Come back from some heavy-duty injuries, of course. Came back reborn, really, as a, as a quick. Always seems slightly... Slightly bemused by his own progression over the last mm. year to 18 months. There was that interview with him where he said he was still getting used to when people asked him for pictures that he wanted to be in them. That's it, quite yeah. Nice comment. Yeah, you can understand why England like him, though. They had a good long look at him over the winter. He didn't get the nod in the end to any of those five test matches in India, which may have been a blessing in disguise. I know you're all waiting for the championship average runs per wicket. Good by Roach is continuing from the far end, and so Jamie Overton is being held back just for now. So it makes for fascinating reading. This is the last 10 years. The month where it's hardest to bat, according to this, this, this data, is September. The second hardest month to bat is August. How about that? Maybe we should be starting the county championship in March. <laughs> And don't play it in October, which has been a few people's suggestions. Nosedive. Foolish there for the drive, but didn't quite get out to it. 
slightly half-hearted, but again, there's a sign of a player who's comfortable in his own game. He hasn't forced the issue. It's not quite there for him. There's not very much in it. From April, May, June, July, 32 is your average runs per wicket across April, June and July across the last 10 years and 31 and a bit in May. But August and September are the months where you struggle with the bat according to the Championship. Beautifully played really because he's got right in behind that. There wasn't anything wrong with the delivery. Another couple. Easy pickings. I feel like those stats should be made into a graphic that's pinned at the top of the County Championship Twitter page at the start of every season. <laughs> it is intriguing. September, of course, is when the spinners come out to play. And I guess perhaps certain teams are forcing the issue because they're looking to, uh, to get promoted and perhaps manipulating games slightly more. But nonetheless, those stats are very telling. And again, not quite there for the drive. And so he just holds back from throwing his hands fully at it. And the man is quite close in at extra cover. It's Dominic Sibley there for the catch rather than the block. So the point is that it's hard to bat at all times. But the idea that it's really hard to bat in April is not borne out by the stats, certainly not the last 10 years. Hard to bat at all times, hard as a bowl. Yes, says a bowler. <laughs> and another single. The score ticks over to 1-6-1 one, one for 1. I'm not sure too many people had this on their bingo card this morning. When Rory Burns inserted the opposition, there wasn't too much cloud cover, admittedly, but Somerset have done this brilliantly up until now. And again, another dot to finish. Bit of cat and mouse now at play between these two well-ensconced left-handers and Surrey seamers. Roach and Atkinson opting for a more containing approach here. Just pulling their lengths back a wee bit. And it will be Atkinson again. It's a good move by Burns to keep him on. It was an excellent over just gone. Only the fourth maiden of the day, by the way. Kimar Roach bowled a couple up top. Jordan Clark as well. That's the first maiden since the first half an hour of play. It's definitely running in better here. It's Gus Atkinson. A bit more comfortable in his approach. Seen a lot of runs come through that side this afternoon, short side of the boundary. Yeah, it must be a nightmare to be a skipper. I mean, it runs away here at the Oval anyway, as we well know, but an early season pitch is, tends to be towards that side of the ground. Again, further evidence that he's just pulling his length back and trying to contain these two. Nicely played, angling across Tom Lamanby. He just let it run off the face. It's been a feature of his innings so far. We did say just before lunch, cricketers born in non-traditional countries. We had John Traikos born in Egypt, 22 years between his debut and his second second match, second test match, and it got us thinking. So do write in cricketers from weird and wonderful and exotic places from around the world. We're talking Ted Dexter from Milan and stuff like that. So whatever you've got. Short this time. Well played again by Matt Renshaw. It's an easy pace track at this point. And just before I move on to the currently quite elusive Daniel Norcross, but he may or may not, not emerge. You never know with him. Just a quick run through the scores post-lunch as well because there's some interesting games taking place for you here.
So, with just a single delivery to go of the 38th over, a quick run through. Essex going well, actually. 1-5-9 for two, having lost two quick ones early on. Uh, Jordan Cox, who played nicely last week for his 80-odd, and again, same with Elgar, who also made a good 80. They're both away and running again, putting a good partnership together. Hampshire, three down for 110 against Lancashire. And James Vince has just gone. Gorgeously played. It doesn't. It does beat the man in the end. Ollie Pope be a bit cranky with himself because he got there, tried to pull it back, and I think it just ricocheted off his leg. In complete control of that pull shot, Tom Lamanby deliberately playing it in front of square, keeping it down. And that, as the crowd acknowledge, is the 150 partnership. Sean Dixon went early on with a score on 18, and these two from just 207 balls have pushed it on now to 168 for one. Diving stopped that boundary, slightly reminiscent of how Ollie Pope did his shoulder last year, so you might want to be careful. You know, I thought the same. Yeah. He's okay though, folks. Don't panic. So yeah, just briefly then, Hampshire, three down for 111. Vince has just gone. Uh, Lyon picks up the wicket caught by Tom Bruce, the other overseas New Zealander for Lancashire and so three down now. Nick Gubbins is ensconced there on 26. So Essex 159 for two, Hampshire 110 for three against Lanks. And Knott's also just two down for 132. Both openers went early on. Bit uppish this time and that's why the man Dominic Sibley is there on the drive. But as we've seen now three times in the last couple of overs, Renshaw just holding back a little bit. You think he understands what the plan is here. And he's not going to play ball just yet. So Knott's 133 for two. Hamid and Duckett went early on. Uh, Slater and Clark both registering 50s. Shot for none. You just sense with Renshaw here, don't you, that he's slightly battling with himself. He's been basically irresistible since since lunch. Only that one edge past leg stump. Aside from that, everything has worked for him. And sorry, I'm just playing on his ego a little bit here. He's almost caught Lamanby up. 75 to Renshaw, 83 to Lamanby now. Slower ball, but misdirected and an easy single into the onside. So the only other game in the top division is Warwickshire Durham. And Durham, who won the toss this morning, catcher, said to the home team, go and have first dibs. 191 for no loss, you know, Warwickshire. 106 not out to Alex Davis, who's, who started well. Excellent knock by the new skipper. And the predecessor, as, no, in fact, incorrect, of course, it's Rose who is the predecessor captain, but Yates as well, good young, good young player, 78 not out. Wicketless morning aside, I've got high hopes for Durham this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they are the unknown quantity, right? Mm. Hard to sum up, really. They've certainly got the players. Maybe it's a flat one. <laughs> Well, they were very watchable last year in Division 2, scoring quickly, lots of runs. Ryan Campbell up there, second season, creating a really good environment. Yeah, they, they were right on the coattails of the, the McCullum Stokesian philosophy, weren't they? Through the gap as well. Now, pretty open. Anything behind square on the offside, there's a cover, coverage at deep third, but. It's easy pickings at this juncture for the lefties. 84 to Lamanby, who will, who will remain at the non-strikers from that single from the final delivery. 77 to Matt Renshaw. 171 for one. Just before I go, Yorkshire five down. We didn't mention this just before lunch. Yorkshire five down. And the big two, Mr. Joe Root and Harry Brook, managed 28 runs between them. Catcher. Mm. Brooke got two, Brooke about 23 was it? Yeah, 26, 26. he got, did Harry Brooke before, cleaned up, 
And so Gloucestershire, who had a stinker last year, going really well there, 140 for five, Yorkshire. I'm going to jump out. Daniel Norcross is with us, folks. Daniel Norcross is with us. Hold on. Well, it's been a bit of a rum old do for Surrey out there today, hasn't it, so far, Katia? I dare say you would have discussed the wisdom or otherwise of bowling first. But yeah, seems like a slightly odd decision now, doesn't it? Well, you know, it always... You've got to be careful, haven't you, about making judgments on things because of what has happened rather than what was going through their minds. And I think, you know, you can imagine there was a little bit of, felt like there was moisture in the air, the pitch had a green tinge to it. And there was a fair bit of movement early on, but since then, it's got a little bit easier. We've had a bit of up and down bounce today. Just to, I say a little bit. I mean, Jordan Clark had one that went through really low and then few that have flown through but of all the bowlers on display he was the one that seemed to get the most the most speed the most consistent speed mm. Andy Sampson just pointed out this is Somerset's highest second wicket partnership not quite he says oh we'll come back to that in a moment oh that has flown a hostile delivery that from Overton. Yes, Somerset's highest second wicket partnership in the championship at the Oval. It's a rather skinny 157 between Roy Virgin and whose work I am familiar with. <laughs> but Steve Wilkinson, I am not. And this was way back in 1972. 40, 50, 42? I wish. 52 years ago. And Andrew Sampson has provided me with the, the data that I was so after. Have you discussed this already? The average runs per wicket in each month over the last 10 years. Yeah, we have discussed this. It's interesting though, isn't it? Well, it is. But I, d d I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking credit for this one, because I do. <laughs> what, for the entire averages in the county yeah. average of each month? Well, because everybody goes on about, oh, you can't play cricket in April, or oh, the ball moves around all over the place, it's not proper cricket. It's not true, is it? And I think there are good reasons. The ground staff at all grounds across the country do fantastic, marvellous work, but they're building up for the start of the season. And these pitches, it's not just the matches that are played on them. There's no footfall on the square, certainly where we're playing here, and to the wickets seven or eight to either side. So practice pitches are way over towards the cricketer's pub side, the gas holder side. So it's pristine. Mm. They're as good as they're going to get, these pitches. And for those of you just joining, wondering what we're talking about, the average runs per wicket in each month in the last 10 years, it's the over ends, 171 for one. April is the second highest at 32.5 runs per wicket. So you'd be imagining 325 all out. Mm. Only 0.23 of a run behind June mm. and June you think of don't you is like cash in oh lovely yeah cash in sun on your back you know visibility's great pictures are nice and hard and true but obviously it's true mm. June is good but April is the next best time to bat well look at it yeah well, it looks great doesn't it mm. <laughs> I mean these are perfect batting conditions there's not really much of a blemish on the pitch we've not seen much in the way of turn despite Dan Lawrence having a good hefty spell. He's bowled seven overs today. Mm. But we're going to get, I think, Jordan Clark coming back into the attack. And he, for me, did a bit of a revelation on the Surrey live stream. We now have a speed gun. Makes me feel quiet. High tech. Yeah. Do you know, I'm feeling kind of, I'm channeling my inner NASA. <laughs> and Athers. We've got a speed gun. And he's hit 87 a few times today. Jordan Clark. The ball's gone through robustly, let us say, to Ben folks. But tell me how impressed you've been by Tom Lamonby because I saw him a little bit in the Bob Willis trophy year. He had quite a good year then, I think. Yeah, I think he did. Average 51, says mm. Andrew. 
and I was getting very excited about him. Um, and it's not as if he went off the radar, but perhaps a little bit, sort of slightly lower return since. But having watched him look a bit scratchy for his first 18 balls today, well, since then, he scored 84 off his next 90, which mm. is not shabby, is it? I said earlier he scored a century in the penultimate round of the season last year. Followed that up with 90 last weekend, both against Kent, so they're probably sick of the sight of him at this point. <laughs> uh, and here he is now, 85 not out, so he's having a, a good run. Well, yes, he is. He could have chosen, I mean, I'm allowed to be slightly one-eyed on the Surrey live stream. He could have chosen another time to come back into form. Steve Wilkinson played for Somerset for four seasons between 1971 and 1974. He played just the 18 first-class matches, 452 runs. And his best, I'm imagining this was in the partnership, was, of course, against Surrey, 69 at the Oval in 1972. Averaged only 20.54. Not as great as though... Have you heard of a player called Jim Fote? I have not. But oh, please enlighten me. This, Katya, you're going to love Jim Fote. I sense I might have just set you off on an article. <laughs> just gets a bit of the inside half of the bat there as it squirts away. Coming back for a second, this could be tight. Oh, now then. Umpire says no, the throw wasn't quite close enough to the stumps. If it had been, I think Renshaw would have been in big trouble there. That was. A very tight second run. Initial dither. Throw came in. Ben Folks has demolished those stumps. We'll take a look here at the replay. So it all squirted off into the onside. There's a little bit of a pause there. Throw comes in. Oh, it's very close, isn't it? Mm. You fancy if that had been over the top of the stumps, then there would have been trouble there for Renshaw instead. He gets away with it at the moment. That looks like Surrey's best chance of getting a wicket in mm. these beautiful conditions for batting. Oh, he hasn't got a hold of that, but mid-off is a l not wide, but he'd have to have been about two yards further to his left, Rory Burns, if he was going to snap all that. Uh, Jim Fote, I'm going to give you Jim Fote before I let you go, because you're going to love him. Um, Andrew Sampson's probably got his numbers up. I, I'm going to have a guess. His first class batting average of 18? 18.6. Played as a specialist batter. Wow. He played a very important role in a one day cup final. He made a couple of brilliant run outs. He's renowned for his fielding, he's been the covers. But he played an astonishing number of first class games for an average of 18. 91 first class matches as a specialist batter. At an average of 18.6. That's a great way to make a living. Superb. Mm. I believe he lives in Cornwall now. And we've got the new partnership record for the second wicket for Somerset against Surrey at the Oval. It wasn't part of my script today, I've got to say. But Katia, um, I've set you off on a bit of a on a bit of a chase there, but I think you will enjoy discovering about Jim Fote. Yeah, I'm going to spend the next hour researching everything I possibly can about him. I can actually believe that you would as well. Oh no, I will. <laughs> Thank you, Katia. Katia will be joining us on and off throughout the summer on the Surrey live stream. You can take award-winning Katia, we should say, since she won the Cricket Writers Club Young Journalist Award, I think. So you can check out her writings on Wisdom Cricket Monthly. It's another single out into the deep, but I am delighted to say that for the next 10 or 15 minutes or so, we are joined by... Matt Whittacase, no relation of Phil, I have been assured, but spelt exactly the same way. Spelt exactly the same way. Actually, from sort of the same parts of the country, he was a Leicestershire wicketkeeper, wasn't he? So I learned all my cricket in uh, the East Midlands, around the Stamford area. Uh, but no relation that we know of, sorry. Well, I mean, you will be related. I d I d I'm going to give you an incredible stat in a minute. I had the very great pleasure as that ball's tucked away down to deep square. Another single, runs coming easily as they have done for quite a while now, notwithstanding that little alarm in the last over. Um, I was chatting to 
celebrated geneticist Adam Rutherford. Are you familiar with his work? It's on Radio 4 a lot. I should be, but I'm not. Adam Rutherford, no. So, he's a, he's a fearfully clever man. That's probably why I'm not aware <laughs> of him. Well, are you aware of the fact that, that Danny Dyer is directly related to Edward III? Did you, did you come up to us? There's this program called Who Do You Think You Are? And Cockney actor, EastEnders, aficionado, etc., Danny Dyer, national treasure, discovered in Who Do You Think You Are that he is something like 20 generations directly linked to Edward III. Hmm. Now, that could be an unfortunate claim. My history's a little shaky, but one of the Edwards did have an unfortunate end. There's a few who did, yeah. But the key thing about it is that according to Adam, this isn't such a strange thing at all. And that if you go back, and it's just a simple matter of maths, which Andrew Sampson will, will help me out with here, but approximately 1,000 years ago, on your family tree, because everybody's got two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, 16 great-greats. I think it's one trillion and 66 billion direct descendants. <laughs> <laughs> Only takes you back a thousand years. How many? Did you say billion? B uh, yes, it's one trillion, 66 billion. And you're now thinking to yourself, how is that remotely possible? Because then, a thousand years ago, there were fewer than a billion people on the planet. And the reason is that people appear on your family tree many, many times. So you can have a 30 generation back grandfather or grandmother, but will appear from a whole load of different parts of your tree. Mm. And from this, Adam deduced that because Christopher Lee is directly related to Charlemagne <laughs> so is everybody in Europe so you my friend are the direct descendant of Charlemagne does that mean I can claim I united or had some part in uniting the Holy Roman Empire you can do it you can do that you can wear armour you can jump on a horse you can brandish a shield you can do it all I need to come to the Oval War often and talk to you, Dad. Matt, <laughs> this is fantastic. This isn't what we were here to talk about, no. but I just thought I'd give you a fillet before we start, because I like to make people feel comfortable. Oh, venerable <laughs> descendant to Charlemagne. <laughs> 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 um, it's all about maths, basically, and, and Andrew can confirm. So, um, explain to us why you're here on the live stream today. Well, uh, a couple of years ago, Surrey Cricket Club got in touch with Carers Trust, the charity that I work for. Um, and it's wonderful. Um, it's wonderful accessibility officer Teresa Peters had spoken to an unpaid family carer, someone who was spending all their time at home, looking after a relative with very complex uh, needs and disability. And it just meant that that person wasn't getting out of home at all. Was very isolated, and for some reason had been able to get away for a day and was here and just disclosed her story to Teresa. And Teresa was so struck. Um, now this might make it all the way to the boundary. It's being pursued. And actually, that's a neat bit of work out there. Just keeps the scoring to three. But again, just straying a little bit onto the pads there, Clark, so easy pickings down through deep backward square. She was so struck by this care that she thought Surrey can be doing something here. We can be getting people uh, to give them a day away from the pressures of their caring situation. It could be a young carer like we have in here today, someone who might not be a, more than 13, but he spends a lot of time looking after a brother or a sister with quite a, uh, quite a severe mental health problem or disability. And they just need a break from that pressure. And what better way to uh, to get away from it all than to come to the Oval, have a day out, meet the players as they just did down there on the boundaries rope um, by the pavilion, get some bats signed. Um, it's, it, it's a real break for carers and they need that. The other thing about um, being a carer is because you're at home a lot, um, caring for someone, you, you 
you tend to forget. Oh, now that's an imploring appeal, but a fancy just drifting down the leg side on the angle there from Clark. I'll just take another look at this on our replay. It's from behind. Yeah, I think you can see that there's a little movement of the pitch going down the leg side. Folks had really strayed from his position around about leg stump. It's quite a giveaway. Yeah, good decision that from the umpire. Sorry about that. Unfortunately, the cricket got in the way there. That's, That's all right. Moment. That's been carved away. Pigeons scatter. There is a man down at deep backward point. That must be the single. So this must be extraordinarily um, isolating, I guess, for somebody. Because you, you mentioned that they could be indoors for so long. It affects socialising. It affects... Well, it affects all sorts of things. It affects health as well, I would imagine, mental and physical. Yeah, we, we know of carers who has, uh, uh, recently have had to spend an extra 50... Well, they're going to come back for two here, but this time they're going to make it a bit more comfortable than they did a couple of overs ago. 186 for one, 43 gone. Both batters now zeroing in on their three figures. So they could be spending... 50 hours, 70 hours, 80 hours caring at home, as you say very isolating and a lot of carers will talk about the fact that they don't feel valued for what they do what they're doing is voluntary, a lot of them have had to give up work uh, because local services have shut down so it is very isolating, a lot of them feel very forgotten, so what we love about what Surrey are doing here is they're saying we value what you do we, and you know we're remembering you and they're opening their gates to young carers and adult carers, free of charge, to come down here for a day at the cricket. So, are you able to put a, a figure? Because presumably a lot of people are carers, but in, in quite an unofficial capacity. We're talking about people so young, they're not necessarily getting carer's allowance. Mm. Um, do we know the, the sheer volume of young carers there are out there? Uh, that's a really good question. The answer is no, we don't exactly. Um, it's very hard uh, because a lot of young carers uh, will just think they're doing the right thing. They won't declare themselves as a young carer or their family won't. Um, oh, that was not far from mid-wicket, but it's got more than enough on it. And nice noise off the bat. And with that, Lamanby moves into the 90s. And it's to 93. So uh, the best estimate we have is there are about a one million young carers in the UK. One million? I mean, that is a sizable number. We're defining a young carer from basically anyone under 18, would that be? Yeah, right? anyone 17 or younger. They can be as young as five. And what we're talking about here is not just doing up shoelaces occasionally. And... Um, uh, oh, swing and a miss. A rare miss today, certainly rare misses afternoon. We're not talking about people who just do a bit of washing up here and there. They could be doing really complex things. I've met young carers as young as 11 who go out, do the family shop, manage the household budget, open up a spreadsheet. I've seen it happen. Um, or they could be doing really physically demanding things like helping move their parents um, in the night because they can't move themselves so they can get to to the bathroom so it's it's very demanding physically and emotionally so what can people do to to help out these well phalanx a million people you're talking about here what can be done to help well um, at the government level we need much more support um, in schools and other areas for young carers so we need to be much better at identifying young carers at the earliest possible stage if that happens they will get the support that they need. Does that happen in conjunction with the schools, presumably? Yeah, exactly. What we're asking for is to have a young carer lead in every school, someone that young carers can go to, have a conversation and, and say, look, this is what I'm doing. Slightly uppish, but in the end, straight to Rory Burns. Um, and then that young carer lead can make sure that teachers know that um, there's a lot going on at home, 
um, there will be very good reasons why a young carer may not be able to get their homework in exactly on time because they've got a lot of other things to do when they get home um, and also give them and help them manage what can seem a very overwhelming workload. I mean if you're doing all this caring at home and trying to revise for exams it can seem overwhelming. Mm -hmm. A teacher and a young carer lead can really help that young carer think okay what are the priorities, how do I manage everything so I've, I've got my young caring role and, and, my, um, and, I, and I'm still managing to get my exam results. I've met some wonderful uh, young carers who've really thrived at school but it, it can be very tough and they need that support. Again, in the air for a little while, but just a single. Lamb will be edging ever closer up to 94. 191 for one, 44 overs gone. Um, before we let you go, tell us a little bit about the organisation that you work for and how people can get involved. I work for Carers Trust with a national charity supporting unpaid carers. Uh, people can find out more about us, just go to carers.org. The really essential thing is that if you need support yourself or you know someone who needs support, go to our website, type in your postcode in the search engine and you will find support in your area, whether you're in the Shetlands or in Cornwall. How did it, just before you toddle, what was it that got you into this? Was this was this a personal experience or just what you'd seen happening around you in your local community? Well, I've worked in the charity sector a long time for various charities, um, child protection charities, international development charities, um, and quite recently my mother had a really bad health scare. She can't really live unsupported anymore, so I've become her carer. So that's how I really found out about who carers are, what they do, and the immense contribution they make to support people in the community particularly now a lot of services have been shut down um, because there's just no budget in local authorities um, and it's a huge number of people out there they really need support they feel forgotten and abandoned so that's what we're trying to do oh <laughs> well that is a strapple again but again it's not really time it wasn't a million miles away from Jordan Clark but he'll pick up four for it will Lamanby and now very close to another first class hundred. Matt, thanks ever so much for joining us. It's been very illuminating. Thank you. And also alarming. One million. One million young carers. Under eighteen. And I an think of another six million carers, um, adult carers, so it's it's a big issue. It certainly is. Matt, thank you so much. That was Matt Whittycase. And uh, many of those young carers are here at the Oval today. Now, Lamanby, has he got that away? No, he's just going to get the single for it down to long leg. But he moves to 99. Adam Collins, Tom Lamanby. This is what you want to do against the Kookaburra. Get them bowling repeat spells. Try and give Surrey a day in the dirt. Somerset giving themselves every opportunity of that. The story is really told in the run rate. Going at 4.2 and over. The economy rate of the bowlers. Roach at best at 3.7 and over, the rest in the fours or the fives, which is so unusual for Surrey when bowling on day one here at the Oval. What's been your take? Has this been a particularly docile wicket? I'm not sure that it has. We've seen a few fly. We've seen a couple keep a little low. It's not. Yeah. There's no gremlins in the pitch. No, no, no gremlins, but it's what you'd expect on day one. At a test playing venue, you, you wouldn't rock up here expecting the ball to do loads. And nor did it last year, I, I hasten to add. No. When, when Surrey were bowling first and bowling well, it was just the relentlessness of the attack. And um, it, it does feel like Worrell not being there is significant. Yes, especially if you're going to bowl first. Because it's his extravagant movement, isn't yeah. it, with that Duke's ball early on. Yep. I mean, it's, it's not to have a go at Jordan Clark and no. Kimo Mo, Roach, both of whom did get some movement. They were pretty well played. Um, they've got a little bit of fortune, perhaps, as Somerset openers, but that's what you'd expect. That's what you need, isn't it, yep. in England, with a jigs ball. Fair few runs were scored behind square on the offside, but uh, aside from that one extraordinary catch from Dom Sibley off Overton, I would say the next biggest alarm was probably the near run-out mm. about four overs ago. Yeah, the kindest thing you can say about how Somerset have gone about it. It's felt fairly gentle out there. Mm -hmm. There has, yeah. Nice quick outfield. Yep. Lovely warm spring day. 
Hottest day of the year, perhaps. Perhaps. Let's check that. I feel like Andrew Sampson, who's next to us, might be able to find that for us. It's not a cricket stat, but it's a fact all the same. He's nodding. The one plus, as we finish the 45th over, is that Surrey's overrate is adequate. You would say. It says naught on the board, which is OK. We're still not quite halfway through the number of overs. Did you see the declaration last week? I'm going to struggle to remember which game it was, but it was a declaration made. It was uh, it was Durham. Yorkshire. Uh, sorry, Yorkshire, yes. Yorkshire I declared. I remain baffled. In order to you, retrieve a bit of the damage they'd done to their over eight when fielding the first that time. Was the reason? So they, uh, that's... Uh, Kevin I, I, Howes and I were trying to work it out because what they were, we couldn't make any sense of it because Harry Brook was batting and going yeah. like a train. So, so there was another batting point in the offing. There was well, there were two potentially because there right. were two sixty, weren't there? That's so right. Yeah. There was a three hundred and a three fifty to get. So they opened the bowling. So they were with live and with I another see. spinner, and they rushed through seven and a half overs before shaking hands. They must have done that oh. in you know twenty five minutes or thereabouts to help with the over rate. Well, much as Middlesex desperately wanted to do, this is tight. Oh, now then, hang on, it's got him. Well, I said. I said that looked like the best way Surrey could get a wicket was a run out and they've got it with Lamanby going for his 100th run. Eager to get to his 100, he's pushed the ball up to mid on. Shy at the stumps, missed at the non-striker's end. But the throw was so straight, it's kept going and it's hit the stumps at the striker's end. And that, we'll see the back of Matt Renshaw. Lamanby's still there on 99, but a bit of drama here. Take a look at this again. He's hesitated, which is his problem, and then he's gone for the run. Throw from Jordan Clark. Gets the stumps at the striker's end, not the non-striker's end. Do you think he was aiming? I was going to say, I think the replay gives the impression that Clark, just in that last moment, realised there was a better chance further away, and yet pings them down. Great bit of fielding. How often do you see it? A run out close to a personal milestone. I mean, it did feel like the single was there. Maybe the briefest touch of hesitation after Lamanby played the stroke which might have informed the way that Renshaw took off when backing up we'll see it here so Lamanby just pauses momentarily Renshaw was ball watching Renshaw was ball watching and that's why he's walking off it was a fine innings from the Somerset opener but direct hit run out for 87 it's taken something unusual massive yeah. stand broken after putting on the better part of 200 what are they came together at the score at 18 it's a record second wicket partnership for Somerset at the Oval is what it is it's a partnership of 178 broken by a run out how about the body language of Lamaby? he couldn't believe it oh well he was about to celebrate his century he'd reached his ground he was about to wheel away in celebration turned around heard the roar uh oh well you've got to say I think if Renshaw had been alive to the call rather than looking he might have made it in. He might have done, but oh, the, yeah. but they sort of ran on the misfield. Lamanby didn't go immediately. There was, and it wasn't really a misfield. It was, a, he was waiting to see really whether Clark was going to take the ball, and he slightly parried it away from him. I feel like there was two bits to it. There, there was the, there was the stop and prop from Lamanby, yep. not unreasonably, the sort of wait, and then on the back of that, Renshaw's turned around, so he wasn't facing the stumps that he'd ultimately be running towards. And by the time they were going. Clark had that second opportunity. So Surrey have their breakthrough. Brings Lewis Goldworthy to the crease. And Lamanby still doesn't have his 100. He's still there on 99. <laughs> Goodness me. And is Jordan Clark involved again? He's involved in the only wicket to fall to a bowler earlier. And it was his bullet throw that did for the diving Renshaw. Well, can they turn this middle session? Can they go two in a hurry here? Breaking the big stand. Oh, that's hostile, the new batter. He's not the tallest of men, Lewis Goldsworthy. And you fancy that Overton will like to greet the new batter with a few short ones. Funny career so far, Goldsworthy. Played 10 games in each of 2021 and, and 2022 for one century and only four scores above 50. Only got the two games last year, including a ton, and now batting number four, given the chance early season, with players away, Tom Abel, the most obvious, and, and Colic had more, but, but Abel, certainly. And uh, 
Yes, the chance early in the season to put on a bit of selection pressure. Last week, against Kent, made 35, batting mostly with Lemon, but you're still there now. What did you make of that? Surrey broadcast at gmail.com, all your correspondence throughout the course of the season. It's a funny old run out, wasn't it? Because when you were watching, we were, we're sitting sort of directly behind where that throw was. And it's rare that you see a throw that looks like it's going to one end, but it's actually going to the <laughs> other. I mean, your instinct from where we are, we're on the angle here yeah, at, at Long on it, 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 for all, it yeah. looks like he was trying to run out Lamaby, which, which stands to reason given the proximity to the but stumps. But I think the presence right. of mind from, from Clark, been around a long time now. I think you're right. I think he, I think he saw there was a, a greater opportunity at the far end, especially with that bullet throw. Well... Lamanby gets his chance at the next over. He's on 99. I'm going to hand you over to Phil Walker, who's come to replace me. You'll stay. Stick I around, am. Aren't you? I'll stick Go around. Out. You stick around. 196 for two. 46 overs gone. So I mentioned Goldsworthy. He made 122 against Kent down at Taunton last year upon his return to the, the four-day team. And batted four last week. Kind of the split up the, the aggressive low and middle order that, that Somerset have a more conventional red ball player in that sense didn't get much cricket last year also picked up his maiden first class wicket last week Goldsworthy so we'll see him in operation with the ball later in the match probably a little bit unlucky not to get more game time to this point for Somerset but a great opportunity on a fine day here at the, the Keir Oval so welcome Phil Walker back g'day Phil yeah afternoon Adam they needed that my word did they just a little tiny little window now middle of the afternoon ninety nine not from one hundred and twenty five it's been a sparkling knock up to now he's got to put that out of his mind though mentioned before how often do you see it a run yeah. out or, or, or a near run out when a player's on ninety nine I remember at this ground back in two thousand and one Steve Ward diving to make his ground and and, and raising his bat when lying on the floor with dirt all over his stomach. Maybe let us know. When's a player been run out on 99? Surrey broadcast at gmail.com or a run out on 99. What are your memories of that? He's in behind it quietly again. Well, of course, the mind goes to Michael Atherton straight away. Mm. Doesn't it? 93. Mm. Lords. Big move. England, Australia. 97 not. Alan Border slips one into his pads. He knocks it out for two. Gatting turns and says no. And Atherton slips on his sand shoes and falls over. I remember watching that and a little part of me died. I learned a lot more about the game in that moment and my awful relationship with it. <laughs> 13 years young. Never forget it. Fallen wide-ish. Just mm. trying to jab down on it. It's gone underneath the bat, I think. He's just got to keep his composure here, as Tom Lavenby. He's been utterly serene. And I guess... Renshaw, when he calms down, he may say, yeah, I was perhaps on my back foot, I was perhaps ball-watching a little bit, she could have gone on the call. But then, over a drink or something tonight, he might also say to, like, to Tom, we didn't need to do it. Mm. We didn't need to think outside of our box. Just it, when I said to Daniel moments before that, that they'd taken any sting out of the game in the middle session, kind of going to your point, really, they were doing things on their terms, mm. which didn't require the... Uh, the adventurous run. Well, you can you can you can read it both ways. If they take off on the call, then then Renshaw's through and it's a moot point. And we probably say good assertive running, <laughs> but the stumps get pinged down and well, different conversation. Yeah, indeed. And oh. again, it's rattled him. He doesn't need to think about this. He just needs to play his game. That was an airy fairy shot, leaden footed, all hands. And he just has to keep his call here. Quicker as well. We saw Clark operating in the mid-70s in the previous over. That was 82 mile an hour. So bending his back, trying to get second in a hurry after executing the direct hit run out. Pulled some quick balls in the morning session, mm. did Jordan Clark. Pushed 60, 86, 87. 87, yep. Better by Tom Lamanby. Got to get back 
with a little bit more self-containment here you feel 196 for 2 47 gone only halfway through the day it's been hard yak of a surrey up until now fascinatingly poised now though lewis goldsworthy new to the crease not the only 99 in that 93 ashes test by the way phil i'm well aware mate my, my <laughs> man mark war yeah who if he hadn't played all round Phil Tufnell bowling into the, the rough stuff, left arm over, having given up long earlier in the piece, Australia would have had four mm. Centurions in the first four. Yep. As it was, War ever the poet, thought that's far too ugly, I'm just going to play round one. And then Border came in and smashed a runnable 70. I think it was like 650 for four declared, something like that. Those were the days, folks. They battled into day three. Just day to, three. Just to punch the bruise a little bit. Solidly in behind it, Lewis Goldsworthy. Yeah. It's a good question. Run outs on 99. This doesn't apply to the, that particular question, but seeing, seeing Tom Lamanby halfway to the boundary with his head in his hands, his bat down by his, by his thigh pad, thinking about what he's gone and done. It did remind me of Boycott in 77 mm. when he ran out Derek Randall at his home ground at Trent Bridge. Boycott returning to the side, ran him out and wanted the ground to swallow him up. He's off the mark, Lewis Goldsworthy, tidily tucked behind square and on the leg side, calls Boycott batted all day, made 100. So it couldn't, it couldn't have bothered him that much. What was the Arlet commentary? Tragedy. <laughs> yeah. Tragedy. Yeah, that's all you need sometimes. <laughs> Lewis Goldsworthy, uh, Adam, uh, his pal in this side, Casey Aldridge, mm. uh, in his Cricketers Who's Who entry for the mm. year. So you had that out earlier. Yeah. Flying off the shelves, by the way. <laughs> genuinely. <laughs> genuinely. A, a prominent bookseller uh, has reordered it three or four times over already, apparently. la da How about that? Go, you good County thing. cricket. Anyway, Casey Aldridge, in answer to the question... Who is likely to be the next standout breakout star in County Cricket? Yeah. He said Lewis Goldsworthy will play for England one day. Really? Yep. Now, it might be that he's looking favourably on a pal, but he's not the first person to have, to have indicated that. Tom Abel spoke very warmly about him last year. He has a decent record, actually, without it being a notable one, but he's got the gig here, as you say, I said earlier. Tom Abel injured at the moment, so you'd think he might be the one to, to duck out of that top order, but... He's very highly rated. Easily tucked into the onside. And there it is. What a knock by Tom Lamanby. He's been utterly unflustered. He took his time to get go going. 17 balls to make his first run. But since then, he's purred along. The shots down the ground in particular have been a fabulous feature of this innings and he's played the ball late under his eyes as well. There's been an economy of movement and a crispness of shot that really does mark out a player who is really coming into his own now. He made a good 90 last week, he made 100 at the back end of last year and after two tough years, he's beginning really to emerge as one of county cricket's best young players. Classy knock, one to remember. Yeah, the, the travails of Lamanby. I mean, those 300s in the space of six innings back in 2020 had... We were all had, excited, Had the we? tongues wagging. I watched mm. that 100 at Lords, and, mm. and it, it was faultless against Essex, and I think that's better still. I think walking out here this morning, uh, early wicket lost, the formidable Surrey bowling lineup, and yes, taking a while to get going, but the way he plays the ball through the line, nice and tall, square of the wicket as well, you can see why judges who have watched a lot of cricket think this guy might have a serious career ahead of him yeah and credit to Somerset as well because it would have been easy to have got jittery when he was struggling for form in 2021 2022 both of those were pretty fallow years and it could have been would have been natural mm. perhaps to look elsewhere it's a constant conveyor belt of quality of course down down in the West Country, but they've they recognised that there's something quite special about this kid. He was a real star of of Devonian cricket coming through as well. Made his debut early for Somerset, uh, and they've stuck at it with him. And they've they've identified that class will always out in the end. And, and you're starting to see that now. I think you mentioned this morning as well. Useful left arm spinner and an outstanding outfielder. 
yeah. left arm seamer rather, an outstanding outfielder, truly a stunning boundary rider. And I like his own technique, by the way, which we can come to in a moment. Oh, that's got to be close. He's got it yet. Got to go. Jordan Clark knew. He just carried on through, and after. Making an even hundred, Tom Lammerby has played all around a straight one round the wicket. Jordan Clark's been the most persuasive seamer out there today, and he picks up his second wicket. Three down now, Somerset. And after that monster partnership, both men now gone. Renshaw and Lammerby back in the hutch. Three down for 198. Sorry, back in it. Two wickets in the space of three runs. Clark involved in both of them. The direct hit run out to get rid of Renshaw. Half an opportunity in here, as he's done so well since joining the club back in 2018. Full and straight and asking all the right questions. And Lamanby playing all around it. Easy decision for umpire Kettlebrook. The fine innings comes to an end. One he'll remember here at the Keir Oval. But now work to do for Somerset. 198 for three. Yeah, Tom Banton, new, new bat. Joining Lewis Goldsworthy, he's just got a single to his name. So hinge point of the day coming up, really. Tom Lamanby has crisply hit that shot throughout the day. Not look like missing anything. There's not been an inside edge. There's not been a stifled appeal. Almost inexplicably, he's missed that one. It was full. It perhaps came on with the arm slightly from on the angle. He's played all around it. And there was that sense, even though he did get to his 100, it was a bit jittery, a bit stuttery getting to that point and perhaps the run out, which happened just two overs before he made his 100, may have just contributed to that anyway he goes for an even hundred classy knock but now the rebuild begins it's just that rhythm thing isn't it it is that they were they were so finely tuned for and there's a couple of hours either side of lunch but yes the, the breaking concentration perhaps when crawling to 100 the run out which was a something that typified that that slight change in mindset and yes after reaching 100 a couple of balls later he departs and, and Tom Banton so we meant, mentioned Goldsworthy getting an opportunity here after not getting many in recent seasons Banton only played twice in the four-day team last year first ball here tightly in behind it and he's off the mark straight away behind square on the offside yeah Tom Banton fascinating career so far to think about the way he burst onto the scene in well 20 over cricket initially early England honours but it said all along, in fairness to the man, that he, that he wants to be a red mm. ball cricketer, that he, he, for all the white ball skill in the world, he, he wants to try and, at one stage, at, at some stage rather, um, have the kind of career that could see him play across the formats. And good on him for saying that. We've already seen down at Somerset, Will Smead go in a, in a different direction. But Banton wants this to be part of his life. Gets the chance here. It's Goldsworthy in behind that. Yeah, you feel this is a key moment in Somerset's innings. It's a marvellous platform. But as we've seen regularly enough the last two years, Surrey are dangerous when their backs are against the wall. 199 for three now. That could easily be 220 for five if Somerset aren't careful. So, minor rebuild job coming up for the visitors. Good pace again by Jordan Clark. Slightly inconvenienced on the, the forward block there by Goldsworthy. He's been the most insistent seamer out there today, I would say, Adam. Jordan Clark. Yep. Picked up the only two wickets to fall to a bowler. Of course, the second wicket was that run out, affected by him. So he's got all three in the bag by hook or by crook. Again, decent pace and carry. I'm quite looking forward to watching Banton against the Kookaburra as well. Once he gets in, assuming he gets in, but this is a, a good time of an innings to, to get busy against the ball. It won't be quite as hard or, or, or quite as pronounced with the seam as, as the Dukes. Yeah, indeed. And then James Rue to come yep. at six. And then Lewis Gregory probably carded at seven. So it's a very, very watchable mm, side. Mm. Good balance to it. Over centre eight as well. That was pretty straight. Jordan Clark throws that mop of hair back because he thought that may just have squeezed through, but successful over. So Tom Lamanby goes for an even hundred. He played quite beautifully across the morning. 
as we said though just lost a little bit of rhythm a little bit of composure in the build up to that hundred with the run out and so goes for an even hundred got a little gem here from Andrew Sampson here about 99s and run outs that we were referring to before the the Lamanby dismissal uh, Neil McKenzie who was such a superstitious cricketer he of the man who would attach his back with sellotape to the ceiling all of that all of that <laughs> was run out for 99 in a test against Australia at Cape Down in 2002 were you there it, Samo was because uh -huh. he told him he told him afterwards as I told on the screen here it was the 99th run out for 99 in first class cricket oh no that's perfect perfect, perfect. who was the 100th Samo <laughs> Nice punch down the ground, but no run by Tom Banton. And just to round out on Lamanby, the fact that he'd struggled against Surrey, averaged 15 in these contests across five matches, so a decent sample size there before today. A period of time where he'd found himself periodically out of the, the Somerset best 11. We've talked a couple of times about the players will almost certainly return to that best side in Abel and Cola Cadmore in the fullness of time. So... Oh, yeah, he's taken that one. Thank you very much. Gus Atkinson is on the score sheet. Pretty muted reaction. He doesn't give much away, does the Surrey Seamer, but he's on target there. And it's a fine catch by Ben Folks. You'd expect him to take it going away to his left. Perhaps a little inside edge by Tom Banton, who goes. Face just three deliveries, and he has to walk. Four down suddenly, Somerset. This is what they do. This is what Surrey do. They are always in the game with this pace attack. They've taken three for three just when they needed it. Yeah, you're right about it, folks. We'll see it back here, but on the inside edge, never easy to adjust, and he makes it look easy. I mean, by folks' standards, I suppose it is, but taking it in the left glove and making no mistake, 199 for four. Only about 10 minutes ago when we came on together, they were 196 for one. Different game of cricket now. Atkinson in the book. Yeah, and it's just come down the slope a tiny bit as well. He's bowled... <coughs> A very strong spell here as Gus Atkinson. He's shown some ticker post-lunch as well because he was down on his luck a little bit beforehand. He applied some pressure in the interim after lunch and now he's picked up his man. Down on his luck and also down on his speeds, I yeah. thought, Atkinson, before lunch. Given what we were conditioned to seeing him clocked at when playing for England. A terrific international debut up at Manchester last year. Going on a Maybe England's best bowler at the 50 over World Cup last year. Certainly a case for it and, and bowling in the mid to high 70s. Um, but yeah, since lunch, consistently back in the 80s and, and finding some rhythm. His first competitive game since last November, of course. Yeah, and just a bit of nip through the gate. And it brings a left-hander on strike here. And Atkinson has found some rhythm in the afternoon session. And so he'll be eyeing up the outside edge of James Ruse. Rather wide bat. So, again, another crucial mini passage in this undulating first day here at the Kia. Never seen Rue bat in the flesh. Looking forward to this. After all he achieved last year. I mean, to walk out in your first season of professional cricket, 1,086 runs at 57, 500s and two scores over 50 in addition to that. It immediately starts people chatting about, well, maybe he's the next England keeper, and so on and so on. But mm -hmm. let's let's just suppress uh, enthusiasm on that front and, and appreciate there's a player of some talent, uh, and he's uh, preparing to take the next step in his professional career. Begins here at the Oval. He's off the mark. Easy pickings into the onside. Half Let's go back for a couple. Sorry, sorry, Phil. Half century last week as well to get his season going. Yeah, and a quick one actually. Yep. Nine fours and a six, I think it was. Pretty much an even run of ball 50 yards, 53, I think it was. Yeah. Young player of the year as well last year, PTA's young player of the year. 200 up, 200 for four, 201 for four now in the 40, in the 50th over, in fact. So decent lick at fours. It's been a fascinating day's cricket. I've loved mm. it, I have to say. Great to be back. It, it just is, isn't it? Packed out, sun dappled, it's beautiful. And just on the Rue hundreds last year, that pretty good opposition he made them against. So a couple of them against Lancashire, one home, one away, and a double against Hampshire, who I suppose, along with Surrey, would have a claim to be the strongest bowling attack in the country. One against Knotts at home as well in the second dig, five all up. Yeah. You don't get any easy Div 100s. 
short again to ploy this for sure. Two men out for the hook, but James Rue not interested, lets it go by. 201 for four from 50 then. So 14 overs left until the tee interval. Feels like a, the fortunes of the day will, will hinge on, on what happens in the next 50 to 60 minutes, Phil. It does feel like that, and Surrey will be delighted with this. This is why red ball cricket is just so compellingly watchable when it's played by two good cricket teams, as we're seeing here, because you could have turned up an hour ago and thought, there's no way that the momentum of this day is shifting. Mm. They were utterly serene, those two. Suddenly they're four down, just like that. Jordan Clark in again. Leg side this time, well taken, Ben, folks. And it's Jordan Clark who's made this happen. Picked up the wicket this morning, affected the run out. And then came back hard to get rid of Tom Lamaby. And what I love about this time of year, and I know there's a debate about playing this early in April, by the way. Uh, I came to a game at this, in fact, it was these two teams playing back in 2016 in April where it snowed. They went off the ground for snow. So, you know, the inclement weather last week, we saw that um, with many games affected, two games not getting on for a single ball. But when they're on and up and about, whole country's watching this from a cricket perspective. Not a lot of distractions. Yes, the IPL's going on, but this is front and centre for these players, which is far harder to achieve in the middle of the summer. There'll be a block of games in the summer, but there'll be other cricket being played, and it's a far busier schedule. But right now, um, from an England perspective, this is where the attention lies, and that's a great thing for players trying to make their way. If there is spots in the England lineup, who's to know? We, we've, I get the sense from comments from Rob Key a couple of weeks ago, they are going to try and take things develop things in 2024 at home they're not going to just cruise this is the time to make a statement well bold again full and straight been an excellent spell full of heart and endeavour here by Jordan Clark you're absolutely right I love this part of the year I really do there's always subtexts and subplots mm. taking place as well England are all often licking wounds from a, <laughs> a tough Winds are away in foreign climes, this time no different. And, and the eyes of the English game are fixed on four-day cricket. We take it for granted at our peril. It's a magnificent tournament, this. You look at the games as well, in the first division in particular. Again, Goldsworth, he's been rock solid so far, just a single off his first 17 deliveries. But you look at the quality of these fixtures in the top division in particular. There are very few average cricket teams out there. Mm. And... There's almost that kind of inbuilt, apologetic side of things when it comes to our four-day game, but we should be proud of what we have here and protect it as long as we possibly can. And just look around you here. This is the centre of London on a Friday afternoon. And there's significant numbers here. They've been desperate for it. Another nice little stat here from Samson before I jump off in a sec. Uh, most first-class hundreds by an England teenager. Compton, you might have heard of him, yeah. made seven uh, before he turned 20. Roger Kimpton for Oxford and Gentlemen, so a different era there in the mid-1930s, made six. Dan Lawrence, six between 2015 and 2017 when he was racking them up for Essex. And, yes, James Rue's got half a dozen as well, one in 2022 and five last season. Thanks, Samo. Yeah, nicely done, Maestro. And, of course, Daniel Lawrence making his home debut but in his first significant game here for Essex, age 17, he made 150-odd of the most audacious runs you could ever <laughs> wish to see. Cramps him up a little bit, but no dramas for James Rue, just getting going. Adam Collins is vacating the box just for a moment in the build-up to T. And how about that, Matthew Roller? Crick Info's Matthew Roller and and Arsenal's Matthew Roller, and even WCM's occasional Matthew Roller, the ineffable young journalist from ESPN, has joined us in the chair. It's, a, it's, a, it's an evolving feast of, of personalities this afternoon. It's great to see Katia Whitney join us for the first time. We'll be hearing a lot more from her over the summer, and hopefully the same with you, Matthew. How are you doing? Very well, thank you, Phil. Very much enjoying first-class cricket back at the Oval after a, a long winter it's been. It's going to be Gus Atkinson 
to keep going. It's been an outstanding spell. Yeah, I think we have to be careful with it that we don't that we don't become sort of knee-jerk poetic about it. This is just good hard cricket. This is just good stuff between two very very good cricket teams, sprinkled with internationals, sprinkled with burgeoning aspiring international cricketers. This has been top stuff here and the crowd have been richly entertained. 202 for four. Hinge point of the day, you feel. Stifled appeals from behind the stumps there because it was off the inside part of Lewis Goldsworthy's bat. He's not played a shot in anger yet. He's got right in behind every delivery bowl at him. We'll let it go by and that's fine just for now. It's a good opportunity for Lewis Goldsworthy. Good really. player. The, the injury to Tom Abel, very poorly timed from a Somerset perspective. He's obviously given up the captaincy over the winter to focus on his batting. Very unfortunate from Abel's point of view to miss this early part of the season, but it does give opportunities for people like Goldsworthy in their middle order. He's had a go at that one. It's the top edge, and it will beat the man at long leg and run away for four, but applause from behind the stumps by Ben Folks for... Gus Atkinson's imagination as much as anything else there. No one really saw that coming. He's been nagging away on a length, just shy of a length against the diminutive Goldsworthy, but he's banged it in there and it was an unconvincing attempt at a hook shot. In no kind of position to play it, but picks up his first boundary four. Not often I believe in moral victories, but you can give that one to the bowler for sure. Foolish this time and in, in behind it holding back on the drive still trying to find his rhythm here just keeping half an eye on the, the speed gun in the bottom right hand corner of the screen I think 84 miles an hour for that bouncer from Atkinson which is decent pace um, especially first game of 2024 of course he's had a, a strange winter carrying the drinks around mm. um, definitely running in harder I think after in session he looked a bit, a bit timid in his run up in his approach in the morning session lands it again but you can you saw it there in the run-up just finding his rhythm a little bit sometimes you just just have to reduce those strides in order to find the right approach when the mind is clear then you don't have to worry about that it's but he's such a natural quick that it still comes out doesn't it here's an unusual action I think even last summer when I saw him bowling sort of mid 90s miles an hour at one point in the 100 um, against Manchester Originals when he was beating Butler and Salt for pace he's still there's something idiosyncratic about it isn't there another quick delivery and Colesworthy ducks underneath it ok so 52 gone now 208 for 4 quick tour around the grounds what do we have 2-3-1 for 3 at Chelmsford Essex so they they recovered well from an early loss and Dean Elgar's registered his first 100. You feel that might be the first of quite a few. He made an 80-odd last week in tough conditions at Trent Bridge. 109 not out. Jordan Clark chipped in as well with a 67. Essex going well against Kent. Four for 165 are Hampshire down at the Utilita. Is that what it's known as these days? I believe it is. 165 for four, Hampshire. Tom Press, 29, not out. Good young player. Excellent young player. Made a brilliant 100 against Surrey, in fact, at Guildford last year in the 50-over comp. Good young player. He's been, just been joined by Liam Dawson. This is against Lancashire, so that one's in the balance. Four down for 165. It's Clark again. Indomitable spell, this, and he's up again. Right on the bootlaces. And James Ruse just getting going, just right in solidly behind it. OK. What about Edgebaston, Phil? Warwick said 273 for none against the much fancied Durham. Having yes. come up, a lot of people were actually tipping them to challenge for the title this year, but that's a pretty... You've written them off already. But it's, it's a quarter, tough start, isn't it? It's quarter past three. <laughs> <laughs> On day five of the season. They've not even taken a wicket. <laughs> Airy through where third slip would have been. He wasn't there for the shot, James Root. Gets away with it this time. Surrey are ticking though, you can sense it, there's a new energy out there. You do wonder if Rory Burns may just have gambled on a third slip, third grabber there to the new man. Still, flew away just for the single. Always enjoy watching Jordan Clark, I think. Um, I, I reckon there's a good, good shout that he's been one of the best transfers of 
modern times in county cricket. Since joining Surrey, he's played 49 first-class games, 1,400 runs or near enough, and averaging 28 with the ball, 133 wickets for them. Yeah, player of the year, outstanding stalwart now for this club. He does the lot, you know, catches colds in the slips, he throws them down at the non-striker's end as he did today. Takes the new ball and whacks the old one. Playing a miss, well bowled, outstanding spell. Keeps on coming in hard here. Surrey needed this, didn't they? Because they let it go for 20 minutes after lunch as well. Kemar Roach didn't really nail it. It looked for a moment like some said we're going to build something monstrous out there. And Clark has said, alongside Atkinson, in fairness, give me the ball. Let me sort this problem out. Just going briefly back to that Warwickshire game. Warwickshire Durham. Durham won the toss, by the way. Have first go. So, Rob Yates, 144 not out as it stands. Alex Davis, skipper, of course, this year for the first time. 1 2 2 not out. 275 for no loss after 51 overs. They're only halfway through the day. <laughs> But interestingly, look at, the, look at Durham's attack. Matthew Potts, test class. Scott Boland, test class. Ben Rain, county legend. Bryden Cass, international class. Callum Parkinson, up and coming international potential. 275 for naught. Again, just dangling the bat outside off stump. He's been slightly unconvincing up until now as Lewis Goldsworthy, but he's still there. I suppose it's quickly forgotten that Warwickshire are the most recent team other than Surrey to win the title back in 2021. Feels a, a fair while ago now, but... Yeah, indeed. There aren't too many poor teams in the top division. It's a hard league to call. Most pundits have tended to look towards the Keir Oval for their champions, but nothing's going to be given to them. pleased to add a single but it does mean that he will have retained strike going into the next over and you would imagine that Atkinson if he's got one more in him he'll come in for in hard here because he feels like he may just have Goldsworthy's number yeah the hat the cap comes off and Atkinson is into his work again it's been an outstanding dual spell here by these two they've changed the course and tempo of this game yeah three for three was what Somerset lost having looked as though they were on course for a, a huge total but I suppose this this engine room of their batting with Tom Kohler Cadmore running the drinks at Rajasthan Royals and, and Tom Abel obviously on the sidelines was always going to be the area of slight concern for them and Banton out cheaply Goldsworthy looked a little shaky so far but they need a bit of a partnership before they get into the all-rounders and bowlers I feel like the old boy on the sandwich boards back in 1930. Sam Northeast is out. For Bradman's name, you can add Sam Northeast. Sam Northeast is out, folks. On the back of 166 not out on the 10th of September against Yorkshire and 335 not out and 14 not out last week at Lords for Glamorgan. Tidy work at square leg. This is good by Surrey. They have a clear plan. They've got four men on the leg side. Two on the catch, on the boundary. And Dom Sibley in there at square. They're banging it in against Goldsworthy. He's not been entirely convincing against the short one up until now. Sam Northeast bowled by Blair Tickner for just 11. With just a single boundary four. So how about that? That's better by Somerset number four, just getting comfortably in behind the shortish delivery. Got to see out this mini spell here, you feel. You don't need to worry about the, the scoreboard. James Rue and others will do their thing. He needs to show a bit of stickability, a bit of adhesiveness here to Lewis Goldsworthy. Dom Sibley down brilliantly there at square leg. He's had a, quite a day in the field already, what with that catch early on. That's a screamer. If you haven't seen it, check out the highlights this evening again he's 
not in a great position to play that shot in truth rocks onto the front foot and he rather plants himself in that position it's not a great position to play the cross bat shot and another one goes through just showing this chance of this catch yet again it is oh it's an astonishing grab I think we'd be generous to say that he's flicked it up knowingly with his right <laughs> boot, but he's certainly taken it. He's been alert to the, to the quarter chance, the eighth chance. Magical stuff. Again, short and wide, deliberate ploy. He doesn't fancy this at the moment. Yeah, he's a, he's a short man, isn't he, Goldsworthy, and he's really being targeted here by, by Atkinson and does not look comfortable as we see the ball go past the bat there. I think there was a stifled appeal from behind the stumps, but nothing more. He's got to hang in there now. And he will pick up a single, but again, it means he retains strike. So he's under the pump just a little bit here, is Lewis Goldsworthy. And you can bet your bottom dollar, you can already see it. Jordan Clark is, is pushing hard for another another spell. In fact, Rory Burns has turned. In fact, he's he's had to head off Jordan Clark. So perhaps he's got a tiny little niggle. So his outstanding spell comes to an end. Game shifting spell that was. And we're going to have a first look at Cameron Steele this afternoon. Fresh off a, a five foot. It's easy bowling wrist spin in the first week of April in England. Cheap fire for us off. Well, yeah. Five for 25. Very good stuff. Nine wickets between him and Daniel Lawrence, of course, last week against Lanks. And and they're just getting all the various paraphernalia, the, the pads and the boxes and the shoulder guards and all the rest of it. So just going to have a little pause as Burns sets his field for the leggy. And it's quite an interesting move, this, because Goldsworthy, who's not looked entirely at ease, may look at the wrist spinner and think there might be one or two options here just to get in, play a shot or two in anger. But that's exactly what Surrey are going to want him to be thinking. Did you know, Phil? Go I'm, on. I'm sure you did. You're a very well-researched man. If Cam still takes one wicket today, he will equal the number of first-class wickets he took in the whole of last season. Somebody did tell me this earlier in the week, but I'd forgotten it. Yeah, well, it's an interesting move by Surrey to, to have him in the side, I think. He began last year as well with the bat in particular. He made a brilliant 140-odd early on in April. And, but they're clearly thinking to foreground the spinners more than they have done in, in recent years. Will Jacks did a very useful job for them in 2022. Less so last year because the seamers were just irresistible, but sorry, they're nobody's fools. They're very canny, very pragmatic in how they go about organising their cricket teams and, and they will know that opposition sides, they will try and perhaps nullify their seam attack by preparing slightly drier pitches while they have an option. They have two options. And we saw it last week. Lanks play two spinners, so does Surrey, and they share nine between them. It's been interesting hearing Gareth Batty talk about that yeah. as well, hasn't it? Lovely start. Beautiful. Bit of zip as well. Attacks the crease. Look at over then. Still got his hands on his head. Six, seven seconds after the ball's gone through. Here it comes. That is an absolute perler first up. That's not missed off stump by a long way. And it's kicked and bounced as well. English qualified, I believe. Cameron Steele, I believe so. I think he's, I think he's U.S. born, if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken. That's correct. The maestro gives us the thumbs up. Good, good. Got him. Beautifully bowled. Lewis Goldsworthy has to walk. That is a jaffer by the leg spinner whose garlanded start to the 2024 season continues. Make that six for 25 so far as he keep, keeps on the form from last week. 
Easy catch for first slip. Craig, uh, Jamie Overton does not miss those. And suddenly, from nowhere, Somerset, who was so dominant, are 2 1 1 for 5. It feels like it's been coming for goals where they really battled. Didn't look comfortable against the short ball. Suddenly gets some leg spin on, beaten by the first one, gets in behind the second one. But here we see not even a huge amount of turn, just enough to take the edge as the bat turns towards the leg side. And good chance, well taken by Jamie Overton. Yeah, a ripper and well deserved. His first ball was just as good, just evaded the edge. Second ball, bang on the money. And third ball, it's good night, Charlie. So, five down, Lewis Gregory marches to the crease. James Rue's just not really got going yet, only faced seven deliveries. They bat long and deep, of course. Craig Overton will be in, you would think, at eight. Casey Aldridge as well is a hard-hitting bat at nine. But work needs to be done here. What a day's cricket we've had. I think that's four wickets for 15 runs since someone said we're 196 for one. Lamb will be there on 99 with Renshaw at the other end. And it's funny that that, that milestone and the thing that it can do to, to players. To easy to forget that they're people too and that they have the same nervousness about reaching three figures that just everyone else does. Um, and it feels like that, that moment has transformed the day really. Those, those nerves, that little bit of anxiety, that little bit of hesitation and miscommunication. Yeah, precisely that. Looking back now in retrospect, there was no need, was there? There was no need to, to force any issues. They had the game in the palm of their hand. Tossed up, big full bunger this time. I think if that had happened at any other point, the Lewis Gregory would have cleared the front leg and eyed up that short boundary. But it's a sign of the moment of this game that he's patted it back rather nervily. Right back on it, excellent stuff. Very much enjoyed that wry smile from Lewis Gregory after the first ball he faced. I think that was the last thing he was expecting. Yep, this is superb stuff here by Surrey. This is what they do. This is why they're so feared. And again, tossed it right up there. Tempting, wicket maiden, excellent captaincy and superb wrist spin. By Cameron Steele. I'm going to take a breather. And Daniel Norcross, who's looking rather chipper, yeah, he's going to take over. It's looking like a pretty good change, pretty inspired bit of captaincy from Rory Burns getting Steele on. We see it so often, a, a spinner before the T interval, but uh, he's gone with, gone with the leg spinner rather than Dan Lawrence, who got a decent spell in this morning, bowled seven overs without any joy. Uh, to, to the left-handers and still comes on for the right-handers and hey presto we get a wicket caught at slip Daniel Norcross well well it's a funny old game and um, I'm about to ask Andrew Sampson something that, that he might actually just balk at and oftentimes he just gives me a stare a hard Paddington Bear-esque stare. I'm sure you can imagine it. <laughs> but I remember having a chat with the voice of Surrey Cricket, Mark Church, about, thank you very much, I've just been brought some water by a previous water thief. <laughs> we were discussing um, when was the best time to bowl at the Oval at different times of the year. So yes, so the assumption is always, you know, April, get bowling early. It's a bit, bit damp out there, maybe a bit of moisture, and then it'll get easier after lunch. But my contention, and Church tended to agree with me, was that we felt that the afternoon session was the most perilous of the three. Oh, I say, that was nearly a fifth wicket of the session, and it would have been a huge one as well. James Rue. A very prized wicket that would be. And why do you think that is, Daniel? Why do you think that? Do you think it's something about the state of the ball after the first 30 overs? Do you think it's the the overcast conditions? What do you think it might be? Sorry, just seeing that again. He was a whisker away. Um, well, we think it's because the ball does a bit more after lunch, and for the reasons I'm about to articulate. Oh, well, I might get to articulate it now because Atkinson couldn't bowl that ball. So, in the morning. 
found that it doesn't move a great deal because at this time of year the ground's quite cold and the air temperature is not quite warm enough yet. Oh, he's beaten him again. This is terrific stuff from Atkinson. This is a very testing half hour or so coming up to T here. Somerset had done so much of the hard work to get on top. But this flurry of wickets now means, as we see that again, just snake past the outside edge that Surrey would be, oh, they would love another couple of wickets coming up to T and that would transform the way this match looks at the moment, you'd say. They might even be edging it. Oh, and he's edged that all right. James Rue goes, beaten. The previous two deliveries that he goes after one outside the off stump. Reckless shot, perhaps. But a thin edge through to folks, and that is Surrey's fifth wicket in this session. And it is a big one. The prolific James Rue has to walk off Atkinson with his second wicket. And Somerset now, well... What a collapse this has been. Yeah, 5 for 15, the collapse for Somerset. That's, a, I think, a, a touch wider even from Atkinson than the two that beat Rue earlier in the over. Two in a row, in fact, just past the outside edge. A little bit of movement off the seam, I think. Just that little bit of extra width meant he felt he could attack, Clever, play that it? cover drive, but suck it into it, really, by Gus Atkinson. And sorry, have a sixth wicket. Well, you see where his feet were there. The, the previous two deliveries were very close to his off stump. He was forced to play out them, was beaten legitimately outside the off-stump, he sees a little bit of width, his feet are planted, perhaps in part because of the pace of Atkinson. He just saw the width, went after the ball, hands a long way from the body. He won't want to look at that again, but I think that's very clever bowling from Atkinson. He's given him the tempter and he's got his reward. And I won't, I'm not sure that that particular ball is necessarily going to play into my theory, but the theory, as <laughs> I was attempting to articulate before that ball, is that as the, the pitch warms up a bit, you just get a, that slight d difference between air and ground temperature. The air warms up at the same time. And we felt that the first couple of hours after lunch were the time when it got a bit trickier. And then towards the evening session, it sort of cools down a bit because it's time of year, you know, it's not really hot, hot as such. And the sun will move around, the shadows start coming back in. Uh, now, I've no statistics on which to base it at all. It was purely just being at the ground, and sometimes you get a recency bias. So we may have mm. had this conversation when a few wickets had just gone down after lunch. But, well, it may or may not be true, but certainly we can say that after a high point of 196 for one, Somerset now, you'd say, are struggling. And Surrey have picked up their second bonus point. Somerset yet to get a bonus point, and that did not look likely 45 minutes to an hour ago, did it? It absolutely didn't, and I think particularly pleasing from a Surrey perspective as Atkinson runs in. Oh, he's got another! First ball, Atkinson's on a hat-trick. Casey Aldridge has come and gone. It's a sixth wicket in this session. The collapse now is six for 15. And Surrey, well, they are on top. There's no doubt about it. It was a wonderful, hostile ball first up. Not what you want to face. A bomb from Atkinson. It says 84 miles an hour there, but a short ball at 84 miles an hour when you first come to the wicket can be pretty awkward. And he played this well, not the best way, flinching slightly, wasn't really looking at it. The ball balloons easily to Jamie Overton. Gus Atkinson has another, and this is what Surrey do so well. Yeah, doesn't play that like a man who's expecting a short one first up, does he, Casey Aldridge? He's got, got a, a bit of a record behind him in first-class cricket. He has scored a first-class 100, but um, that won't be a shot he looks back on with any great fondness, I don't think. No, but it's not one you really want to face first up, though, as well, is it? Um, right in that awkward zone. He doesn't play it well, you're right, but when you first come to the wicket, your feet aren't moving. It's the end of the over, so we're going to have to have a little bit of delayed gratification before we get to the hat-trick ball. 211 for seven. When was the last Surrey hat-trick at the oval? It's great having Andrew Sampson here, isn't it? <laughs> You'd have to say as well, from, from Surrey's point of view, 
the fact that they're doing this with a kookaburra ball as well, I think neither their coach nor the director of cricket is particularly is particularly um, uh, in favour, should we say, of the of the change of. There are very few people rounds, who but, are really, but I think they, they've been relatively outspoken in their views uh, that it's maybe not the best thing for from their perspective for the integrity of the championship. So to be doing that in the 56th over of the day, as Atkinson has there. Um, Means we get these games out of the way, though. That's true. That's true. But how many are they playing? There's is it four with a four Kukabara? across the season? So two early on, and then two more height of summer, I believe. Height of summer? Oh, that could be tricky, couldn't it? Mind you, we've we've actually established that April is the second best month for batting <laughs> statistically. <laughs> and and oh, as Cameron Steele starts a new over, I've got some stats on Cameron Steele for you, thanks to um, thanks to Andrew Sampson. Cameron Steele. His last 10 wickets have cost 65 runs since the start of the last innings last season. He took 4 for 40 against Hampshire, 5 for 25 against Lancashire. It is so far, he's 1 for none today. And he's going to concede runs here. Nicely played by Gregory, just dropped a touch short. What has been a feature of Cam Steele? Certainly, last week at Lancashire, I watched all of that on the live stream. Uh, what is his control? It's landing it well. Gareth Batty's the last hat-trick at the Oval. For Surrey, because Moeen Ali's had one, hasn't he, since then? Against South Africa. I think he was in the match when Toby Roden jones was the, the fastest man to a five, five for on debut. He got his five for in no time at all. Moeen Ali finishing off the game with a hat-trick. But yes, Cameron Steele's control has been excellent. And everybody gets very excited, don't they, Matt, about leg spinners. I mean, a, le a leg, he gets a wicket with one that pitches on leg, hits off. Then suddenly he's in the England team, surely, within three weeks, according to the fans. Well, he's been a bit of an unsung hero, really, Cam Steele. He's just been slapped through the offside by Gregory, but won't concede a boundary. Um, but he, he's been a... I think he was probably a relatively unexpected signing when he joined a couple of years ago. Um, he's been the sort of player that I suppose you need when you have a squad like Surrey's where you're constantly losing players to the IPL, to other franchise tournaments in the English summer now, to England Test commitments, to England White Ball commitments. You, you need a Cam Steele or two around. and It's proving his worth. There's only one Cam Steele, Matt Roller. You can't have a Cam Steel or two, I'm telling you that now. He's a one-off. End of the over. So, we now build up to Gus Atkinson on a hat-trick. He's going to be bowling at Lewis Gregory. So, not the new batter Craig Overton, although Gregory's only really just arrived at the crease himself. With Surrey having turned this session around. I can't remember what time that run-out was. Feels like about an hour ago. I mean, Somerset not just lost wickets, they've scored very few runs in this time. Six for 20 at the moment. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see their approach in this little passage before tea with Gregory and Overton usually. Uh, Quite pugnacious players, aren't they? Yeah, the sort of players you aren't going to hang around They're here for a good time, not a long time. And we've got seven overs to go until tea, so sorry, we'll still be hoping they might pick up a wicket or two yet. Of course, if they pick up two, then we extend the session. We have an absolute mega session on our hands here. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Here's Atkinson, on a hat-trick. Ooh, hostile, but Gregory was not tempted. Interesting hat-trick ball, that one. I wonder if he remembered he was on a hat-trick. Because ordinarily, <laughs> when you're on a hat-trick, you don't usually go for the short one, do you? You usually throw one in at stumps because you want to give yourself as many modes of dismissal as possible. But yeah, there was no obvious change in the field to reflect. There was only one slip, wasn't there? Single, single wide slip, deep third. Well, this is a very, leg. It's a very good point you're making. This is a very intriguing field, given that Surrey have picked up six quick wickets. <laughs> there is only one slip in place. It's got a fine deep third and a fine leg. And Atkinson's got Gregory just hopping around a bit. There's a ring field on the offside. Saving one at short square leg. Quite a short square leg, really. 
and mid on and then there's there's a deep forward square leg which tells you a lot about the pace of Atkinson the fielders behind square are very fine and it's not a deep mid wicket it's you'd say that's a more forward square leg it's only about four or five yards in front of square short again so is this a plan is this the Gregory plan they'll have seen plenty of Lewis Gregory over the years has word got out Matt Roller that Lewis Gregory doesn't like the short stuff it I wasn't aware of this if it it's the case. It might just be a rather than a batter weakness, a bowler strength in that Gus Could Atkinson be. with his height and pace and natural. He's just got Casey Aldridge length. out to one, hasn't he? Yeah. But he bowled much fuller at James Rue. So he does he's got he's got plans for all occasions as Gus Atkinson. Just Thank a you. reminder that T is taken when 64 overs have been bowled or more importantly when 32 overs in the day remain I think any England scouts watching on will be relatively pleased with Gus Atkinson's progress today he's, he's definitely mm. grown into the day and it's gone on after lunch he's been I would say significantly more threatening than he was before well I do hope the England scouts are watching this and coming to that conclusion I scratched my head somewhat at him wandering around India for five test matches and not getting a game. I'm, as everyone is, a big fan of Mark Wood, but you're out of the World Cup. What did you make? I, th I thought Atkinson clearly out bowled any pace that England had in the World Cup. They barely used him. Yeah, it's been a been a strange winter for him, I suppose, having having just not played at all since that Caribbean tour in December. I think for any fast bowler catapulted into the England side as he was it's, it's tricky to find the right balance between not wanting to overuse someone who's a, clearly a valuable asset to English cricket um, with the skill set that he has with the pace that he has uh, and then also not wanting a situation where you know, inevitably when you need a bigger squad there's going to be the old player that doesn't make it into the team you want to have faith in the players that you select you don't want them to feel like they're uh, one bad performance away from being dropped but it does leave you in a situation where players like Dan Lawrence and Gus Atkinson spend quite a long time carrying drinks because it was quite a long test tour. Mm. It was quite a long one wasn't it because there were two chunky breaks in the middle. Yeah and while Dan, Dan Lawrence sort of was released to go and play in the ILT20 and it's slightly different I suppose for a batter. Yes, well, he was the only one, wasn't he? he was, wasn't he the only one to take his kit to the UAE, is what I heard. I don't know whether that's a massive exaggeration. But those, were, those were definitely the reports, yeah. I yeah. think it um, was, was allowed a couple of run-outs for the Desert Vipers. Oh, he's bowled him! It's another one for Steele. Surrey are on a roll here. And it's Craig Overton. And this has been quite the performance from Surrey's bowlers. It's becoming a borderline absurd. They've now taken seven wickets for 20 runs with an old ball. It's pace, it's spin, it's the lot. We'll take a look at this one again. Very full. And it's hit off stump. It's just a little bit of turn. We see it from front on, we'll get a better view. Well, I mean, that is delicious, really. It's gone, it's drifting onto leg stump. It hasn't turned too much, but it's turned enough to go past the outside edge of Overton's shot, which was tentative to say the least. He was entirely off balance as he was playing it, and it's in middle and off that he's taken there. And Somerset bat deep, but those resources are being sorely tested now. Overton at nine was their last really major bat, a man who could go on potentially get 100. Now we're definitely down to Somerset's tail and this may make a difference to the way Lewis Gregory bats with two, uh, 216 for 8. It's a nice bit of bowling from Still. I think the drift is probably the key thing there. You see Overton shaping to work it into the leg side through wide-ish mid on I think. Um, just a, Not a huge amount of turn but just enough, enough turn away. So. 11 for 70, Cam Steele in his last three innings. 
I mean, that's a, it's a measure of his control, you know. And he's n never talked about in, from what I've heard, never talked about in dispatches. Matt Parkinson gets one to go past the outside edge. We all go into complete conniptions. Oh, that wasn't a million miles away from Steele's outstretched left hand first ball. Pretorius, the new man. Has a first class hundred to his name. Not well, bad for a man walking in at number 10. That is disappointing from a Surrey point of view. But one more wicket falls here in the next five and a half overs and T will be extended. Well, I said it'd be extended. Of course, two wickets and T will be taken early. Yeah, given that <laughs> Somerset <laughs> batter there might not be extended for very long. Uh, That's in right. the last, last hour or so. Yeah, Miguel Pretorius is a, a new overseas signing. It's just arrived this week. Uh, wasn't available for the first game against Kent, effectively replacing Will Sutherland, uh, who pulled out of his stint. What do you know of him? Uh, he's not played international cricket. Uh, qualifies from by virtue of having played 20 T20s in the last two years, which gets him a visa. Um, was playing for the Pretoria Capitals, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in the SA20 earlier this year. But oh, now then, he likes to put back to ball as Pretoria. This is what I've gathered from his two sh scoring shots. Is that uh, I think Cameron Steele might be a, an interesting matchup for him. He's going to keep strike Pretorius. Another wicket taking over from Steele. Figures of two for eight. So far this season, he's taken seven for 33. He's averaging under five with the ball. And he's Surrey's leading wicket taker. And given that we're told that you can't take wickets with spin in April, and that's the problem with English county cricket, and that apparently Surrey aren't helping by not playing, picking spinners, well, they've picked up 11 wickets to spin already this summer. And they've only bowled in two innings. I've got some scores from around the counties that I want to give you because there are some absolute corkers. Uh, I'm going to start at Edgebaston because Durham, who were my pick to be the nearest challengers to Surrey this year. Durham are yet to take a wicket today. Warwickshire are 313 without loss. Yates 164. Davis 140. Oof. That's a tough old time in the field, isn't it? Yeah, been, been leaking runs at five and a bit and over. Um, uh, Phil and I were talking about this before you came on air, Dan, and writing Durham off completely on their first day of competitive <laughs> cricket. <laughs> Well, I'm not doing that. That's a decent shot from Pretorius. Brings him his first boundary as he guides that to the left of point down to the boundary. But this is this is always great fun when you get to see a batter you've not seen before live up against some hostile pace. There's a bowler at one end, Atkinson, with his tail up, bowling at ferocious pace. There's a bowler at the other end, drifting it and turning it and moving it. And we've got a big, burly South African fast bowler now is not the time to make a cup of tea, ladies and gentlemen. Or indeed, whatever you make, pina colada, it's that time of day almost. Oh! Jack's back, if they think of the run, it isn't there. Are we almost pina colada time? Oh, no, well, I don't know. 11 minutes, 4 o'clock, I think. It's got a first-class batting strike rate in the 70s, that's Pretorius. That's a good sign for fans of entertainment. It absolutely is, as was that backward cut up, right up on his toes. Mm, you like that, didn't you? You almost purred, Roller. <laughs> Can you give me some more scores? Because there's been a fair few runs scored today. Gets out of the way very wisely of a potential throw from Atkinson. Uh, Trent Bridge. Um, no, it's probably, well, yes, I think it is at Trent Bridge, isn't it? Because Worcestershire certainly can't be playing at home. Knots 205 for four. Joe Clark providing the backbone of that innings with unbeaten 88. Ben Slater earlier made 70. I see Babid and Ben Duckett failed again, 11 and 9, respectively. Knots looking to bounce back after heavy defeat against Essex. 
looks more superb work by Dom Sibley in the field. He's had a real, real good one in the field. A couple of great stops at He's square leg saving more nimble. One. He's much more nimble than people give him credit for. And actually, the catch he took. You see the the rebounded fantastic. catch. Fantastic! Wasn't yeah. fantastic. What a I saw it live and was immediately thought, how on earth has he done that? Surely that's brushed the, the floor at some point when I've watched the super slow-mo as many times as I possibly could yep. with all of my Somerset bias dripping out of me. And even I could not find a way to, to deny that that was a, a stunning and perfectly clean catch. We're a broad church here at Surrey. We've managed to find a two-eyed Somerset man. Which isn't the easiest. 60 overs gone, 223 for 8. So Gregory's going to finish up the start of the next over. Presumably against Cam Steele. Victorious in first class cricket, 478 runs. This is in 2023 24. 478 to 47.8 with 104 50s and 19 wickets at 23.84. So you can see why they wanted to sign him. I'm never quite sure though. First class cricket in South Africa is it, does it have still this sort of two tier system where you've got. This is the top tier, just getting confirmation from Andrew Sampson, even more disappointing. OK, so Surrey has still got another wicket to go before they get to the tail. And I think this is the match-up that we've come to see. Pretorius against Steele. There is a long on back. Skipper Rory Burns is now just ambling his way back, I'd say two-thirds of the way long off we've got a deep cover there's a deep mid wicket there was a deep backward square it's it's strange isn't it I mean I don't know how much Rory Burns would have seen of Pretorius but cricketing intelligence tells you after the first couple of shots he played that this feels like the right sort of field for him it was nearly a t20 field with four men out of the ring oh Keen to get bat on ball, isn't he? Oh, just <laughs> over the head of Steele. And it wasn't a far away from an outstretched right hand. He gets away with it, gets another single. I'll, I'll give you all the full roundup so I, I just get the feeling that stuff's happening here while Cam Steele's bowling. So between overs, I'll give you the full roundup of scores around the country. There's quite a stiff breeze at the moment, and it's bowling. It, it's it's breezing in the opposite direction from the prevailing spin direction for steel. Which may have been the source of the drift. The drift that accounted for the Yes. So you may be on something there, Matt. Last ball of the over. I think Surrey would quite like to keep Gregory at that end. And they will manage to do that, so in theory, three overs to go to LT, 2.25 for eight. Pretorius will be on strike elsewhere. Leaders Essex, but leaders for how much longer, depending on that ten-point penalty and whether it happens. They're playing Kent at Chelmsford. They're 2.67 for four. Dean Elgar, once of this parish, scored 120. Feroz Kushi, your first ball duck. He's had a tough start to the season, he has, has Feroz really. Kushi. Jordan Cox with 67. Matt Critchley's still there. I love watching Matt, Cr Matt Critchley bat. He's unbeaten on 54. He's with tall ball, Walter. 271 for four. Now back here, Dan, we've got a, a bowling change. We've got Jamie Overton coming on for a bit of a burst. Replacing Atkinson. Two overs before T, unless a wicket falls. In which case, you could have a little bit of a longer spell. At Hampshire. Hampshire, 210 for four against Lancashire. Surrey's opponents last week. Hampshire didn't get to bowl a ball or face a ball last week up at Durham. But they've got their championship campaign underway. Half centuries for Gubbins, Vince and Prest. Prest is unbeaten on 53. Dawson on 20. Gubbins made 50. Vince 
made 56 off 74 balls with seven fours, and I'm sure every single one of you can imagine exactly what that innings was like. <laughs> I can probably guess how he got out as well. I've seen the wicket. It was caught leg slip off. Leg the line. slip? Oh, no, that is different. Unusual. Yeah, OK. That is unusual. Mr. Yazrana pointing out not the first time that Lyon has accounted for Vince. Uh, like the first day of the 17-18 ashes. The Brisbane Test. Yeah, the run out, the direct hit run out. It's changed the course of the series. It did, he was on 83 at the time. Can Expertly called by whoever was on the radio at that point. Can it change the course of the series when we were two sessions into the series? No, quite definitely. The series was all England's at that point. <laughs> With his toes goes Pretorius and gets the easy single to get off strike, get Gregory back on strike. Uh, the last game they'll tell you about is Warwickshire. They're still going strong. 343 without loss. Yates 191 not out. Into the second division. North Ants. 183 for one against Middlesex. I would not like to see the Middlesex bowlers' current stats this summer. Poor things. Can't really blame them at Lords last week. It was a bit of a feather bed. Couldn't tell you what it's like at Northampton, but after picking up the early wicket abroad for Higgins, a century for Emilio Gay, he's 108 not out. Luke propped a 69 not out. Sees Northampton sitting very comfortably. Leicestershire at 226 for five against Sussex. A couple of wickets there for Hudson Prentice. Oh, could be tight. No. Square legs just a little bit deep there. Gus Atkinson, so they get through for an easy single. Yorkshire. Well, they're being held together by their skipper, Sean Massoud, is 116 not out. They're 243 for six against Gloucestershire. And Glamorgan, a 172 for four. And I have to tell you that Sam Northeast has got an average this season. Having been bowled by Tickner for 11, he averages 358 for the season. Did you know, Dan, that the Overton Twins celebrated their 30th birthdays a couple of days ago? End of the over, 227 for eight. You know, I didn't know that. Did they do it in some style? Well, the, the thing that prompted me to mention this was that Somerset's Instagram account posted a... to, to sort of recognise or celebrate this, they posted a, a clip from the T20 Blast semi-finals last summer of Jamie Overton being caught by Craig Overton at Long On. So uh -huh. Caption was sorry, Jamie had to bring this one out. Um, and Jamie Overton never wanted to take a backward step, take a backward step, <laughs> responded with, It's all right, I'll take the two championship medals. Which <laughs> I did quite enjoy. <laughs> yes, yes, but he has my wholehearted endorsement behind that message. Steele starts a new over. Gregory just getting him to wait a moment as he looks around the field. So, 11 balls to go until T if a wicket does not fall. This session began with Somerset 131 for one from 30 overs. Since which time, the match has been transformed. They made it to 196 for one. Excellent partnership between Lamanby and Renshaw. Which was broken in unusual fashion. Lamon be pushing a single, pushing, looking for a single, we should say, up to mid on. Just a tiny fumble from Jordan Clark encouraged Lamon to go for his 100th run. Jordan picked up, tidied up, and hurled at the striker's end. He was closer to the non striker's end. And he recognised the opportunity. Hit the stumps at the striker's end with Renshaw doing a little bit of ball watching. And from that point on, 
a collapse of 7 for 20. Let's put Surrey in a very good position as we come up towards T. It's nicely played by Gregory, just getting it past the diving point. It's kind of been an unusual situation for Somerset for the, the top order to succeed in the middle and lower orders to, to fail. Way around, Norman, isn't it? It's usually yeah. completely the other way around. They've really struggled to find a consistent opening partnership for a couple of years now. And obviously lost the experience of James Hildreth in the middle order as well. Oh, that's nice work by Rory Burns. He's pretty deep at mid-off, but just for a moment, it was a hint of a possibility of a run-out, but Pretorius gets home. Pretorius was very much admiring that shot, I think. Just it sounded nice, didn't it? Shimmying down. Tonk. Yep, it sounded good. But both Gregory and Pretorius have made it to double figures. They came together with a score on 216. They've only added the 15, but just maybe calming some jitters and Somerset eyeing up a batting point that looked an absolute formality when they were 196 for one. There's a degree of precarity to that right now. So where did you spend uh, the first week of the county championship, Matt? I actually bizarrely spent the first morning of it here, um, which is where there was government funding being announced. That's um, what there was. Yes. I was speaking to Richard Thompson, formerly of this parish, and mm. James Anderson about the uh, benefits I could have. And I spent the rest watching on from afar. While my colleagues did, did the nip over to Lords, did that my colleagues were doing the hard work at Lords, watching uh, Mr. Northeast rack up his his treble. It was expertly called by Kevin Hand, who kept us very much abreast of the landmarks as he kept going, and, and who he'd knocked off which perches. <laughs> I was staggered to realise. I think was that only the seventh triple hundred at Lords? Was it sixth or seventh? I thought there would have been more. Patsy Hendron was there for years. Now this should be the last over before tea, unless a wicket falls. I remember too speaking to, to Sam Northeast just after his 400 for Glamorgan against Leicestershire, which was mm. two seasons ago now. Third highest score in the county championship. And he told me that his previous professional high score was 191 and he'd never scored more than that at any level. There hadn't been some school game or anything had a ridiculous innings like that and now suddenly he has positions one and two I believe on the uh, Glamorgan list it's amazing isn't it so that was the sixth triple hundred Gooch Hobbs Mark Wall was it Mark Mark, 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 yeah Mark 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 Wag <laughs> <laughs> Holmes. Holmes and Nick Knight 303 fascinating isn't it all those matches played at Lords, you'd expect there'd be more triple hundreds. I mean, here at the Oval, we've got Len Hutton, Bobby Abel, Shimamla, Shimamla, Andrew Sandon, Kevin Peterson. Of course. <laughs> now, I like this field. I don't know if we can, our cameras can point it out to you. So, Conventional slip has gone as the ball's got pretty soft now in the 64th over. We've got a forward short leg and a leg slip, so you can be fairly sure what Overton's line of attack is. There's also a deep square leg who's about two yards in front of square, and I'd say 15 yards inside the boundary. It's a fine deep third and a fine leg, so you can fairly well expect short balls. which at the moment Pretorius is playing pretty well. 11 triple hundreds at the Oval. 11 triple hundreds at the Oval. And you know, you'd have to say that the Oval's roughly twice as good as Lord's <laughs> as a venue, so that probably is about right. Yeah, it's got a little bit better, Lords, in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> it's 
So, if a wicket doesn't fall off this ball, it will be T. With Somerset having scored 100 runs in this session in 34 overs. And actually, when the score was 196 for one, they were going along very comfortably indeed at that point. So that is the last ball before T. It has quite definitely been Surrey's session. Somerset were 196 for one at the end of the 45th over in the next 19 overs they've scored just 35 runs they've lost seven wickets three to Gus Atkinson one to Clark in that session two to Steele and what started it all was the run out of Matt Renshaw and here is that run out Lamaby was on 99 at the time trying to steal the single really clever work from Jordan Clark and straight away Lamaby himself, after getting his 100, was out very soon after LBW. Wonderful catch from folks off the inside edge. Picked up the fourth wicket, and then Cameron Steele came in with a couple of wickets. Firstly, that catch at slip. Then James Rue driving away from his body against Atkinson. He will not want to see that again. Atkinson again getting Casey Aldridge off his first delivery. Hostile, caught a ballooning, ballooning shot. And then... The last we had to fall today, that very, very clever leg spinner from Cameron Steele to get rid of Craig Overton. So, 7 for 35, it's slightly less than that at the time, it was 7 for 20. It's a little bit of a partnership here, has just held Surrey up as we come up to the tea break. You can see there Atkinson with 3 for 52, bowled with great hostility and speed. Cameron Steele didn't come into the attack until late into the session but that five over spell has picked up two for 14 he's got seven wickets so far this season Jordan Clark had a wicket in the first session and then another one in this session that's two for 52 Tom Lamaby and Matt Renshaw the stars for Somerset they put on 178 but they both went one after the other Renshaw to that run out and the floodgates open Lamaby making it to three figures thereafter it has all been Surrey we go to T with a score 231 for eight. And uh, who's coming in? It's gonna be it's gonna be John Surtees and Elliot Rousen. Hello. Hello. Come and sit down. Come and sit down, John, and then we can uh, and then we can affect the handover. Uh, we've got some chat to have at tea time. It's gonna be John Surtees who's gonna take you through it though. The action will recommence in, uh, the, the live action, I should say, will recommence in around about 16, 17 minutes. Imagine that to be about 24 minutes past four, but don't go away. I'm going to, hello, Elliot. You introduce yourself, and I'm going to hand you over to John Surtees. Perfect. Thanks very much indeed, Dan. And um, the aforementioned... Elliot Rousen joining us here on the uh, Surrey CCC live broadcast here on the Surrey YouTube channel, Surrey website, ECB website, ECB app. We're beaming across the world. Um, we've had communiques today from people in Bangkok Airport. We've had people ironing clothes ready to go to Singapore for the weekend. We're very much an international broadcast, but but um, to, to to segue clunkily into then what we're now talking about, Elliot. Um, you uh, pre well, you're very very recently started working for the club, but previously worked for the Surrey Cricket Foundation. And although this place has an international reputation and a global following, and people are aware that cricket of global significance takes place here, it is very much in the heart of an amazing South London community. Um, and Elliot, uh, in your role with the foundation, played a huge role, a uh, huge part in 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 influencing the club's relationship and making sure that. The Oval, as well as the wonderful cricket on the field, is a place of positivity um, and it generates positivity in the community around the, uh, around the, area, the areas the, the, the areas surrounding the Oval. So I've, I've talked myself into a corner here, Elliot, but do <laughs> please tell us about some of the work that you did, including some amazing stuff that happened uh, just last week. Yeah, so this week we concluded our Vauxhall Loop programme. <clears throat> it was the fifth edition of the programme, the fifth time that we ran it um, here at the Oval. 
Um, it's an amazing program looking to engage our local community, um, providing activities for young people that may face barriers in terms of finance or getting to activities or what's in their local area. Mm. Um, we try to break down some of those barriers um, by basically providing a week of free free activities. Yeah, so it's an amazing an amazing program. So there's a hun- hundred kids. Um, so so tell us about yeah the, the, the why why this idea started. So this was this was the the, the fifth one, but we've we've previously run them before in, in summer holidays. I think we've run them at Christmas. This one was, it's in the uh, for those of you that don't have kids, it's the coming up to the end of the Easter holidays now. So so you know if you do have kids, it's obviously a pretty uh, pretty busy pretty busy time. Um, so so yeah, tell tell us about what what it what it was that that, that we why we, where this idea came from and why the program was designed as it was. Yeah, listen, we know that we have a, a social responsibility to um, support our local community here to the Oval Um, and a big part of that is as I mentioned breaking down barriers for the young people that are in that area. Um, We know that we can help to provide these activities and these other avenues during the Easter break when often families have a lot of free time and are looking to fill that time well for the young people Mm -hmm. Um, so that was kind of the idea behind it. Um, We wanted to connect the young people to the Oval um, a lot of these young people had never stepped foot inside this, mm. um, having lived, you know, a street across. Um, so we kind of wanted to break that barrier down as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things I think I find so so fascinating about Voxel Loop is, is, you know, you you said obviously a lot of people haven't haven't set foot in this place before, but the, the, we're an amazing community here. The the amount of, of of diversity in the community is amazing. The amount of diverse activities that that are available for kids to to, to do and, and 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 to be interested in, you know, it's it's one of the beautiful things about living in London is you're you're you're, you're never never too far from from something that you think could be really interesting and so you what 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 i think you do is if i'm right with the voxel loop is that you you focus on showing kids what's available to them on their doorstep you're not bringing someone in from leicester and saying hey you know come and learn about this or whatever and then and then the kids like oh great i love this but like where can i do it now so oh sorry the the teacher's gone back to leicester or whatever like what you're demonstrating is to them what is available to them within a walk within a a, a short line bike ride whatever it is of of the oval so so tell us about some of some of the the stuff that the kids were, were getting up to last week yeah that's it that's spot on um a lot of the young people don't know what's on their doorstep so we've got a responsibility to to show them that um a lot of the activities are within a five minute walk from here um we have rock climbing over at Vauxhall towards Vauxhall Station, with beekeeping in Kennington Park, um, a whole range of other activities. So um, let's just go back to that one. Beekeeping in Kennington Park. Beekeeping so so, so Kennington what, Park. What, what was going on? So, so how old were the young people that we were working with last week? They were a mixture from kind of year three to year six. So primary school age. Yeah. So, 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 up to, so for those, again, that aren't familiar with the schooling system, we're talking about sort of nine, nine to 11, 12, something, something like that. Yeah. So a bunch of nine... 12 year olds from Kennington, Oval and, yeah. and Vauxhall, how did they take to, to beekeeping? Surprisingly well. Amazing. Surprisingly well. It was again something they had no idea that was on their doorstep. Um, but yeah, they loved it. Absolutely loved it. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Vauxhall, so you, you got them up, you, I'm, I'm, if I remember, if I, I think you, you got them over to the to the Vauxhall City Farm. You can see yeah. here, you know, for those of you watching on YouTube, there's a, some, some footage now rolling of some of the stuff people are getting onto. Obviously, Elliot, there was a big cricket element to it, right. as you ever would, you know, with. Sorry, organising a programme, we're going to be doing a lot of things, but there's likely to be some cricket involved there. But yeah, to people again, the people that don't know how, you, you're probably no more than three or four minutes walk from here. Tell people about Vauxhall City Farm and how amazing that place is. Incredible. And again, even the staff had no idea it was there. We are right around the corner from this amazing farm that it really opens the eyes of the young people to working with animals and just experience in that, yeah. that environment. And you're talking pigs alpacas, yeah. donkeys, there's an equestrian centre there. There is. Like, you can go and ride, you can live slap bang in the middle of London, you can go and ride horses there. Yeah. Like, it's it's absolutely brilliant. And and um, another one of our community programmes here, uh, hosted at the, at the Kier Oval, is the Ben Holyoke Learning Centre. And I know that you, you worked, Steve, who's run that centre for a long time, a real hero of, of the club around here. Um, you work you work with them. Talk to us a little bit about what, what the, the young people are doing up in the, um, in the downstairs from here in the Ben Holyoke Centre. Yeah, yeah, listen, we work closer to them. They're an amazing part of what this club does in the community. Um, so we ran a DJing course out of that out of that centre. Um, and also they, they ran some podcasting um, elements with Steve about cricket jargon and yeah. understanding what some of these terminologies we use are. Which is really cool, because again, I think we just need to understand, put ourselves in the position of the young people here, like... To, to a lot of people who are listening to this probably the idea of just quickly learning how to podcast is probably something that, that you know someone would be thinking well that's 
that's gone past now. I'm not. I'm not going to be a. I'm never going to be a podcaster. But but for these kids, it's completely innate, isn't it? They've, they've they've grown up there. You know, you talk about digital natives. These kids are sort of probably second, sometimes even third generation digital natives. And yeah. actually, you know, you say to them, put a podcast together, and they're like, okay. Rather than like, I've no idea how on earth I would I, w- I would do that. So it's yeah. it's a really, you know, kind of inspiring to, to to see how they how they deal with things like that, right? Absolutely, and that's one thing that kind of takes me back every time we do this. How the young people throw themselves into whatever you give them, whatever you put in front of them they're willing to give it a go um, and it's incredible yeah and and there's a slight i think you know there's a, there's a, there's, a, there's an opinion of some people that, that who, who i don't think necessarily know what they're when they're talking about all the time but but that that, that cricket struggles to connect with young people that, that cricket you know is a, is a sport that is, is is struggling to connect at a young age struggling to connect sometimes in urban communities as well in diverse communities um you know talk to us a little bit about you know how, how the kids were you know you you you, you had them playing cricket a lot of them had played a bit of cricket before you know how, how did they how did they respond to, to the cricket yeah listen a lot of the kids have, have been part of similar programs that we've ran before a lot of new faces um and yeah initially there is some apprehension towards the game um we're lucky to have a really great bank of coaches who make really exciting sessions, make the sessions extremely engaging. Um, and, and once they get started, as I say, they throw themselves into it. Yeah, um, yeah. absolutely. I just think, you know, the idea of, of you know, it's, you, can, you can get tied up in not knowing what a, you know, reverse, a reverse scoop is or, a, you know, or, or not necessarily knowing where, where silly point is or something mm-hmm. like that. But ultimately, you give a kid a cricket bat and you show them a tennis ball or a wind ball or whatever it is, and say right, okay. See this cricket bat. See this ball. I want you to whack this ball as hard as you can on the bat. That's it. Okay. That is it. Simple. You know, uh, they can, and they can, they can, they can do that. And they can do it. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and then, talk to us a little bit then about, you know, so say you're you're a kid and you, you you come down to the to Vauxhall Loop last week and you, you you get your first cricket session and you absolutely love it. Where do they go from there? What happens then when they come up to you and they say, you know, Elliot, I love this session, or the parent comes up to you and says, Elliot, you know, my kid, I never played cricket before, but like they absolutely love it. You know, I live in an estate just overlooking the oval like where can they go next like what where can they continue to play cricket what you know what what do we offer in terms of that where's where's the next step for those kids yeah i guess that's all credit to the foundation here and the work they do within the community um here we run a session on a, i think it's a thursday night uh, a chance to sign street session and that's where we send them that's the opportunity to take up cricket for free no equipment needed and it's right here at the Oval yeah and then, and there are other sessions that I know that we run out in Brixton aren't there yep. and, and out down in, in Croydon in Wandsworth in, in, in Southwark yep. like you know that this, 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 these sessions are there you know for people to come along and, 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 and get involved in the game I think we run I think 18 of these sessions across South London um, and kind of in Surrey yeah yeah and it's, it's, it's amazing and, and you know it's, it's Again, if they then want to come down, it's a pound to come and watch county cricket here, to yeah. come and watch T20 cricket for anyone of, of that of, of that age. Um, you know, it's free. It's free, free after tea. You know, there's 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 so many different things that can that you know it, it, it is. You know, I think I think you know it is. It's 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 a bit of a it's a, it's a, a bit of a lie to say that actually like you know this this place is completely and utterly inaccessible at all times. Yeah, we all appreciate that not everyone's got the money to go and spend a hundred quid on going to watch a full tape full full day of a test match. Yeah. But you know, it's it's an amazing location. One of the great strengths of the ground is its location here, and and and, and I think you know there is a lot of work you know both in terms of Vauxhall Loop and that sort of thing, and, and in terms of trying to make the ground accessible. You know, does 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 go on. You know, and the Vauxhall, the Vauxhall Loop is is the start of it. And, and, and you know, hopefully after the Vauxhall Elite, people will then be more interested in, in, in coming here and, and, and watching a you know a great day's cricket like like we've like we've got today. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's one of our roles is, is getting more people into this ground, and people that have never stepped foot in here as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's the wall the wall around the ground is you know it's we but I think you know metaphorically it, w- it would be great you know to be able to to set a metaphor you know to, to you know you can't knock down a wall all you know every time but but you know metaphorically you you know you certainly you certainly you certainly can do. Absolutely. You know, um, talk just a little bit about about the character of some of the kids um, that you were that you were working with last week. You know, what what you know for someone that doesn't live around here, for someone that's working, you know, someone someone that's watching this in, you know, either out in Guildford or further further afield. You know, talk talk to a little, talk to a little about about youth culture around the Oval. What are the what are these kids like? How 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 you know, how great are the kids? <laughs> you know? That's a pretty easy easy answer. They are they are fantastic. Um, a lot of the young people that come to this program uh, in the Vauxhall Loop program face kind of adversities in normal life. Um, you know, a large majority of the young people are on free school meals, um, and people premium. So they face that as an issue. 
but they turn and, up. And what does that mean, sorry, just as a definition, a lot of people won't necessarily know what free school meals is or what pupil premium is, you know, t yeah. t tell us a little bit about, you know, that, that is a definition that, that, that you know, is, is a government definition that is supposed to demonstrate, you know, hardship, but, but yeah. what, what, what actually is the reality, is the reality of a child who is on pupil premium or, or um, free yeah. school meals? I guess it gives an insight into kind of their background and the financial status of the family. You know, they are eligible to receive free school meals because of the parents' income, um, and it's it's a good indicator for us in the kind of areas that we need to be working in, um, and that's one of the targets of the Vauxhall. But but the young people are incredible. They come and they've got a smile on their face pretty much every day, no matter how knackered they are. Um, they're willing to give us a bit of cheek, which all makes it makes our day a little bit easier. Um, but they're incredible, and they're incredibly grateful for the opportunities that they're getting. Um, that's something that for such young people to appreciate what we're putting in front of them it's just it's amazing yeah absolutely I think that that's one of the great things you can get across you know when the, the footage we showed earlier and, and, and everything is, is, is just the the sort of vitality of it you know and I know you, you, you see coaches you know coming back into the ground after after a day and you can see they're they're absolutely buzzing because you know the, 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 the charisma and, and and like the, the, the imagination of these of these young people around here is is, is, is endless and, mm -hmm. and, and you know incredibly inspiring right absolutely and I, and I think although we say the young people are, are grateful for what for what we're doing for them. I think anyone that's involved in the programme, works in the programme or volunteers in the programme, they're grateful to the young people for the experience they've gave us working on it. So yeah. yeah, I think yeah the learning the learning look very much very much the learning the learning goes both ways. Well mm. look Elliot thanks um thanks so much for joining us. We really really appreciate your time. Tell Cheers. us um the Vox Voxel loop bit more, you know, still to still to come, you know, what's the future for the Voxel Loop? Still to come, still to come. Listen, we know it's a great programme and there's a kind of plans in, in motion for the next steps for it. So keep an eye. Yeah, absolutely. And look if you're listening and you sound that sounds like a good idea and you're running a you know you run a company, you know, maybe around Vauxhall or, or somewhere it. somewhere in South London and you think that's something that you want to you want to support how would people how would people go about doing that get in touch with the foundation if you head to the foundation's website or Great. social media you'll find details so, there sorry cricket foundation on yeah. social media sorry cricket yeah. foundation website you know if you want to get involved if you want to volunteer if you're listening and you think yeah i want you know maybe that's something that, that i want to come down to one of the one of you know the a young person that i know wants to get involved with or yeah as i say if you if it's something maybe you know you're interested in supporting corporately or, or individually sorry cricket foundation.org Surrey Cricket Foundation on, on social media and uh, that's where to go to, to find everything out. Perfect. Um, Elliot, look, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, you, we just heard the, uh, the five minute bell ring. The, uh, the players are starting to um, starting to filter down the steps. Commentators will, will reappear here in a second, but for now, um, Elliot Rousen, head of the Vauxhall Loop, Surrey Cricket Foundation, thanks so much for joining us. And um, Somerset 2.31 for 8, 32 hours left in the day and um, off we go, thanks very much indeed. Welcome back to the Kia Oval, first day of the season here at least in South London. Somerset were asked to bat first this morning and they were going pretty well, very well indeed. They were 196 for one and that's when the drama started, a collapse of 7 for 20 in the middle of that session which leaves them at the T interval 231 for 8. Gregor and Pretorius are both there on 10 apiece, they've put on 15, a session where 7 wickets fell, 100 runs were added. I'm Adam Collins, with me for the first time today, the greatest cricket statistician in the world is Andrew Sampson. Hello Sam. Good day, Colin. How are you going? Couldn't be better. Beautiful day, county cricket back here in London, going delightfully well. And yes, we, we saw that huge stand for the second wicket of 178 uh, between Lamanby, who fell for an even 100, and Renshaw, who was run out for 87, which started the collapse. And from there, 
wickets falling at 196, 198, 199, three falling on to 11 than 216 which has changed the complexion of this day entirely so much now rides on the shoulders of the new Somerset captain Lewis Gregory with play set to resume in a couple of minutes from now in terms of going round the grounds today you've had your eye on a couple of bits and bobs Sam Sam Northeast is out oh out yeah first time this season first like time the old, this uh, season Bradman out he's out yes exactly um, I think Phil was busy doing the, the he's out when he was on the commentary, <laughs> that's northeast was out. 3.35, not out, and 14, not out. He made it Lords last week. so Which gave him, uh, including the, the, the 3.35 plus the 166 last year, exactly. the Lara 501. That's where, the, that's, that's where <laughs> we're going. So 166, not out last year. Yep. Sequence of 536 runs between dismissals. Wow. Where's it sit? Uh, well, this is where it gets interesting. Well, it gets interesting when we go to county championship mm -hmm. sequences because the world record is... Um, that's well, a relatively well-known number amongst people like me anyway. 709 <laughs> by a chap called Casey Ibrahim in uh, India in 1947. He made scores of 218 not out, 36 not out, 234 not out, 77 not out, and 144. Wow. But if you go to county championship games only, the overall record is actually higher than the first class record because Joe Hardstaff Jr. had a sequence of 780 county championship runs without being dismissed wow. he would have played end of that was over two seasons 1947 and 48 he would have played festival games at the end of the sequence at the end of the 47 season to break that sequence in terms of first class cricket that's why it's obviously can be higher than the first class record second is Graham Hick 645 did that include his 405 it didn't right it was a separate sequence uh, 171 not out, 69 not out, 252 not out, and 100 and 100 not out, and then 53 was his sequence. And then a chap called Fred Jakeman made 558 for North Hans in 1951, and Sam Northeast has now gone fourth on the list with 526 with this current sequence. The guy who's now fifth on the list is Sam Northeast because <laughs> he had a sequence of 525 back in 2002 when he made that 410 not out he made 105 not out the innings before the 410 so he's, he's pushed himself into fifth place well, he's in a really strong spot to add his name to a fairly prestigious list isn't he because a thousand runs by the end of May yep the last time that was achieved was Graham Hick back in 1988 That's including cool. the quadruple 100 yep. but I mean Bradman appears on that list a, a couple of times yep some greats of the game, Grace, Haywood, yep. Hammond, yep, Glenn Turner. Glenn Turner, yeah, I remember that. Here we go. First ball after T. Steele had the hot hand before the break. Bowls here, knocked into the offside by Gregory. We we had a, a contender for it a couple of years ago. David Bettingham was going. Bettingham and, and, and uh, Ben Compton. Ben Compton was robbed. He was robbed. Ben yeah, Compton exactly. was robbed. Yeah, where that tour game against New Zealand. Yeah, where he went over a thousand runs by yeah. the end of May. Yes. Everyone talks about New Zealand being the nice guys of world cricket. They, they played more than 11 in that game, which yeah. meant it wasn't well, counted as first-class status yeah. and Compton didn't get the gong. Exactly. And the team was literally called a first-class counties 11, and it wasn't first-class <laughs> because there were more than 11 players. I have a bit of an issue with that on a number of levels. Mm. So, knock down the ground, first run after tea. How often do we see limited overs games mm -hmm. where 12 play in 11? We've got that in the IPL now with your sort of whatever they call it, super, whiz-bang, sub, so on, impact yeah. player. Impact player, yeah. Yeah. Um, if it's the, those games don't lose their status, mm. why should it be that first-class cricket loses its status when using more than 11? Yeah. I mean, I, I, that's nearly been cut off in the follow-through, only for one, though. I, I, I appreciate in this situation that I suspect New Zealand had more than 11 bat and thus it, it eliminated Ooh. the but still but still there, yeah. there was a way of working that through wasn't there yeah there's kind of i mean there's varying degrees of tour matches these days quite a lot of them are more than 11 players though as for Steele, what a start to his season five for 25 last week yeah so what's he going at well, now seven for 41. yeah well we were saying earlier his last innings but like northeast got 4 for 40 in the last, right. last season as well so he's currently on what, 11 for 81 on a roll can he go again here what's impressed me by him as he completes the first over after tea 233 for 8 Somerset Pretorius on debut on 11 the captain with him on the same score 
we saw with Steele that it was his it was his change up, his wrong and mm. did so much damage yep. to the ball that he bowled out here to Tom Kyler Cadmore yep. in the game that won Surrey the championship yeah. two years ago when Kyler Cadmore was with Yorkshire. Ben Mike, another huge wrong and through the gate with yeah. him when, when Mike was playing for Yorkshire too before he went back to Grace Road. Mm. But last week against last Lancashire week, yeah. and again today, yeah. it's been with your more conventional leg break that's that's mm. hard spun, yeah. plenty of dip and earning the rewards. He did throw in a couple of nice googlies last week though. Picked up Nathan Lyon from his yep. uh, Lyon's first ball for Lancashire, caught a go. slip. Yeah. Lyon picked up his first uh, championship wicket yeah, for yeah. Lancs today. I'm not sure if he's added to that. but uh, We can have a look. But he, yeah, he bowled two overs, I think, or two or three overs, whatever it was, and uh, up at Old Trafford. Got an email in from Jack on surreybroadcast at gmail.com. He's enjoying the coverage. He's reflecting on a conversation that Daniel and I were having earlier today about trying to go to all county games in one day and what route one would take to achieve it. And he's, uh, he's given us a, a, a challenge, I suppose. He's looking at the Division 1 games that are set to be played on the 23rd of June as Clark takes up the attack. He was involved in the two wickets that turned everything. The direct hit run out of Renshaw on 87. Bit of indecision when Lamanby was on 99 and Ooh. then got... Lamanby for an even 100 leg before wicket. Got the party started for Surrey in the middle stanza. So on the 23rd of June, there are games at New Road, Edgbaston, Trentbridge, Chelmsford, Canterbury. That, that feels achievable, getting to at least one mm. ball of all of those. And there are, there are two other options that he's cited as well that relate to where Rachel Hayhoe Flint games are being played. 24 to, 24th of April, there's four, and, and there's four as well on the, on the 8th of May. So... If, if you if you were keen, there are ways of doing this. I'm sure there'll be a way of raising a few dollars for charity along the way. It tends to be with these things. That's a cheap one, yeah. The first time I came to England from South Africa in 94 for the South African tour, it's not quite the same thing, but I watched cricket in all 18 first-class counties in seven weeks. Love it. On that little tour. Was there any rarities and oddities where you had to sort of travel overnight in a coach to make it? Uh, the closest to that one was... I was at Chesterfield for Derbyshire Warwickshire. This is 94. Mm -hmm. Brian Laura, a couple, oh, yeah. of, a couple of weeks after he's had the, the 400 and the 500. And he smashed a gr pit, green pitch. Devon Malcolm bowling at 100 miles an hour. Laura smashed 100 before lunch. <laughs> he got 142 in the end. And I was there for the... Uh, so it would have been a, would have been a three-day game? Yeah, it would have been. I was planning on being there for the three days. And it finished in two days or something like that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, which, which gave me an opportunity to get up to Durham which is quite far from uh, Chesterfield. Yeah, it's not round the corner. Just one slip here. Which was the point at which I decided, no, no, I have to do all 18 counties because <laughs> I've done five, you know, I've done a whole lot earlier on and whatever. And so now I'm going to Durham and then I'll f make sure I can collect the others. And that was, I think it took me about four and a half hours to get back on about <laughs> three or four different trains. Got back off past 10 or something and then finished at six o'clock. <laughs> I've done two continents in the same playing day. Yeah, I remember that. Which was that's a good effort. Thanks to um, thanks to David Warner, really. Yeah. Two left here for Clark. Got the five four field. Two back on the leg side, Oof. driving straight out to cover. Crowd catch, pouched by Pope, who played along with the audience. No run. Where uh, Warner gave a very David Warner esque press conference when captaining the Australian T20 side that went for about half an hour. So by the time we left yeah. Auckland and finished our work, it was well after midnight. We were actually on the same flight together out to South Africa the next day, yes. which was the same day in South Africa. Yeah, we'd have been right. 11 hours behind. Yep. And we got to the tour game. Australia were playing in a place called Benoni. Yep. Squared up there. Ends the over. Maiden for Clark, 233 for eight. So some of the Australian squad flew out first thing the next morning with a few of us journos, and yeah, we went straight to the ground and yeah. managed to catch the uh, the other press conference, which was uh, Pat Cummins from memory. Fateful yeah. tour, 2018 in South Africa. Little thing called sandpaper. Well, yes, um, Australia haven't played another test match, has it? Yeah. Um, yeah, but it helps that Benoni's quite close to the airport, isn't it? That's right, yes. Where they have played quite a bit of under-19s World Cup cricket recently and yeah. a lot of the women's internationals there as well. Yeah. The second ground in Johannesburg. Yeah, they get kind of quite a lot of the, I suppose, second-tier international cricket, if it's what you want to call it. They get a lot of the African Cricket Association plays a lot of their tournaments there as well. It's the flat one from Gregory, to Gregory rather, which has just worked past Sibley at cover. On South Africa, we've got a, 
an overseas player, Miguel Pretorius, mm. who's in at the moment. Not not a huge amount known about him on yeah. the basis that he hasn't played for South Africa, but a, a fairly impressive first-class record and played for Durham last year. Yep, no, he's been around for a while. He's played for quite a few different provinces. Uh, Pretoria boy, went to Waterkloof High School, Hoor School. Hoor School Waterkloof, one of the main um, Afrikaans schools in Pretoria. Okay. Uh, but he's... He's kind of he's, he's he started off as a bowler who could bat a bit, but I think he's pretty much a genuine all-rounder these days. Although he's batting number ten today, how is he? But I mean, he averaged 47 with the bat and nine, and 23 with the ball in first-class cricket in South Africa last season. 104 fifties in mm. seven games. He had marginally more success with the bat compared with the ball in his brief stint last year in, in July with Durham. Got a couple of thirties, but only yeah. two wickets in three matches. Yeah, he's definitely better than a number 10, though. Well, there's that wrong one we're talking about yep. from Steele. That, that's been the undoing of a number of players over the years. Just about squeezed away. Gets one. One of the, one of the things they do in baseball is uh, 30 and 30. Some people try and do that, where you go to all 30 Major League Baseball parks in 30 days. Which is a good effort, get, taking a game if you, if you can do that. It's my kind of thing, I reckon. <laughs> Something I can set myself for at some stage. That'll complete the over. Three singles coming from it. 236 for eight. That'll make the score when the board ticks over. Oh, no, it doesn't. I'm, I'm one. They, they, the, the naught became a one on my screen. Come on. Oh, shout gone. Yep. Another one. Steel. Either side of T. Posing huge problems for Somerset with his wrist spin. We saw the wrong and earlier in the over. I'm going back there, Pretorius. Into the waiting gloves of folks. And that's nine down. The collapse gets yet worse for the visitors. They've lost eight for 40, all told. Yep. Pretorius gone for 12. Maybe he should be at number 10. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so a little partnership of 20 there. But uh, still pulled beautifully all season, isn't he? All season, I say. Two well, innings so far. Couldn't be starting much better than this. Yep. Five for 25 last week, three for 19 here. Spin, spin to win for Surrey. In April, when it's um, yes. not supposed to help the spinners. Well, the Kookaburra ball might be informing, you know, yeah. the, the types of uh, sides we're seeing yeah, on the park. We'll wait for a replay of this wicket as well. We can get one of those queued up. As we're seeing Sharpish here. There we go. England's incumbent off spinner making his way to the middle. Famously taking his first class wickets in England at 65, but that's neither yeah. here nor there at the <laughs> moment. Uh, bat in hand and now with a very very tidy overseas tour behind him. It's kind of interesting how they selected the spinners for that tour. Um, where they kind of, the data, as they say these days, um, showed that tall spinners do well in India. Which is why, as my understanding, they picked a relatively young and experienced um, spin bowling attack with him and Hartley. That plus social media. Plus they social they media. saw the spell that Shah Bashir bowled to Alistair Cook on mm. on the, the yep. county champ Twitter handle. Ben Stokes was scrolling through yep. and saw it. He's like, yep. you know what? India? Question mark. And uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, one thing led to another. Bowled well mm. in the in the A series or the Lion series in, in the in the UAE and, and got himself on the plane. Good on him. Yep. So still with the over spinner in the previous over to get the ninth wicket and see whether Clark can finish it off. So it feels like we're trending towards an innings break, so it gives me the chance to uh, promote the email account again. Surrey broadcast at gmail.com for your questions for Andrew Sampson. We'll open it up. What do you want to know? Oh, slapping and just getting it straight to the man at mid-off. It wasn't in complete control, Gregory, but you can see that now we've reached that point where he's going to have to go. The old four-round down the line. Yes. <laughs> A winner. And by questions for Sampson, the more obscure the better. I know Daniel Norcross enjoys yeah, throwing stuff yeah. to you on commentary <laughs> that he drums up before he gets on. This is your opportunity. Surreybroadcast at gmail.com. What's the weirdest stuff you got? Gregory, 
Fine player. Min all the way back. I want to give him the one, but he gets it out wide of long on for two. Perfect start to the over. Runs and keeping the strike as well, the captain. He's got a good average against Somerset. I mean, against Surrey, sorry. Gregory for, for, for Somerset. Averaging 86.25 before mm. this. And seven innings, three of them not outs, but uh, two hundreds included in that. Two of his four in first-class cricket, mm. where he averages 25. A couple of 50s last year. A lot of starts. We're expecting to see a, a captain who takes risks in Gregory, I think. Mm. And declining the single at this stage. It's been, it's been put to me that he's, he's the, the kind of captain who will be keen to move the game forward in that mm. kind of modern way. Yep. Adventurous declarations, giving Somerset the chance to get as many points as possible. Yep. With, with them finishing 7th, 7th and 6th in the last three years. I don't think there's yeah. expectations of them you know, yep. running the table and winning the comp. They're sort of resetting a little bit. A couple of younger players involved. Yeah, they were very close to winning a couple of times four or five years ago and then the last three seasons, as you say, not mm. quite the same as it was before. So. Well, in that run to 2021, they finished second four in five seasons. Yep. And they finished uh, in the top two six times since 2001. Mm. Sounds about right, yep. And still haven't ever won it. <laughs> it seems remarkable given yeah. the players Somerset have produced and their wonderful mm -hmm. support whenever they're playing. Two left in the over. They will take the single to deep backwards square. So one ball for Bashir to negotiate. With Gregory now into the 20s. Of course, winning a trophy last year, the Vitality Blast. Mm. Yep. Holding their nerve on finals day. Yeah, I mean, they've won, won that a few times, haven't they? Um, and, of course, the great Richards, both them and Ghana era, mm. they won quite a few one-day trophies as well, but not the yeah. championship. Must have been a, a wild time down in the <laughs> Taunton in <laughs> the late Taunton. 70s with some of those characters playing. Yep. Richards and, and Ghana and both of them, the obvious three, but our occasional colleague Vic Marks part of that too. Vic Mar Marks, the same part of all that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably watching Vic. Hello Vic. Bashir gets behind it. Well played. 2.43 for nine at the end of the over, one wicket after T. Was Pretorius who was caught behind for 12 from the bowling of Steele who's got three. Clark's got a couple, run out as well. Atkinson three, all in that run on a hat trick at one stage just before T. Yeah, and then he bowled a bouncer. Well, he had an over in between, and then he mm. bowled a bouncer, which is a little bit odd for a hat trick ball, do you think? I had my fingers crossed. I was hoping this yeah. was going to be the day I'd see one, but not just eleven seasons. Not, not, not a first class or test yeah. one. No. Yeah. Plenty of one day hat tricks, but yeah. that don't count. Yeah, not quite the same. They're quite often given rather than taken, aren't they? In one day, I was there for Finney's, which all three were caught on the boundary <laughs> exactly. at the MCG in 2014. That's a classic example. Last three balls yes. of the innings, I think it was. Yeah. <laughs> Can still finish it off here. So the field spread for Gregory, slipping close. That's lovely. That's just lovely to start. So is Surrey often not opting to play a spinner at home the last couple of years. Yep. Still making the absolute most of this opportunity. Kookaburra ball. Yep. Dan Worrell not available with that neck injury. Another one, yep. What's his recovery prognosis? Yeah, good question. We should know that. Tried to find the answer to that yesterday and <laughs> unsuccessfully, so okay. might, might ask again after this innings is complete. Although they've done very well in his absence, certainly the last couple of hours of this match. Mm. Cross the line, out towards the Galadari stand, and yep, goes all the way. Gregory, knowing this is the time to put the foot down. 249 for nine. 
So can they creep over 250 here? That's the next benchmark for Somerset. Yeah. They yeah, all count, those points. Put the tenth throw in there, was it? The yeah. shorter boundary this week? Yep, it helps. There have, been, there have been no extras in this Somerset innings, Simon uh, oh. tells us in Truro. Uh, w w our correspondent, Simon Bennett, wants to know from you, what's the yeah. highest total in first-class cricket without any extras conceded? It's very high. It's 600 and something, I think. I think a game in Australia. I'll just check it up. <laughs> I love that. Don't even need to pause to take <laughs> a beat. Oh, yeah, yeah, 600 and something. So giving it some air there, just 47 mile an hour, tempting Gregory to go across the line again. One ball left in the over. We're all playing the game here. The field come in, so this will be the chance to go over the top if he dares. No men back. Yep, they've all come in with the umbrella. Catches the call. Not to be, but they get Bashir back on strike. 249 for nine, the score. I quite like those sequences like that. Nate, what, what are you up to there? Nathan Lyon, yet to bowl a no ball in test cricket in 120 odd test matches, yep. something like that. Surely the longest, Samo. Um, Ashwin was quite close to that. Um, Swan, Graham Swan didn't bowl a no ball oh, in his right. whole career. He bowled one wide. So Lyons bowled. Uh, He's got, got another wicket to Darcy. Yeah, Lyon. <laughs> I, I did check that. Thirty-two thousand seven hundred and sixty-one deliveries in his one twenty-nine Test matches. Nathan, without overstepping. It's a good effort. Six hundred and forty-seven. Victoria against Tasmania. It's your lot. In Melbourne, in nineteen fifty-two. Okay, so the pre well, it's effect, for those Tassie. Tasmania who didn't concede the extra. Though. Oh, Tassie were bowling, were they? Yeah. Those Victoria Tasmania games from. <laughs> into all period you get some gigantic scores yep. Ponsford made a quadruple ton against them yep. I'm right in saying yep Atkinson's turn and Bashir doesn't quite get it past short fine for Dan Lawrence's position so there'll be no run and won't yet get that point for 250 one of, one of the two first class totals over a thousand both of them made by Victoria yep 1107 was against New South Wales and it was 1059 against Tasmania. It's quite a good bowling lineup for the New South Wales team as well, if I recall correctly. I think Maley might have been Maley playing. got yeah. four for 362. <laughs> <laughs> Helped to folks. Is it taken? It's not, and they're through. And it's a buy. There's that sundry we've been looking for, oh, the first of go. the innings. <laughs> And the Somerset faithful know that that's just a, an important little benchmark along the way. 250 for nine. Yeah, it's gone and ruined it all, hasn't it? They get the point for it. He's not the worst batter, though, uh, Bashir, as we saw in some of the mm. couple of the innings in the test matches. I can tell you about collapses if you're interested. When I was looking at them earlier. Oh, yeah. So seven for 20 was the... So, yeah, I mean, it was from being 196 for one. So, so collapses from a good position. Yep. Uh, I mean, if, it, if they'd carried on and it been all out for 220, it would have been pretty spectacular. In 1951, uh, at Lords, Leicestershire were 196 without loss and all out for 214. <laughs> Who did the damage? He was doing quite well to, to, to beat that. So again, we're back to not taking the singles from a Somerset perspective. Uh, three England bowlers actually took the wicket. Six for John for Alan Moss. Oh ah, yeah. Uh, uh, Johnny War, who famously had a Test bowling average of 282, mm. I think it was. I think it's just just below the bowling average of uh, Ravi Bapara. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he got two, and Fred Titmus got two. Right. So, I mean, they were following on 162 behind. Two 
two in the over to come. So mm. this time the singles milked out to deep mid-wicket. Yep. One more ball at Bashir for Atkinson. Yep. Uh, so they were 196 without loss following on. They got ahead. They were 34 ahead. So they thought they were back in the game. And um, not much later they were all out for 214. <laughs> lost by, I think, nine wickets. Another good one. Wickets. Sorry, yeah. Samo. Yeah. One for you to consider at the end of the over. In, in from Jack question for the great Samo. We often talk about bowlers running in for a long spell. Who has the longest spell? So we're looking here for... Uh, just go through. The longest... I think he's referring to... Yeah. Overs as opposed to time. Yeah. Well played by Bashir. Strike goes back to Gregory. 251 for nine. Oh, no, sorry, I misread that. Not how many overs or time, but actually run the longest running in for their spell. Uh, would it be yeah. a fast bowler or, or a long spinner's spell? That's a that's an interesting twist on it. That might be even too much <laughs> for Samson when trying well, to calculate bowler's run-ups. But yeah, I don't know You have done this for Daniel, haven't you, on TMS with how far batters have ran? Um, I think we did that with Alistair Cook. Alistair Cook, yeah. yeah. Didn't, didn't excluding really boundaries and then... We did, we, we did a calculation with Neil Manthorp once and Courtney Walsh because he... Played, didn't just play test cricket for 20 mm. years he played county cricket as well how yeah. many? I can't remember how there was a huge number of miles that he'd run in his life uh, but I can tell you the longest spell in yep. test cricket um, just getting the details here it was Narendra Hawani the Indian leg spinner more famous for taking 16 436 on test debut <laughs> but let's fight and see I'm going to try and find the match here. I like how people like you and I classify fame. Of course, he's famous for... Yeah. Here we go. So, still to Gregory. Another one. Out again towards that short boundary. That's gone much further. Great contact off the bat. Maybe 20 rows back. Up towards that Lock Laker balcony they have up there. Six runs for Somerset. 200 and... 57 for 9 becomes the score and expect to see more of that through the over. Yep. That would have been a 6 on this side of the field as well. The other one might not have been. Anyway, it was at this ground actually. Uh, the longest spell in 1990. Narendra Wani playing for India. Bowled a 59 over spell. Wow. Literally bowled the whole day one of the days. <laughs> and a bit either side of it. Have that. 1 for 137. I mean, you often hear that, don't you? Oh, we'll just plug that bowler in, he'll go yeah. all day. Well, literally, in, in literally. that case. We've got one for 137, yeah. Will he go again? Doesn't get the chance to flatter from steel and flat batted for another dot. I saw one of your favourite categories came up during the winter. Yes. Which one? Yeah, I know you've got a few little quirks. Yep. Yorked him there. Uh, mm. First class cricketers taking the field after the age of 50. Oh, yes. We saw a, or we saw a Sri Lankan. Uh, Indica de Sodom. Having not played for the better part of 20 years, mm. I think it was, or maybe 2008 or thereabouts. Yeah, it was about 15, 15 10, years. 12, 15 years, yeah. Played okay on his return as well, I yeah, saw. He got a 62, I think it was, yeah. when he first match back you'll be eligible for that over 50s world cup i think that's later in the year yeah. the over 50s world cup mm. it was, exactly it was, when it was one in south africa two years ago england are defending the ashes this year at home i played mm. okay. it played it went on tour last week with a few of the guys who were in the england over 50 squad yeah they were telling me all about it veterans okay. cricket's becoming a massive thing but yes the uh, um, there'll be a little bit of crossover from guys who, who are playing Rare as it is to see a player but over the age of 50. Yep, yeah, I mean, that over 50s in South Africa World Cup was in 2020. It got cancelled due to COVID right. halfway through. So Bashir, one ball to deal with here. So the field spread on the leg side. Samson's going to make way after this delivery. Yeah, well played again, doing his job. Thank you, Andrew. That's okay. been fun as always. Yes. We'll do it again tomorrow. Phil Walker jumping in to join me for a bit. So since T, 
when they resumed at 231 for eight. Somerset lost their ninth wicket. Five runs beyond that at 236. That was Pretorius caught behind from the bowling of Steele for 12, his third wicket of the afternoon. Built quite the collapse earlier, seven for 20, and now Surrey just need to finish this off, get the pads on and, and go to work. It was extraordinary, really, uh, but it's all added up to a compelling day's cricket. It's yeah. been a joy, really, and we still have a fair few overs to go. The light is set fair, and so we'll see most of those 25 bowled. Uh, it's going to be an interesting last hour and a half. Mm. And helped away. Good batting from Gregory. Doesn't quite reach the rope, though. I thought that was destined to make it, but Sibley had other ideas diving across to his right in front of the members. Yeah, it was hard to pinpoint what, what went wrong. I think it's fair to, to give a lot of credit to Surrey, really. They, they showed their straps, didn't they, after mm. lunch? And they'd have had a chat at lunch and said, you know, this is not really how we go about things here. It showed some real gumption, I thought, on the way back. So, all men back. Wants a piece of that short ball, but no contact. Of course, the hinge point was that run out. Yeah. The two of them going serenely along. But in the build-up to that 100 as well, it was beautiful innings by Tom Lamaby, but there was that sense that he just got slightly away from himself. He played so, so self-contained and in himself up until lunch and... He just didn't quite look the same after lunch. Yeah, we're they had, they we're sorry, Adam, we're in this holding sorry. pattern now, aren't we? This, this classic late order holding pattern where the, the only man left of any note. I don't know whether it's a twist or stick. Show Bashir can hold a bat, though. Yep. He's doughty in, in India here and there. Yes, a lot of heavy lifting for the England bowlers with the bat over in India. Different times. Down to fine leg, no run there. It's interesting uh, comment. Well, they're always interesting, aren't they, out of that England dressing room. But from your mate Ollie Robinson a couple mm. of weeks ago, who, uh, who observed that, yeah, well, we lost 4-1. But, I mean, you know, it kind of felt like we could have won 3-2. thought that was cheeky. That made head. Guess where that made headlines? Oh, down in Australia, by any chance? <laughs> yeah, that's um, that ongoing thread from last summer. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I think there's something to the, the belief that they felt far more in it than four one. But when you go back and analyse the cards one by one, <laughs> they have they have royally botched two of them, for sure. You and, know, and you don't get to say oh, we we could have won it when you've had a, a calamitous day or two in there, as was the case in the third and fourth test matches. Yeah, you are stretching not just credulity, but also. <laughs> Uh, the devotion of your fans <laughs> when you're essentially saying the scores is just a mere state of mind. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, bless them, they did. They threw two away. They certainly threw, threw that second test away and mm. they were up in the fourth. Yeah. But it could have easily been this and it could have easily been that. It doesn't really wash in international cricket. Well, it didn't until a year ago. Know where that went, but again, being the penultimate ball of the, the over, they'll they'll scamper through. I think he's been excellent today, as Gus Atkinson, because he was he was down on pace, yeah, luck, mood, in the first session. I think he had some one or two problems with his run up. He looked a bit staccato, a bit stuttery through that. Did you notice that? Well, yeah, the run up. Certainly after lunch, different story. I, I know it's easy just to go on that number on the bottom of the screen, right? The, the pace, but you're just not conditioned to watching Atkinson bowl in the 70s. Yeah. as he was consistently but after lunch whatever it was uh, might watch a bit of vision as they do now when they have their breaks run up was back and that lovely approach we're seeing here and when he bowls like this it is so effortless and natural mm. uh, but again you have three good wickets you can pick up three on another day and be fortuitous but two nick offs the ball to get rid of Banton was a key moment got that moving off the straight a little break back through the gap, through the gate, inside edge, good catch by Ben Folks, and then to nick off James Root, and then to bounce out Casey Aldridge from his first delivery as well. So it's really impressive, and he's just kept on going 17 overs now. Adam Collins has, has headed off for a, 
for a rest. And it's Daniel. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm all right. I've, I've had a lovely day, Daniel. It's been... Oh, it's been great to be back. Yeah. There's always a sense of, of you know, joy and all of that. But you, you, we haven't had to force it. It's just been compellingly good cricket, hasn't it? Yes. And, and the, the crowd has been... When you think it's still a work day, down here in the big smoke, it's been an outstanding number that have turned up today, absorbed by the fair. And it's been a good game. Been good afternoon's cricket. But this is becoming irksome for Surrey here, and I suppose, I'm sorry, I, I, I went down to see my cousin who's here, along with Phil Long. Oh, yeah. BBC scorer, who trekked around India for mm. about 16 weeks this winter, because he went out for the um, went out for the World Cup. He worked with us last year, of course, didn't he, on a few games. And uh, so, I... Um, So, was I, gonna say, I guess I wanted to ask you if you've been talking about Surrey's tactics here. Well, I've just come on, Dan. I've just come on. I, because, look, let me just give you the, the gripe that every cricket fan will be giving right now and shouting at the TV. Not every, but most. No, he hasn't quite got hold of that. And oh, it's been put down. It's been put down out in the deep. <sighs> Jamie Smith, of all people, usually very safe hands out at deep mid wicket. It yeah. went quite flat. Might have come out of some spectators here, maybe, but you'd expect him to take that. And that'll just add to Surrey's frustrations. And you knew full well, Daniel, that's what, what was going to follow. Easy pickings. Yeah, he catches that 19 out of 20. And this is going to start to sting just a little bit. So to, talk me through the, the irksomeness of these tactics. Well, uh, what, what, what is it that gets under your skin? Well, here? I'll tell you what gets under my skin. Because at 196 for one, Somerset proceeded to lose eight wickets for 40 runs, seven of them for 20. Many of them very fine batters to conventional fields. And a lot of people will be saying to themselves, well, surely if you just keep on doing the same thing you were doing, you force Gregory to force the pace. You know, Bashir's at the other end. At the moment, to farm the strike, Gregory knows exactly what he's got to do. He's got to not get out for four balls, and then he's got to manufacture a single. If at some point within those four balls he gets a ball he thinks he can deposit for six, he can. There's a whole load of modes of dismissal that are now very unlikely because there are so many fielders out on the boundary. And then, who knows, this could be, a, this could be three here if they run it. Or, now, is somebody going to let that ball go over the boundary? They do. Just, just shepherded by Atkinson over the rope. It's been, a, it's been such a lovely orthodox day's cricket, hasn't it? And now, and now it turns into this. Yeah. Yes. And, it, and the frustration is, I think, that you sort of think, well, how does this game play out if Surrey keep on bowling the same way, fielding the same way? Because it isn't just that the fielders are out. The, the result of that is that as a bowler, you know you're not, you're not really bowling for a wicket for four balls in a way. I mean, you, you'll say to your interview, you certainly are, but you're not because you haven't got your slip in. You, you've not got the same field, not got the same intensity for four balls at the over. Now, as it's turned out, they've got Bashir on strike. But you're putting all your eggs in the, in the basket of getting Bashir out or getting Gregory out caught in the deep. Yep. <laughs> Which they'll argue they should have done the last over and Jamie Smith will be ruining that drop catch. But So 31 now, these two have put on. Bashir's contributed none of them. Uh, he's only faced six balls. He's only well. faced six balls. So Lewis Gregory's... You can't question the tactics from his side. No, no certainly not but from it's, Gregory's side. No. But the frustration is that it's, it's just how telegraphed it is, really. And, yeah. and you're absolutely right. Change the dynamic of the bowler's attitude. I was very impressed, though, with the, with the bye that was taken to the keeper. Mm. 
I thought that was a very smart bit of cricket. Liked it a lot. I also don't think that Shoaib Bashir is quite the rabbit that he's being made out. You know, he'd batted for quite a while with Ben Folks in India in a partnership that went on forever. Indeed, that's what, not Adam, many runs. That's what Adam and I were just saying. He, he's not a... He's a ten and a half. Gets in behind the ball, doesn't he? Yep. And also, he's early in his career. We don't, we don't really know where he might get to. But, you know, he's not flinching or running away or... He's not like the three of my favourite batters could all play for Bangladesh in the same game before long. The great Ebadot Hussein, who averaged 0 0.75 after 20 odd test matches before he got a very annoying 21 not out. He also bowled one of the best spells in recent years against didn't he? New Zealand. Against New Zealand, yeah. It was unfortunate because at that time he averaged 0 0.75 with the bat and 70 with the ball. <laughs> Now, Bashir is getting into the act. Are they going to come back? They might get back for three here. They will, and that is the worst possible outcome. Now, I don't know whether that was in the script from Bashir, because the idea has been for Gregory to have shield Bashir from the strike, but he's decided to have a go at one, and he gets it over the infield, picks up three, which brings Gregory back on strike. And this partnership continues to cause Surrey some annoyance to 70 for nine now um, so we've got Abadot saying we've got the wonderful coloured Mahmood mm -hmm. but there's a new man Rana Rana let me tell you something about Rana I don't know if this might have passed you by there's every chance he decided not to take the single despite Bashir having walloped three <laughs> of his previous ball. Surrey will be cranky with this Daniel. Well and they've every right to be but 236 for nine turns into 270 for nine with some rather inauspicious cricket really and Burns is trying to change it around two balls to go with this over Atkinson's got through a lot of work today. This is his 18th over as well. They've shared it around. Jordan Clark, 17 as well. Jamie Overton, 12. Kimar Roach, just 10 overs in two spells either side of lunch. That's very well fielded at square leg. It went very hard into the ground, but now with one ball left in the over, you do get the feeling that actually Surrey wouldn't mind Cam Steele having an over at Bashir. Yeah, that's a good shout. The leggy against the number 11. He's bowled really nicely, Cameron Steele again. Really coming into his own in this side. Again, two good wickets. Beauty to get going. not ideally bold that because that was an easy controlled almost paddle pull for Gregory which means he'll keep strike at the end of the over new ball becomes available in six overs but Surrey wouldn't have wanted to be thinking about that some time ago 271 for nine yes I want to bring to your attention yes the Rana. terrific word of work of Nahid Rana could possibly be the worst batter in the first class history 22 innings 11 runs his average has gone below the 0 0.84 that it was when I was first informed of this all 11 runs came in his first four innings <laughs> yes I have heard about this Yazrana namesake has told me about this in his last 18 innings he's naught for 13 of 76 balls <laughs> right so he stuck around what do you think <laughs> 76 balls for 13. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> it's five and a bit in innings, I'll take it. It's five and a bit in innings. Mm. It, is the, it is the record for the most number of consecutive noughts. Mark Robinson, I ah, believe, yes. had the most before that. 12. Heroically bad, wasn't he? Heroically Robinson. bad. Mm. Here we go. Cam Steele to Gregory's still not going to take the single. Um, but that takes some doing, doesn't it? 
18 consecutive innings without scoring a run. It's harder. Out 13 times in that time. It's harder to continue only getting naught, isn't it? Much harder. Because, you know, you go it off the glove, you nick one through the slips. Mm. Oh, I say. <laughs> that's another one that's been deposited into the crowd. Gregory Moose, the threshold of a half century. His average against Surrey is stratospheric. 98 and a half Lewis Gregory averages. Yeah, it's a cracking shot because it's not really short. Maybe half a yard short of the ideal length for Cameron Steele, but he stayed back on it and he's connected with this one. He rather clothed the one in the previous over and it was dropped. But this will sting, Dan. Well, it, well, it, it, it will and it is. It's yep. stinging. Yeah, and it changes... The dynamic. Change the dynamic of this mm. session as well, because now, as and when that tenth does fall, there'll be a spring in their step. And they'll take the easy single, and that's 50 for Lewis Gregory. It's been a fine knock from him. Take nothing away from Lewis Gregory. He has been dropped. Uh, Jamie Smith out at deep mid-wicket, but amidst all of that, he's deposited a fair few balls into the crowd, usually over at deep mid-wicket. And he's contributed handsomely to a last wicket partnership of 42, which Shoaib Bashir has scored just the three and has faced just the nine balls. But now, Surrey fans have their wish. They've got steel bowling to Bashir. Imagine he's going to give it a bit of flight here. couple of balls to get his man. And it's been dragged down, it's been beautifully cut away. Pigeons will fly. And they'll make it back for a couple of runs. Just slightly didn't get his length right there, Cam Steele. And that's again part of the problem because you get a little anxious because you don't know how many op opportunities you're going to get to bowl at the number 11. And then you can just lose your shape a touch. Oh! Well, he survives, does Bashir. It was a, a bit of a Shannon Gabriel, having a go at the sixth ball ah. the over, but he's got away with it. Some news for you here from Andrew Sampson. Khalid Ahmed had 13 runs at an average of one in his first 20 test innings, but ruined it he did, didn't he, by making 22 against Sri Lanka at Silet last month. That would have raised his average to nearly three. Not quite, but nearly. Have we had the email from John, who's a Surrey fan? He claims the only one to be living in Tbilisi. <laughs> there is some cricket here. South Asian medical students playing in the parks. His question is, what is the highest score by a team in which no player scored 100? I can tell him it's Surrey. Oh, it's six. Three, not too long ago. Do, 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 let, let you do 600 it. and plenty odd. And Keep going. Surrey. Jamie Ocean made 90 odd. Yeah, there were three consecutive scores in the Three 90s. Ah, oh, Jamie Smith? And Ollie Pope, I think. OK. I was guessing from the second one on. Yeah. But 670 for Six nine. 672? 672 for nine. Beautiful. It was beautiful. And it, th it smashed the previous highest score. It came up because of the test match. Because it wasn't the highest score in a test match without a, anyone getting 100 recently broken. Oh. By Sri Lanka, was it? Yeah. Yes, it was, yeah. 500 and plenty. Yeah. Yes, I, got, I got ridiculously excited over that 6.72 for nine. You can imagine, can't you, Andrew? Yeah. <laughs> Something's got to give here, Dan. Again, just picks out the fielder on the boundary. Again, they don't take the run. I'm starting to wonder just how much communication, though, there is going on between Gregory and Bashir, because Bashir... I wouldn't say he's backing first, up. No, well the, first, well, the first ball he's faced on each occasion, the, the last two times he's got on strike, he's aimed a big old whack. One, he got three, when he picked up two. 6.71 for nine. There you go, John. 609 was the previous highest score. By Namibia against Uganda in the I Cup oh wow 
What was even more delicious about Surrey 671 for nine was that everyone got double figures. Oh, oh yeah. Hey, mm, isn't that nice? Fish. Yeah. What about the lowest score is when everyone's got double figures? Oh, yes. Off you go, maestro. <laughs> <laughs> Now, two balls left in the over, so the field comes in. In four balls, four overs time, if a wicket hasn't fallen, Phil Walker, are you taking the new ball? Yeah. And are you then actually bringing the field in and trying to get someone nicked off? Do you get Kemar Roach in and go, come on then, Lewis? I, th I think ball. you're doing it properly, and I think Sho Bashir is thinking, I don't mind chancing my arm against the leggy to the short boundary on the leg side. I don't know, he might get out, but he might also land a couple. But Jordan Clark running in from the pavilion end with a new new one, that's a different proposition, so I would take it as soon as possible. I would, but skippers can sometimes think, oh, a new ball can go further. Indeed, indeed. But a, but a number 11, a kind of barnacle-like player mm -hmm. like he is here, you just want to knock him off the side of the ship as quick as you can, and the best way of doing that is to blow him away with, with a bit of pace. What? It's a beautiful metaphor. We, we applaud you for the metaphors. <laughs> the barnacle on the side of the ship, the best way to, to blow him away with a bit of pace. Well, that's how you get rid of barnacles. I'm actually. already a minute over my, my slot, Hal, Daniel. So. Harold Larwood was, was brought on by yeah. many, many a shipbuilding company. That is me done. That is you done. For the day. There is one more ball left in the over, so it's up to you. For uh. <laughs> I'm going to hang around for it. Good for you. You're playing football tonight? I might be, Daniel. Yeah, I might be. I don't think our co-commentator, Adam Collins, is especially happy about the fact that half of his commentary team are mm -hmm. heading off to the Black Prince up the road in Vauxhall for a kickabout. The thing is, though, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a rather sacred affair. It Six till there. seven, yeah. Power League up the road, Black Prince. It's very, very special. I understand. Nothing gets in the way. Well, that's nicely bowled, the end of the over. That means that uh, Bashir will be on strike. Phil Walker can go and play football. <laughs> Cameron Ponsonby can come and join me for the next half an hour. And Surrey is still searching for that 10th wicket. The highest test total is about 100. Well, it's now 531, Sri Lanka against Bangladesh. A chattagram. It used to be 524 for nine that India got against New Zealand in Kampur in 76. But staggeringly... The highest score in that innings was 70. So were there a lot of extras? Or did everybody get between 50 and 70 pretty much? I mean, you divide 524 by 11 and you're not a long way off 50. The highest score of 70? That's amazing. Gavin Ponsby is alongside me. Hello, Daniel. Hello. So, what have you made of Surrey's tactics here? I mean... Uh, they're not just Surrey's tactics. You see them time and time and time and time again. But I just wonder if it's time to call time on the tactics. I'm interested to know how you can work out whether this kind of modern way of going about taking wickets 9 and 10, where you spread the field, all nine fielders out on the boundary to the set batter, and then bringing everyone in for the final two to number 11, if there's any way of proving whether it works or not. So I remember asking Crickviz... Um, if there was a way of seeing the average score for the ninth and 10th wicket kind of in history, and I got told to kind of Enjoy. be more entertaining and stop being so boring. So had I not been told that, I would have been able to give you an answer for yes. I thought they were a, a, a successful tactic that was worth pursuing. But unfortunately, I cannot. Well, it's not been successful so far. 44 have been added for the 10th wicket since Surrey were crawling all over Somerset. But she is looking slightly crabby. There's been a, a, a day of extremes where we're kind of ending up in a, yeah. a middling kind of mediocrity where one, we're kind of neither here nor there. One partnership of 178, one of 44 and not much else. That's nicely cut away by Bashir. He's going to get a single. He's going to get off strike again. Which means that Gregory will now have license. The field will spread, rather like an inflating lung. <laughs> and 
and uh, Gregory can either decide whether he wants to go after the first couple and drop kick him into the stands he's not going to take that run but with two balls left surely the field comes in now doesn't it I mean they're getting their steps in the fielders here give them that but no field's been kept out for the fifth ball I think Cameron still might just have tried to remind Rory Burns that here we and go now we have one fielder coming in Jamie Smith the lung exhales two three many more I guess you could make the case that had the catch been taken we shake hands on the kind of I can't quite remember what the partnership was standing at at that point whether the About 30 odd then you'd ask yourself yeah but when when you've taken lots seven of wickets. wickets for 20 runs why not take one for zero yeah I know it's not always down to you field has come in Gregory defends what's he going to do with the last ball there's still a deep mid wicket out what they have been good at is just nicking that single through backward point just backward of square on the offside Atkinson's about 10 yards behind square for that little dab they are going to tempt Lewis Gregory here they're bringing in that final fielder just off the, the boundary out. they're keeping the slip in I think we might see Gregory taking the bait here well came down the wicket we couldn't find the gap so end of the over Bashir will be on strike 77 gone three more till the new ball becomes available 281 for nine and this is Lewis Gregory going berserk to find 50s brought up a lot of this biffing has been very much leg side anyone fielding in the Galadari stand will have had their eyes peeled that was a four that he struck the ball after being dropped by Jamie Smith in the outfield not everything on the leg side that's a nice little back cut that was a monster hit out into the deep so 50 for Lewis Gregory two other Somerset players today have got past the 50 Tom Lamanby went on to get 100 exactly 100 Matt Renshaw was with him for much of that time was then run out as Lamanby was trying to get his 100th run Lamanby did get that 100th run was then promptly out himself collapse ensued change of bowler so Gus Atkinson's coming out of the attack Jamie Overton who's a man not shy of the short pitch ball I think this coming into bowl. are we going to see that by again if, you, if this is a short ball be on your toes no nope, in the channel and Gregory absolutely is backing up as far as he can at the moment keeping one eye on Overton just to make sure there's no risk of being run out at the non-striker's end oh, and you seldom see that in a four-day game do you? It's, it's, it's fairly de rigueur these days in white ball but um, oh, not with a red ball now's the chance for Sari to, to put, ground put their flag in, the <laughs> flag in the ground get this, oh, get this innings over with Bashir on strike that's a beautiful shot a square drive for four from Bashir this is what I mean. He might not be the mug that he's been made out to be. He's moved to 10. I think we're entering the kind of territory of comedy runs here. You heard that cheer as Bashir split the field. You look over to the Somerset balcony in the pavilion. They greatly enjoyed this cover drive from Bashir. Not quite textbook. The back foot did, did drop away bit. to the leg side. And I would be able to tell him how to bat as uh, the commentator upstairs. But we should show a bit of respect. He's got more test runs <laughs> than anybody in this box. And he's pretty much got in behind that. But these are joyous runs for Somerset. From the disappointment of having thrown away such a good position, yeah. to be able to drag yourself back into a place where, well, realistically, you'd still want to be north of 300 and 350 and so on. But to have a score on the board, to have not thrown away the game completely, which they risked to do at 216 for 8, I believe it was. I'm going to raise the spirits of the, of the watching crowd in a moment. Again, very nicely defended by Bashir. He's got plenty of time to play it. Um, at Edgebaston, 
Warwickshire, they're still going strong, you know, against a lot of people's tip to be Surrey's closest contenders this year. Durham. Warwickshire are 405 for one after 80 overs. It's a lot of runs. Over. It's a lot of runs. Alex Davis still there, 184, not out. Will Rhodes with him. Oh, seeking out the Yorker. But again, well played by Bashir. I mean, I've got to say, in this over, he's defended off the middle of the bat, three balls, square driven one and left another. Batting very nicely. I do think for, for the kind of criticism or the observations of Surrey's tactics, I think Rory Burns has got his kind of bowling combinations fitting neatly here and that he'll be, he's able to get two over a two over burst out of Overton before that new ball comes back and then you can, can go back to your original new ball pairing of Jordan Clark and Kiamar Roach. That's what I would expect to see happening. Well, well played Shah Bashir. He's played out that, that over. It wasn't a maiden, of course, because of that four, the second ball, but he looked unhurried. He looked absolutely fine and comfortable. So I'm going to take you round the rest of the counties. Told you about Edge Baston, 405 for one, Warwickshire against Durham. Nottinghamshire, 270 for six against Worcestershire at Trent Bridge. In the second division, Northampton, 252 for two against Middlesex. Plenty of runs being scored in April, as is so often the case, as we have established. Emilio Gay still there, 140 not out. Leicestershire against Sussex, again in the second division, 273 for six. Hampshire against Lancashire. Hampshire are 267 for five. Yorkshire have been bowled out for 326. Sean Massoud made 140. Matt Milnes and Johnny Tattersall each with half centuries. Dan Moriarty's in the Yorkshire side there, formerly Surrey man, of course. Oh, that's it. That finishes it. Another catch for JB Overton in the slips. Another wicket for Cameron Steele. What a start to the season he's having. Extraordinary. And Somerset have been bowled out for 285. Annoying 49 run last wicket partnership. But on balance, you'd have to say Surrey will be delighted with their efforts today. Having put Somerset into bat, didn't look like a great decision at 196 for one. But since then, those last nine wickets have gone for 89. The last one there, Lewis Gregory going for a big old swipe. The ball just turning, getting the outside edge. Sharp catch for Jamie Overton. And, well, not many wickets have been going down the spin for Surrey of late. But Cameron Steele, Dan Lawrence, still with four for 50 to go with his five for. He's picked up nine for the season already. Four for Dan Lawrence last week. That's 13 of the 19 wickets to fall to bowlers. Oh, you the season they've gone to spinners. You see the card there. Cam Steele leading the way with four for 50. Gus Atkinson, three for 57. He was on a hat-trick at one point. Jordan Clark, two for 59. The other wicket to fall was the run-out of Matt Renshaw. When that happened, suddenly the floodgates burst open. Dan Lawrence bowled seven overs done for 35. Jamie Overton, 13 overs done for 45. Kimar Roach, 10 overs, none for 37. But you'd have to say, honours even, Surrey just ahead. 285 for Surrey to have bowled out Somerset with what will now be, I think it goes slightly beyond awkward. Now, 15 overs, it's enough time for batters to sort of get their eye in, back properly. It's not like going out for a sort of seven over stretch, is it? You, we take two off between innings, so. There'll be 15 overs left in the day. Sorry, I have the opportunity to make a little inroad in that with the weather set fair for the next couple of days. Their plan will be simple. It's how Somerset fair with this Kookaburra ball. We shall wait and find out. Part of me wonders whether whether both teams are almost equally unhappy in this instance. We're both of walking off saying potentially oh, the glass half empty response is what could have been. If you're sorry. Well, we were, Somerset were 216 for eight. We haven't managed to wrap up that innings. They've got more than we'd have liked. I still think you'd be happier in the Surrey camp because you have bowled out the opposition for less than 300. That has to be a net positive. And on the first day. And on the first day, of so course. So you're ahead of the game. And on the flip side, 
if you're Somerset, you kind of go, how have we managed to get in this position? How are we happy? How are we kind of relieved to only be on a 280, having been in such a strong position? I think for all of fan Cameron Steele's fantastic second contribution with the ball this season and Gus Atkinson's burst that kind of ripped through the middle order, I think you have to look at Jordan Clark as kind of the man who changed the tone of the day with that run out of Matt Renshaw and then two overs later to take Lamanby out LBW. That changed the complexion of the match, or the match of the day, potentially both, Daniel. Well, he was heavily involved, wasn't he, in the first three wickets to fall. And um, it was when those two, won, those two went, wickets went quickly at 196 and 198, Somerset couldn't regroup. You'd say, though, that you scored 285, you're in the game. Yes. You'd also say if you bowl a sign out for 285, you're very much in the game. So... It's almost That's like we've got three quarters of the match left Ooh. to go. And also, I think the other thing we know is that the average runs per wicket in April is 32.5. So they're unders. They're unders by 40 runs. They'd take that. Mm. Well, sorry. It's, apart from anything else, it's been roller coaster fun, hasn't it? It has been very. I mean, Surrey's attack today. Yes. Let's talk about it a little bit. Because okay. It be they began, they got a little bit of movement on a fresh wicket. Um, Somerset I thought batted very well then Surrey strained for a full length hoping the ball was going to swing a little perhaps help Lamanby and Renshaw get going and then the, everything went remarkably flat until the run out when the run out happened suddenly Surrey sprung into action and that that is the sign of a very good team isn't it you could tell with the body language actually when that run out happened it wasn't a sort of few it was a yep here we're we in there I mean you, you only need to look as far as the fact sorry have bowled out a team on day one they opened the bowling with Kimo Roach and Kimo Roach has none for you mm. see the, the depths of that team the fact that they've done they've bowled out an opposition with their second spinner taking four for with their big opening bowler having the direct hit run out that's going to change the complexion of the day I think sorry will be very content as you say to well as we now know, the par score in April is 325. Mm. Um, a word for the Somerset batters, because obviously Renshaw and Lamanby impressed, but Lamanby especially, I mean, he started quite scratchily. Remember, he played a missed at one just before he got his first run, off his 17th ball. He looked very uncertain, and then once he got a couple off the middle, he looked absolutely sumptuous. He, he batted absolutely beautifully, and he had such a simplicity in his technique. I think Phil Walker said something earlier today, which... I really resonated with me at least where he was saying he is one of the few players that actually makes the game look easy so often we say kind of that the game looks easy when actually players are doing things that you, ca you cannot kind of wrap your brain around and hey people have interesting newfangled techniques but Lamanby was incredibly still at the crease especially when Surrey Seamus came round the wicket to him and angled the ball in he had such a clarity of thought process and plan where if it was just short he waited on the back foot and would guide the ball down to kind of deep third and backward point and as soon as the bowlers got too full he drove very strongly down the ground cricket is just such a cruel game however where somehow you can be the top scorer of your in your team and be blamed for everyone else's failures and his was his was the call that broke that partnership that ran out his partner was that his fault I mean Renshaw was ball watching a little bit I've there, always, I kind of felt I've, I've never really understood this criticism when people ball watch what, what else are you kind of meant to be watching take the call wait for the call Lamanby's the but man who's going to call don't ball. worry about where the ball is he'll, he'll, he'll tell you whether to run he, or not it's gone in front of square but he has to worry where the ball has gone because it's no, been hit no. back past the stumps he doesn't, he doesn't have to worry Lamanby will say run oh, or okay. not run yeah but the ball was hit quite straight, Daniel. He has to get back into his ground. I understand. I understand what you're saying. But I think Lamanby, if Lamanby wasn't on 99, I doubt he calls him through for that single. I think there's the excitement of get reaching three figures there. Mm -hmm. And then the failure or the, the inability. Inability is probably the wrong word. But the fact he then didn't go on any further, that was the turning point of the match. And so I'd love to know how Lamanby's feeling at the moment because I can imagine he's gone, blimey, I've started the season really well. I feel in fantastic touch at the moment whoops Surrey though had pace and with a kookaburra on yep. a fairly I mean it, it, there was something in the pitch but it, it's pretty blameless and that was the difference wasn't it Atkinson in that middle order was, was fiery and that two in two was yep. an important moment because once you get that collapse happening it can create the panic that goes through the entire dressing room and 
if you've got a ball that's not particularly responsive on a pitch that's not particularly responsive, you've got to have a point of difference. And Surrey had that today. Overton didn't get any wickets, but he bowled with a lot of fire and hostility. And Atkinson picked up three, which is, you know, gives you an idea of the sort of all round, all the bases that can be covered by Surrey. They've bowled with a Kookaburra ball now on two occasions. Yep. And they've kept both, both their opponents to under 300. I think if you wanted to take a kind of overarching conclusion from a very small moment, the manner of Atkinson's wicket of Casey Aldridge's first ball, that short ball, mm. the reason why the Kookaburra is in play is because the idea of building skill sets that suited to Australia and overseas tours. The reason why Atkinson is in, in England contention has been pretty much guaranteed a test debut by Brendan McCullum this summer is he's able to provide that point of difference with the Kookaburra, with the Kookaburra ball. I can imagine someone a high-ranking member of the ECB rubbing their hands together with glee saying I told you all this is what we were doing it for I can also say you really want to run away at the I'm moment I'm so running away that's fine I'm running away for the next for the next eight overs it's going to be Adam Collins and I think yes I think yes it's no, yes, Cam, 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 oh Cam stay Cam, oh, I'm, Cam, Cam, I'm staying Cam, Cam, Cam stay 285 all out sorry are now going to get their opportunity to respond with Burns and Sibley who will have Overton opening the bowling, Rory Burns and Dom Sibley. The ever-present opening partnership of Surrey will see them through this final 15-over spell if we manage to squeeze all the overs in. Somerset look to be starting with three slips, a point kind of wide mid-off, fairly standard field. We also have a leg slip to completely counter with exactly mm. what I just said. So we have a 5-4, a leg slip, a fine leg, two fielders either side of the wicket in front of square. I imagine we'll be seeing Overton bowling quite straight at R Rory Burns, trying to slide one across him, bring those slips into play, but also if he gets a bit straighter, have the leg slip. Basically trying to get him out. Rock and roll, here we go, Overton in. And Burns in that, in that fashion that we've seen for many years now, just opening up the onside and prodding it to mid-wicket, there won't be a run there. I like this, the, uh, the man round the corner, bowling to a plan right away. Overton back in the side, played the university game a couple of weeks ago. It's a little bit of soreness in that back that was operated on over the winter, so they went the cautious, cautious route last week, didn't play down at Canterbury. And that quite interesting, oh, quick single. Yep, good running. Sibley calling his captain through, they're away. But, but Craig Overton... I mean, I must admit, I'm, I'm not completely au fait with the, the T20 market. You're far, far more in touch with these things than me. But my sense is that he, with his wider skill set, he, he would have picked yep. up a deal or two around the place. But instead of doing that, he, he elected to get his back treated in a way that should lengthen his career. So a bit of short-term pain for the, the longer-term gain. It'll be the packed cordon for Sibley. High score last year was 140. A magnificent chase of 500 plus down at Kent. Of course. The Sibley Marathon man. They built the innings around him. After returning home at the start of 2023. I don't think I'm divulging any state secrets here. I remember talking to one of the members of the Surrey kind of backroom staff team they said if you remember that Kent chase it was incredibly hot at that time mm. and, and Sibley had batted through to, for, for England for Surrey to chase 500 and my inside source says he remembers walking into the dressing room and seeing a, a still padded up Dominic Sibley sweating away with, a, with an ice cream as a reward <laughs> I think it was a fine image of satisfaction he loves a long shift doesn't he Sibley 73 mile an hour for Overton for those who are into these types of things. I love the fact that we have that in real time now on the Surrey stream this year. Surrey broadcast at gmail.com to stay in touch with us as we take you through to the close of play. First day of county championship cricket at the Keir Oval for 2024. Great to have your feedback throughout the course of the day. Surrey cricket in the social media places as well. Shot nicely placed. That's Sibley 101. Doesn't quite make it to the rope. Excellent little relay effort there. A return for a couple. Three without loss. 
No, it's fantastic fielding. I, I did grimace as I can't quite make out the fielder from here. Dives head first. I'm worried for his shoulders. I'm worried for his neck. I'm worried for his head going towards that JM <laughs> Finn advertising. All in the short sleeve jumpers, the Somerset fielders. Ends the over here. Three without loss. I'm in one of those as well, Cam. I was going to ask about that. I was trying to. I haven't actually been able to see the logo on the front. Costume change. I've, I've just Good went into my bag of tricks out the back. We've got a. What's an, it's a it's a Surrey adjacent tour that we're going on to Dublin next week. We've got the Oval Dream Boys trip. Right, it's okay. Our first overseas tour, sort of Sunday pub team energy. But we're off to Dublin and dug in there. I've got. It's a very smart piece. Yeah, of it kit. is a nice bit of kit. Maybe Jake can pull it up on the camera. We'll see. But it's a, got, the, got the sort of the B logo. I was going to ask. By that I mean an actual B. I knew this was easy, so I'm going to get it on the camera. This is free advertising, this. <laughs> well, my director's ignoring me, so that's fine. <laughs> so it's a moot point. Doesn't want a bar of it. But I promise you, it's a very nice bit of kit. The purple and gold colours and the and the B in the middle, Oval Dream Boys or Dream Bees. Does the B uh, represent anything in particular? Not especially. We just sort of thought the Bees will work when the club was started, I guess a few, a few seasons ago now. It was kind of a COVID project, actually. So around the wicket here to start. The captain Gregory, after making a really important contribution, a 50 partnership of 59 for the final wicket. But yes, remember when in COVID we were allowed in? I think it was 2020, wasn't it, to have six people outside to do it. Yes, there was that you know the, the graduated scale of what you were permitted to do, and there was nets every Wednesday night. And in addition to that, separate to that, there was a conversation about starting a, a social team. I remember it being a time of great social angst. If I, I was doing a university course at the time, and you could go out and you could go to the local pub and have a drink, you had to decide which five other people <laughs> you wish to sit with and talk to. And it was a moment of you'd sit down, and you'd see someone across the table, you go, oh, God, not them. This will, this will, you celebrate joyously. <laughs> this will give my age away and maybe yeah. date you as well, but it's kind of like when you had your MySpace top six friends. Oh, I had that on Bebo. Bebo Two of the great mate. social platforms. Yep, yep. I'll throw ICQ at you, you won't have a clue what I'm talking about. Predated all of them. Good from Burns early on here, right at the middle of the bats and mid-wicket. He's been busy so far in there. But yes, having to yeah, pick and choose who your mates were that night. We had one of those pub nights, one of those pub occasions for my birthday in that year. It might have been, must have been the, the 2020 year. But we had to go through a similar kind of process. But uh, this is not meant to be a name drop. It's purely what happens. Well, let's. Well, I'll, I'll be. Just, you can I'll decide whether it's a name drop that, yeah. or not. Okay, that's fine. So, with a few colleagues, there was a test match going on at Southampton in that sort of behind closed door setting. Played again, Burns. Really good. Straight away through mid wicket. He's very likes it most. And Gregory feeding him there on that line, around the middle stump, and Burns making the very most of it. First boundary of the reply, seven without loss, the hosts after bowling out Somerset for 285. Good shot to the short side of the ground as well, playing the percentages. But yes, there was. I, I was staying with my in-laws near uh, near Arundel. That's not the name drop, is it? It, well, it, it relates to okay. it. Okay. Because there were some county games played at Arundel that year. Nice defensive stroke. And two of the colleagues I was with um, were making a podcast at the time with a bloke who was playing at Arundel. Sam Northeast, who made the triple ton last week, of so he course, became yes. part of the birthday party. Very nice, too. quite nicely. Lovely fella. What a treat for, for Sam Northeast to be part of Adam Collins' <laughs> birthday celebrations. <laughs> I'm sure that's how he remembers the night as well. <laughs> I think they got they got rolled in a couple of days when he was playing for Hampshire. He's actually playing against Derbyshire at the moment, so I don't mean to name drop, but I uh, went to Adam Collins' birthday party. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's ago. right. He's in the dressing room saying exactly that. Not that you know, 400 runs he's already made this season. Ooh, good leave, tight leave. Ends the over, seven for none. Gregory building and pace through the course of that over. But yes, we've got the, the three-day trip to the no, four-day trip to Dublin next week for the Oval Dream. I don't think we'll get on. I've got, a, I've got, I'm, I'm a little bit fearful. Is that the worst thing in the world? No, not really. Yeah. I've already been on one cricket trip uh, this this uh, this spring, and we got on all the games last week in Gibraltar, which was terrific fun. But the uh, I, I don't know whether the climate in Gibraltar will quite marry up with Dublin in April. I'm, I suspect not. <laughs> but I, I'm, not, I'm not a meteorologist, so I, I don't know these things for sure. It's great to be back out there this time of year. Here's the big boy Oberton. Hmm. 
Set you watch to it, Sibley, fifth stump line, he's shouldering arms. We had a very, uh, everyone playing to kind of type at the moment. I don't think we've seen anything out of the ordinary from, mm. from either Burns or Sibley. We've seen Burns very strong off his pads. He was shaping, he was taking Garden off stump when Overton was coming in over the wicket to him. He still has it, his, his kind of mechanics and I don't know what quite the right word is, quirks, mm. of kind of slightly lesser than a couple of years ago. Overton's last game before pulling out with that back problem last year was that was against Surrey. Surrey's excellent performance down at Taunton where they won by 10 wickets. It was perhaps their most clinical uh, away from home win uh, where they, uh, it, was, it, was, it was Laws, wasn't it? Laws bowled beautifully in the first innings and Overton made 70 not out but didn't take any wickets and that ended a, a campaign that he'd want to put behind him I suppose, although his figures weren't too bad but not really pressing up into England selection again where he was a few years ago. It's not that long ago that he, he was in a lot of those England squads, wasn't he? played Ashes cricket in 17-18. Yes. Steve Smith with his first test wicket under lights at Adelaide Oval. Played again in, in 2019. Conversation now more about his twin and where he might feature in this year's T20 World Cup. I think he's managed to kind of, with Stokes dropping out, he's kind of accelerated into this potential kind of all-rounder role mm. in, the, in the West Indies. I think if I was Sam Curran or Liam Livingston, I might have a, a, a word to say about that being about being leapfrogged. Curran was player of the was he player of the World Cup or player of the World Cup final? Maybe he was player both. of the World Cup. Yeah. He was player of the World Cup and got himself a very uh, handsome payout at the IPL as a result, <laughs> which I think fair <laughs> enough, really. Cash in. I think it's very interesting seeing both Dom Sibley and Rory Burns. We're slightly going over old ground here in terms of England's former opening pair now opening together at Surrey. I'm kind of what defines you as a batter both now have techniques that are far simpler for want of the easiest word than previously but when they're attracting the criticism and finding their finding kind of scores hard to come by their way of being more themselves was to kind of exaggerate those movements so for Tom Sibley used to kind of trigger with his hands quite a lot for Rory Burns he has that very distinctive look across the mid wicket and they both, I think, went back to Neil Stewart, or both came back to Surrey and really kind of toned it down and simplified things to be where they are now. Shot again. Organised from Sibley. To the long rope. In front of the bed to stand, will be hauled in. But a couple of times now, Sibley's got on top of the bounce, played through the line. Started well, joins Burns on five. Cam's jumping out with one ball left in the over. No, the over's complete. I'm not actually, Adam. No, I was sorry, I, I'm ahead of the scoreboard. Finished. I was going to sledge you, you can sledge me back. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with the board. They'll, they'll, they'll work on that. Yasrana's going to replace you and, and take us. I think he's going to do a marathon stint in the colour chair and get us all the way to stumps. See you later, Cam. You playing football, Cam? No, 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 no. no. Okay. A few of our colleagues have been out early to play a game of football. Hello, Yaz. Hello, Adam. I think when we were together last on, it was it was going pretty well for Somerset with the bat, Lamanby and Renshaw doing their thing. Game feels a lot different now. It's been a day of shifts and spurts. Earlier in the day, I mentioned an interview that Alex Stewart did with Sky before the start of the mm -hmm. season, and one of the things that he mentioned that I thought was quite interesting was he was really digging up how expansively. Dom Sibley was playing over the winter um, and I, I'm not saying we're going to see Sibley looking to go aerial over mid on but Stuart was really bigging up that, that Sibley had had a very focused winter worked hard on his game I think he actually had a quietly very good and very effective first season back at Surrey last mm -hmm. year I think he averaged around 40 yep but um, you know, Surrey have, have, have generally described their 2023 campaign as, despite winning it for the second year in a row, as, as good but not great. There wasn't an outstanding batter. Jamie Smith had a decent season. Sibley had a decent season. Ollie Pope was very good, but he didn't play that much. Obviously, was, a, was was with England and then was injured later in the summer. And that's borne out in the numbers, really, isn't it? Lots of, sort of 
solid performances, very even across the board with the top six or top seven. You look through it and you've got Smith led the runs with 7.29 at 43, Folk 6.60 at 44, Sibley 6.45 at 40, Burns 5.15 at 26, a centralist season for the captain. Abbott, the all-rounder, 456 at 46. So 16 players in the group scored at least one half century and six got hundreds. So, but oftentimes it was the lower order who managed to get them that extra batting point here and there, which is so important in a title, in a title run. But yes, no, no one there with an average with a with a five in front of it, and so conditioned to Burns being the backbone of the side last year. Yes, the 500 runs, but middling returns compared to what what they've they've had in the, the decade prior. And I think, especially with the type of players, sorry, having the middle order, Sibley's value is someone who who just gets through so many deliveries, mm. sort of accentuates the qualities of those who come below him in the order. Um, there are a lot of players there. Who, Brilliant, some of the best in the country. A lot of guys either in the England setup or knocking on the door who you really don't want to be facing the brand new ball. And Sibley is so good at getting through it. And also, on the theme of sorry being good but not great last year, both of the two Cookerborough rounds in 2023 were home games that they didn't actually win. Yep. Um, Lancashire, I remember in the Lancashire game, Will Williams, the night watchman. At Lancashire batted for four and a half hours or something not scored 400 and I think that was a game where Knotts had a couple of injuries in their bowling attack and sorry still couldn't get over the line so actually seeing them take the last eight wickets for 100 or so runs today is very encouraging ends Gregory's maiden 10 for none after four so they trail by 275 the home team I think so often with Surrey it's that it's that depth thing isn't it Know, even at the moment with Will Jacks, Sam Curran, although acknowledging that Curran doesn't often feature in the in the Red Bull team. Jacks does, though. Then uh, someone like Reese Topley, who in another world would be playing Red Bull cricket, but that's that's not, not viable. Even someone like, let's say, Dan Moriarty, who, who left Surrey for greater opportunities when there simply was no room for a spinner. They were so chock full of all-rounders and seamers who could bat bringing someone back like Kemo Roach for a fourth stint at the club Dan Worrell who's chose, chosen to make Surrey his home the last few years they've got that leg gully for a miscue there in that direction but Burns working it nicely along the carpet and Cam Steele, his performances in the first two weeks of the season are going to yeah. give them even further, further more selection headaches in the next few rounds. I've been really impressed by him. Sorry, I haven't used him that much over the last couple of years, but he's really impressed when he has played. Obviously got 100 at the start of last season against Lancashire, five wickets last week, and a four for again today. I was saying to a couple of colleagues downstairs that there's a bit of Yassir Shah in, in Cam Steele in, in, in the energy it is run up and follow through. Good comparison. Again, Sibley happy to take on any opportunity at the moment. Batting with some real, real vigour inside the line there and putting it away. Moves to 90 second boundary. Kind of reinforcing your point from before and what Alex Stewart said in the pre-season that this is Sibley who's trying to Maybe bat in a slightly higher gear. But you're right, I mean, it'll be interesting with how this all plays out for Steele with the configuration of the side when they're all fit and firing. Kent away in their next game. And Hampshire at home, that'll be a, that'll be a blockbuster, it always is. And we'll be back to the Duke's ball by that stage, won't we? And then we've got uh, Warwickshire visiting the Oval in the second week of May. Then off, oh sorry, Worcestershire are coming here as well. So back to back home games, running through that stretch in the middle of May. I think there's three home games in four weeks. Now, we know last year at home, Surrey were very reluctant to play a frontline spinner in favor of the four, four and a half quicks and, and Will Jacks balancing the attack. But he's not about. Yeah. So maybe still makes himself undroppable, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, 
it's been easy to make the point of the last couple of years, oh, sorry, don't play a specialist spinner. But actually, they really rate the, the off spin of, of Will Jacks. Mm, Will Jacks mm. played a very big part in their title win in 2022. Played less last year. Um, and spin played, I, th- I think, played less a role, partly because of the season that Jordan Clark and Tom Laws had. In that, sorry, you obviously value multifaceted cricketers. And those those two guys give the side extra batting depth and they're so reliable coming on with that older ball effectively performing the role that, that sometimes spinners do um, so there's less space for a spinner to really show their worth they were so successful with that side composition mm. there's there no real reason to veer away from it Past the inside edge. That's a pace as well from Oban to finish, although the clock doesn't show it. 76.7. Five from the over, 15 for none. But it's good carry. We'll see the replay yeah. again here. Um, obviously, over to the first, first class game in nine or so months. And he's not taken a wicket yet, as you see just how close that was to right. Sibley's outside edge. But he's, at, he's, he's, bold, he's charging in at good pace. The ball's carrying at good height to James Rue behind the stumps just on that pull shot that, that Dom Sibley played not necess- necessarily a shot you associate Sibley playing that early in his innings you see the impact straight away as soon as he plays that shot Lewis Gregory takes out full slip man goes into leg side and you hear England play, say this quite a lot but if you play if you're more expansive early in your innings you get rid of catches mm. and you sort of earn the right to have fewer catches behind the bat and that, that's what playing a few more shots early, early in your innings can do. I've always enjoyed the other side of that with Stokes' captaincy from a, when he's fielding, when they're fielding, that doesn't matter how many boundaries they go for, they always seem to keep the four slips in early on. Mm. I mean, four slips is typically a luxury, but for Stokes, it's standard. Doesn't seem to mind if the runs flow. I wonder how that will evolve this year in third year of McCullum Stokes together and a bit of chat about that in the media about what might be next what's the next stage for Stokes as a leader yeah it's a really good question I'm not sure how, how you read it but my take from the India series was that they were broadly fine in the field mm-hmm. given the bowlers they had their disposal given that Jack Leach only played that first test and even in that first test picked up an injury so early in it I thought they did a pretty good job of, of taking wickets. I know that Indy didn't have Virat Kohli and there were a couple of inexperienced players in that top six, no Rishabh Pant as well. But I thought they did a pretty good job in the field to, to prize out wickets throughout. It's an excellent delivery. Yeah, superb from Gregory. Gregory. Making him play down that off stump line and just enough seam, mov- seam movement away. We'll see it again here. Burns with that nod to mid-wicket then. And it, if you want to be harsh, you could say he could shoulder arms at the last moment there, but it's where the ball's pitching from Gregory mm. that, that makes that tough. Doesn't carry. Third slip, but again well bowled. It feels like what England are trying to do now is what they've done quite a bit over the years, Think thinking about winning in Australia, which isn't unreasonable. It's good to have sort of long, medium to long-term goals. And in Test cricket terms, a couple of winters away is, is long-term. But hoping to get enough Test cricket into Tongue, mm. possibly Fisher, certainly Potts, maybe Cass, Atkinson, who we've already seen in operation today. There's a group of four or five they want to have and maybe Mark Wood's still going. I hope Mark Wood's still going. Had a really good series in Australia in 21-22. Case by case, all those players you mentioned are, are really interesting. Uh, Wood, for example, he's contracted with his central contract. It's a three-year deal. Yep. That takes us past that Ashes series, but he'll also <laughs> be 36 the, the month mm. of, of that fifth test match. Very few bowlers who hit 90, 92... 94 mile per hour play or capable of hitting those speeds at that age so it'll be fascinating to see what happens to him Tonga thought was excellent last summer mm. but has, has struggled to, to remain fit since 
ends the maiden, 15 for none. Bryden Cars has got a two-year deal. Uh, he's, he's unlikely to be involved in the T20 stuff in, in the near future. Be interesting to see if, if he's involved. He's got a low-key, very decent batting record as well, actually, which, which, will, which I'm sure will come into it. Chris Wokes was England's player of the series the last time they played at home, but was left out of the of the following tour. Doesn't have a great record in Australia. You've got Sam Cook on the outside, who's got this ridiculous record for Essex over a really long period of time. Impresses with the Cookerborough ball, but there are so many names there, and England only have six Test matches this summer. I'm quite interested in in how the Cook storyline plays out. It's a great shot. Yeah really is from Sibley again wanting to put pressure on the fielding team his third boundary but all of them have been forceful and if you wanted to be critical of Sibley before it's that he allows pressure to build at his end well not not this afternoon not so far 13 for him 19 for none for Surrey good start yeah even when Dom Sibley had success with England you felt that he was reluctant to play that many shots until he was well into his innings but here we've seen a variety of uh, boundary options already. He's moved on to 13, sorry, 19 for Norton, the seventh over. As he let one, as he lets that one go by, I think it's also important to reiterate just how important this little passage of play before Stumps is. That Kookaburra ball, we think generally, if you look at the scores around the grounds today, quite a few early wickets fell first thing this morning, but then there's a really dry period in the middle as a uh, the balls became less active as it were and it was a pretty good day for batting around the ground so if, so if I can get through this little period that would be significant Just back to Cook briefly I'll, I'll be making way soon I'm pretty sure Daniel Norcross in for me at the end of this over I mean England play maybe not quite half their test matches in England but about half, they played six this summer it was, it was, uh, it was six last summer as well it does rather emphasise the point to me that you want bowlers who can do well in England as well and I know that I'm not disputing the credentials of anyone we ran through before but we've seen how successful Anderson's been broad too Wokes as well Wokes player of the series Cook does feel perfectly positioned to get at least a look in in one of those spots not saying it's a, a sure thing that he'll succeed but the, the body of evidence the sample size is considerable it's all been in Division 1 averaging 17 since 2018 that was his bad year, air quotes, he averaged 24, I think, from memory in 2018. Did it with the Kookaburra ball. Now, sure, it, it may not be as effective at his pace in Australia. OK, fine. But it, it's a horses for courses thing, right? It might be that he can play a huge role at home. And he may not be rapid, but you seldom need to be if, if you get it absolutely bang on. Uh, in this part of the world 100% and also England have a winter coming up uh, that is a pretty good test uh, for an English bowler overseas New Zealand quite often the pitches there are, are pretty flat yep. it'll be pretty high scoring there Pakistan we saw how flat it was in 2022 and I think English cricket sometimes make the mistakes of just, of just writing off players at a certain speed at succeeding in, in certain parts of the world I'll let you pick up this conversation with Daniel Norcross. Yes, with Surrey reaching 19 for none after seven. Burns six, Sibley looking good on 13. They trailed by 266 after bowling out Somerset for 285 earlier today. Lamanby top scoring with 100. Yes, Rana, leaving it with you. Daniel Norcross to take you through to the close. Yeah, I was talking to Mark Butcher on the Wisdom podcast the other day about Sam yes. Cook, and the comparison he made was with Vernon Philander. Vernon Philander operated in the low 80s, he wasn't particularly tall, but he was someone who was still able to have considerable success pretty much everywhere he went, and including in Australia. So it's not impossible for bowlers who operate in the low 80s and aren't six foot four to have success in Australia, as Adam Collins is replaced by Daniel Norcross. I am with news from Edgebaston. It's not a wicket, folks. It's a double hundred for Alex Davis and Warwickshire are a mammoth 444 for one. They're going to get maximum batting points there, which isn't easy in this day and age. And here's a little curiosity. Because they'll be coming up to 96 overs there. Tomorrow will be day six 
of Durham's County Championship campaign, they could conceivably not get a bonus point until at least day seven. Mm. That's quite that's quite unusual. And Pretorius, we're having a little look here at Pretorius because he's new to me, is he new to you? I know that he played for Durham last year. But have you seen him much? Not not seen a lot of him, no. I have not, so this is a new bowler for me to get my teeth into. Burly, I think one would say. He looked quite intentful with the bat earlier on. Now this could be tight. Oh, that it hit that hit directly. I think Burns would have been in trouble there. He almost went on the shot. It's a nice shot into the offside, just to the right of the cover fielder. It's one of those where I think the call is based on the shot rather than where the ball's actually gone. As we look at the slow-mo replay here, I think that is yeah. out if he hit. But it's quite a wayward throw in the end. In fairness, Fielder was slightly off balance, having to twist and throw almost back behind himself. But Burns survives. Sorry, make it to 20. On Pretorius, he's, he's not played international cricket, but he's been part of the South Africa A setup a few times. So he's obviously, and that's, <laughs> that is a hard attack to get into the South Africa one. So another great shot from Sibley. That is a beauty, isn't it? Threw extra cover all the way for four. It's not a shot that people, I, I say, associate perhaps with Dominic Sibley. They sort of think of his lakeside play, but he's played a couple of lovely cover drives today. He looks in nice touch at the moment. Looking like what Alex Stewart said about Dom Sibley's winter was bang on. What did Alex Stewart say about Dom Sibley's winter? That he had been more expansive and had been really working on that um, and, it, and it looked like that would be the way he, he'd go about this season. And I was saying to Adam, you know, he, I actually think he had a really good 2023. Uh, maybe he didn't have the the raw numbers to suggest it, you know, it wasn't quite his the 2019 season that got him in the England side when he was at Warwickshire, but it was a really effective season for his team. I bet it's a sort of season I think if you asked his teammates. Oh, lovely on drive, couldn't quite get it past the field. A good sprawling stop at mid on, end of the over 24 without loss. Surrey going along comfortably enough with seven overs remaining in the day. Yeah, I think it was the sort of season, if you asked the Surrey players, what did you think of Dom Sibley's season, they'd say that was, that was he played an almighty role for their side. It's so valuable with the players that Surrey have in their middle order to have someone who so reliably gets through the new ball. And especially in, the, in this, these kookaburra rounds where generally the more I see the kookaburra ball, I, I think it does, just does quite a lot less for a lot shorter than the Dukes. I mean, it does enough for about 20 overs, and then it does next to nothing. Yeah, I'm not even sure it was, if it was 20 today um, when, when, when Surrey bowled with it. But here we are again, another sign of, of, of spin early. We saw it with Surrey. Dan Lawrence came on to bowl very early in the Somerset innings, and Shoa Bashir, of course, didn't play last week. Into the attack for the first time in the 2024 County Championship season. And he has a left-hander to bowl at as well, and this after... Extraordinary rise to fame after the the India series. He reminds my wife of a crochet needle. I can see what she means. And what really impressed, I think, watching Shah Bashir at length as we did during that test series was actually his command and control of mm. line and length for someone with so little experience was very encouraging I thought he was comfortably England's best first inning spinner obviously Leach only played one game but I thought you know, that one day where he bowled a 30 over spell it was control action on the ball when the pitch wasn't doing much I think the pitches were a fair bit flatter than England anticipated Interesting use of the feet there from Burns. Couldn't beat the fielder, but shows a bit of positive, aggressive intent. 
I'm also fascinated to see how it goes this season because his selection was remarkable not only because of how young he was but because of how little professional cricket that he played. You know, he, he probably came close to doubling the number of professional overs he bowled in mm -hmm. those three test matches in India. Formerly of this parish as well, of course. Yes. Yes, Surrey was not allowed to forget that throughout the test mm. series. <laughs> Another Guildford graduate, yes. When Surrey play there in their uh, Metro Bank trophy games, you get to see all the, the parade of first class and test cricketers that have come from that club. It's very impressive. It's not quite the Empire Club in Barbados, which has, I think, 14 test players, but the capital has four knights of the realm. <laughs> Which is quite something. So I was lucky enough to be in Barbados for the 2022 test match there. And my thought as I was coming into land was how has this place that is so small produced so many great cricketers? It's incredible, as, as, you're land, as you're landing, mm. you're like, this is a small place. It has a population of Wandsworth. Um, wow. And when I think about the test cricketers that Wandsworth has produced, I'm thinking David Smith, born in Ballam, formerly of Surrey, tall left-hander. Maybe Gus Atkinson in a few months' time. Maybe Gus Atkinson, yep, yep. It's not many. It's a beautiful shot from Sibley. Timing and placement. It was a little short, yes. But it wasn't by any means a long hop. But he's trusting the pitch. He's trusting the ball as well. You can almost sense that there's a flick in his mindset rather than it being survival first he's proactively searching for opportunities to put pressure back on the bowlers and again only three slips attacking shot followed by a field change nip back sharply but I think he might have a bit of height there judging from the way Dom Sibley is rubbing his left leg I think that might have been going over the top he's a tall man as well Pretorius not to heap too much pressure on Pretorius, but it's quite interesting looking at... I find it very interesting looking at how where teams recruit, where, where they see we could do with an overseas. And in 2023, Matt Henry was so good for, for some average, something like 15 with the ball in the championship. Peter Siddle also had a pretty good summer when he was around. And they identified Will Sutherland, um, the Australian who's, who's yet to play test cricket. He's uh, 24 years old bowling all-rounder, seam bowling all-rounder who had an excellent Sheffield Shield campaign. They got him in but he's no longer available so Pretorius was signed not that long ago as Sutherland's replacement. Again, I think height's the issue there but again, another one that's jagged back so Still a bit in this pitch and in this ball. It's come back off the seam. Yeah, it's coming quite a long way. But if you have a look at where Sibley's standing, he's, he's got his back foot arguably in front of the crease. who have a better angle from here. Yes, it is. Too high, surely. making Sibley play and he's bringing him forward does Surrey have a night watcher lined up do you think and if so in this lineup, who is it you imagine it'd be Tom Laws if he were playing but he's not in the side Atkinson doesn't feel like a natural night watcher Overton certainly doesn't the edge it didn't carry so testing over that from Pretorius after being hit for that initial boundary but Sibley survives Surrey 28 without loss just have five overs to get through this evening and there will be thoughts of that here because they'll know that with the ball 15 overs old they might have a testing hour in the morning and then they would hope that on what is forecast to be a nice warm day 
conditions for batting could be as good as at any time in this match. One your question about Night Watchman, I don't think Kimo Roach is a candidate either. I wonder if Jordan Clark might be a, a sort of Chris Wokes like Night Watchman. Ooh, I was going to say Cam Steele, but yeah, mm. Jordan Clark, yeah, not a bad call. I, I remember whenever Chris Wokes did the job for England, I always thought that he viewed that as an opportunity to just score runs, uh, more, more of a promotion than anything else. A man who obviously mm. once batted three for England in a 50 over World Cup. So Bashir continues. So far, he's not bowled a single loose delivery, has he? Every no. single ball has been on the spot, on a round off stump with a slip in place, a short leg. That one just goes on with the arm that brings the inside edge into play. A natural spin would take it towards the slip. Just to give you an idea of the rest of the field, I'm conscious we've got quite a narrow angle here. So mid on and mid off. Quite deeply set, but he's saving one for the firm push. Extra cover and a mid wicket in the ring. That's gone fine. So Burns will pick up a couple. There's a deep backwards square. It's a long old boundary away towards the Harleyford Road side, Archbishop Tennyson's sort side. Watching him, him live, my, my first impressions are that he, he is quicker than you normally see Bashir, yeah. than, than, a, than a finger spinner in, in county cricket. Yet at the same time, he does have flight. Yeah. He's quite tall, isn't he, for, a, for an offy. Hmm. And he also has that variation. <laughs> well, my thought throughout that India tour is that Rob Key deserved less and less credit the more that Bashir bowled the more we saw of him I thought well, a player with these with these skills and if you've seen that closely in, the, in those camps they had before they selected the tour and they were with him for a week and a half it wasn't easy it wasn't a, a, a difficult selection yeah, yeah. Well, I suppose the bravery comes from the inexperience mm. and the, the numbers. They didn't have great numbers coming into that test series. They basically had like an X-Factor style boot camp. They basically picked every spinner who did decently last season in the county championship under a certain age. And it wasn't far off a shootout for, <laughs> for selection, right? There was that game against Afghanistan A where Bashir took six for not many in that game and they were eye-catching wickets as well beating right-handers through the gate with balls that spun sharply so who else was out there then for that loads uh, we're talking Dan Moriarty as well I'm not sure he was actually but uh, I guess he didn't play that much no last summer but Josh DeCarys from, from, from Middlesex was there the Parkinson's Callum Parkinson was there uh Jack Carson from, from Sussex. He's quite excited by Jack Carson. I know Stephen Finn speaks highly of him. Similarly tall, probably not quite as tall as Bashir, but taller than most finger spinners. Yeah, Callum Parkinson went on that Lions tour to India in January, February. Just under four overs now remain in the day's play for Surrey to cement their position. They've been under the pump twice today, really. One for a long period of time, the Lamb and Beat Renshaw partnership, the highest second wicket partnership for Somerset at the Oval. And then a 10 wicket partnership of 49 that was irksome for Surrey. Marvellous for Somerset. But on either side of that, Surrey's bowling has been immaculate. And it was noticeable, wasn't it? Got a kookaburra ball, four wickets to leg spin, three wickets to express pace. Well, you might say nine, uh, five wickets rather, with the two to Jordan Clark, who today, on our speed gun, and we have a speed gun this year, was clocking 87 miles an hour, in excess of 87 miles an hour. The quickest of Surrey's bowlers, I think, today. According to the speed gun, if Jordan's listening, you've got you've got that. You, you can uh, 
wave that fact in front of the likes of Kimar, Jamie Overton. I think 87 is our fastest ball today. 87, maybe we touched 88. Jamie Overton, once he got going, we was touching similar speeds. And I'm not sure he quite got up to 87, but certainly 85, 86. That's nicely played by Burns. Pick up another single. Steady start from right. Pretorius. It is. Looking dangerous, getting a bit of nip away from Burns and into Sibley. The nip sort of left, didn't it? After, as you say, after about 25 overs or so, 20, 20 overs. And that's what Surrey will be keeping their eye on. But just coming back to that point, you know, sides have struggled to take wickets with this Kookaburra. Essex bowled out knots for 80 in the last innings there, but I, I didn't see the footage of that, so I'm not quite sure. Pitcher is misbehaving. Sam Cook has had the ball on a string. But if you've got leg spin and you've got pace, you've basically got an Australian bowling lineup, haven't you? For a Kookaburra ball, it's kind of ideal. And Cameron Steele was, again, really impressive today. Yep. Excellent against Lancashire, but it's, it, he's landing it, isn't he? I uh, mean, this is no part-time leg spin, this is front line. I compared him to Yasir Shah, not in terms of what's necessarily coming out of the hand, but in the action, mm. in the run-up and in the follow-through. He's got a very deliberate follow-through. You can tell that it, his momentum is, is on, on the way, and then he sort of goes through again once he's delivered the ball. And he bowls at good pace. As you say, n not many loose deliveries. And genuinely turns it. If you look at the first two wickets in particular, against good players, he's creating wicket-taking opportunities. Yep, it's a lovely ball to get rid of Overton. Drifted onto leg stump, hit middle and off. Genuine edge. Jamie Overton, that's it. Well, he's he's picked up quite a few of those catches, hasn't he? Now off Cameron Steele this season. He might be the leading catcher in the county championship. Three overs to go in the day, so I will take you round the grounds before we finish up. So, Warwickshire. I've still got 13 balls to survive if you can call it survival, they're 486 for one. <laughs> Alex Davis, 223 not out. Will Rhodes, 59 not out. You would say they're in a very strong position there. Nottinghamshire with one ball left in the day, a 303 for six against Worcestershire. Hampshire. 2.99 for six, couple of overs left to be bowled there. Dawson unbeaten on 58. And I'm delighted to say that Matt Critchley has made his 100. 101 not out he is for Essex against Kent at Chelmsford. 414 for six. Essex, There's 10 balls left. Oh, now that was close to mid-wicket. It was in the air. In the anti-penultimate over of the day, Dom Sibley decides to use his feet and loft the ball through mid-wicket for four. That is something that I don't think Dom Sibley did a lot of in 2023. We are two and a half overs away from stumps. We've been talking about how crucial that is, partly because of what the Kookaburra does later on and here he is taking on mid on off the 15th last ball of the day yes I wasn't expecting that it's part of the reason I was going through the county scores <laughs> to be honest with you <laughs> so it shows how much I know of Dom Sibley he's played very well this evening so far but I don't want to put the mockers on him oh he's gone again but can't beat mid on this time. Two overs to go in the day, 37 without loss. So Essex 418 for six into the second division. Glamorgan made 237. 
with a career best seven for 65 for Alex Thompson. Derbyshire, though, have lost a wicket early. There's plenty of overs left in the day there. They, they had a bit of rain, or, or at least maybe a damp outfield. Lewis Rees has been bowled by Harris for a duck. So they're two for one, with, I think, in theory, about another 12 overs to be bowled there. Gloucestershire have lost a second wicket in reply to Yorkshire's 326. They're 19 for two from 13 ponderous overs. Matt Fisher and Ben Code with the wickets. So that's nicely tucked around the corner for another single. Leicestershire, who have been having quite a decent last few seasons. 325 for eight against Sussex, who are one of probably three teams, would you say, tipped for promotion alongside Yorkshire, perhaps, and maybe Middlesex. Yeah, York, Yorkshire, Sussex, I'd say. York, Sussex have struggled to take 20 wickets over the last couple of years. They've got a good batting line-up, obviously, with Pajara. Pajara in as an overseas again. You've got Jaden Seals, who I think has been injured quite a lot recently, but he's one of the most exciting young bowlers around. Him as an overseas, Ollie Robinson potentially playing five of the first seven games. Yeah, I, I think Sussex are in with a shout as well. Robinson not playing this game. I think that's part of the ECB directive for essentially contracted players generally only playing five of the first seven rounds. So we saw Gus Atkinson not involved last week, Zach Crawley not involved for the first two weeks. I think the ECB have left it up to the players right. as, as to when they have that break well this wouldn't be a bad game place it's relatively warm this week next week getting a bit chilly again Emilio Gay is 165 not out for North Hans against Middlesex it stumps there at Wanted Road 311 for three North Hans so poor old Middlesex have taken Seven wickets say, this season. I was going to say a few really long days in the field for Middlesex already. Nine hundred. I want to say nine hundred and thirty-one for seven. I think they're they're looking at at the moment. They're really quite good bowling attack as well. Ethan Bamber, mm. Ryan Higgins, Toby Ronan Jones, Tom Helm. Oh, that's shot. a lovely shot. Straight back past the bowler, and that is the new look Dom Sibley. We've seen. Plenty of astute aggression from him today. Yeah, again, Pretorius errs slightly full and Sibley tries confidently down the ground. That's a great sign, isn't it? Because he's he's latching onto the bad ball in a way that perhaps towards the back end of his first stint with England, he, he didn't really he's looking to capitalise on loose deliveries I think we forget with Sibley that because he started so young at Surrey <laughs> got that double hundred against Yorkshire when he was still a schoolboy and because he's already had a fairly significant England career and it's now been quite a long time since he played for England and he's an opening bat you sort of forget that he's only 28 he's the same age as Andrew Strauss was when he made his first of 100 test caps wow and you know that is one of the more remarkable yeah. stats that, isn't it <laughs> 100 test caps from the age of 28. And, you know, it feels like Sibley's England days are a long time ago, but for a lot of opening batters don't peak until their early 30s. And he's obviously tweaked with his game, not just this winter, but in the years gone by. Players constantly evolve, and we're only 14 overs into this innings. But this is a new Dom Sibley. I don't think we'd see him really take on the bowling this late in a day too often last season last over of the day so whoever was padded up as night watcher can now take them all off because if a wicket falls the players will troop off sorry we'll of course be hoping the wicket does not fall and they can get through to the close unscathed It's been a great fight back from the champions at 196 for one on a 
cloudless sky, it was a warm Lamanby and Renshaw looked in complete control. And suddenly, seven for 20. That run out of uh, Matt Renshaw when, when Lamby was on, on 99, very clearly the turning point of the day. But you've got to capitalise, haven't you? And people say this about the champion sides and also about sides who haven't aren't quite there which is you can't afford to have a session quite as bad as Somerset had in that afternoon and it wasn't really the whole session it's got a hundred runs in the session but it was it was the last hour and a quarter when they scored 35 runs but contrived to lose eight wickets So one ball remains for the first day of County Championship action at the Keir Oval for season 2024, the 124th season of County Championship cricket at the Oval. Hmm. Contrary to popular opinion, I was not here in 1890 for the first iteration. I wish I had been. Thanks to Tom Richardson. George Lowen, I'd have loved that. Last ball of the day. Easily defended by Rory Burns. He and Dominic Sibley can go back to the safe harbour of the dressing room. A shake of the hand from Sibley. And the deficit has been reduced to 243. Somerset have been bowled out today for 285. Surrey won the toss. They put Somerset in. It looked like a baffling decision. When Somerset were 196 for one, and everyone was saying, really, with a kookaburra ball? Yeah, so ye of little faith, the champions, the champions for a very good reason. And they fought back in style. Four wickets for Cameron Steele, he took four for 50. Gus Atkinson was on a hatching at one stage, three for 57. Jordan Clark, who was key to turning Surrey's fortunes around, firstly with a initial wicket then a great run out and then a marvellous LBW bowled at real pace fiery pace today as did Gus Atkinson the leg spin of steel complementing them both so Somerset collapsed from 196 for one to 239 for nine there was a last wicket partnership of 49 Lewis Gregory scoring 50 a very accomplished 50 pumping the ball into the Galadari stand a few times Matt Renshaw had made 87 Tom Lamaby exactly 100 but the turning point was when he tried to get his 100th run the first time Jordan Clark fumbled initially and then fired a throw in at the striker's end from a sort of very straight mid-off position by the time he'd taken it from the left-handed Lamaby direct hit saw the diving Renshaw gone Lamaby went soon thereafter and then the collapse the one blemish on the day might have been that 10th wicket partnership for Surrey they wish they could have broken it earlier they could have done perhaps there was a chance out in the deep dropped by Jamie Smith off Lewis Gregory but it didn't cost many 15-20 runs and the 15 overs that Surrey had to survive at the end of the day they have negotiated very safely a little more than negotiated really at 42 without loss off 15 Dominic Sibley's played some lovely shots including a couple of sumptuous cover drives a straight drive as well shots you don't necessarily associate with Dom Sibley more of that looking forward to that that's going to be the 2024 Sibley He's unbeaten on 29 from 48. And Rory Burns, calm, composed at the other end, 13 from 42. It means that Surrey will return tomorrow with that deficit of just 243. Scenario building, well, there are 96 overs in the day. There are 110 overs to get your bonus points. So if Surrey can bat the day, that'll be basically it. That'll be the 111 overs to get your bonus points. Surrey will be looking to get up to 400 and beyond against this Kookaburra ball as it goes a little bit softer the weather forecast is great it's set up nicely for the champions but as we saw today do not count your chickens because from a position of seeming impregnability suddenly your whole world can collapse around you in a fog of dismay yes what do you make of today I think if you're trying to gauge what Surrey's day was like just have a look at the other scores in Division 1 the other teams that bowled first are still bowling and they're not that close to having about themselves so from 190 odd for one for Surrey to 
bring about an end of that Somerset inning so quickly. I know that there was that annoying last wicket stand, but for them to be batting 42 for none, just 243 runs behind, it's early. But I feel like this could be one of those rounds at the end of the season, you're looking back at that and you're like, fair enough, not many teams got results. And Surrey at the moment are in pole position out of the 10 size in Division 1 to force a result. Got a long way to go tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be a, a really good opportunity for them to really press forward in this match. As Dan says, pretty much back the whole day and they'll get to 110 overs. Uh, you've got that expansive middle order full of stroke makers. Dan Lawrence, we, very interesting to see how he goes tomorrow. But we're set fair weather-wise tomorrow. The pitch is looking good. We know that the Kookaburra ball generally becomes less threatening as you go towards the innings and, and, and quickly, more quickly than, than the Dukes does. So a huge opportunity tomorrow for Surrey after what is actually a pretty good first day. If you're going to be champions, you're going to be able to take 20 wickets regularly and Surrey's bowling attack today showed their versatility. Leg spin, pace, swing, it had it all. Uh, it's been a great first day at the Keir Oval. Let's have more of this. This has been great fun. Uh, join us again tomorrow at 10 to 11 when Surrey will be about to restart on 42 without loss. A deficit of just 243 looking to go up to Somerset score and beyond and put themselves in a commanding position by this time tomorrow. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you all tomorrow.